Gabriel, are you setting it up on the, the thing or should I? I'm setting it up. Or, or, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, let's do it the same way every day. Uh, I'm, if you yeah. can do it, that'd be great. I'm taking care of something. I, I will, yeah, I will. Yeah. Thank you. We'll be taken care of. That's all I need for now. Thank you. Okay, hold on um, a second. I don't want to be too. So David and or Amber, make sure the audience know that we're streaming live. So if they can't ever get in because we have reached our number, they know where to go. Sabine wants to be penalized or, or not. She writes something. Is she here? Oh, she's here. Remorka. Good morning. Yeah, I was just uh, nervous to check the technology and make sure everything works before you start the big, uh, but I don't want to interrupt your process. It's okay. We are a uh, good morning or a good afternoon. Good afternoon, yes. Um, yeah. Anke for being part of our uh, event. Thank you um, for the um we this is this is most of the team here that you see as panelists um we've already made you a co-host for uh for your keynote uh so if you're comfortable just sitting there and letting us go through our process um we're going to try to be as much on time during the day as possible um one other thing to note is if you have colleagues or friends that you would like uh, to participate or watch. We are also streaming it live on YouTube. Ah, cool. um, and um, so the other thing to note is while we've had over 500 registrations, we're not sure actually how many will show up exactly at any one point in time with a Zoom conference, but there's quite a few people interested. Um, and I don't think I have anything else to communicate at the moment other than a question. What's the title you'd like uh, for me to use when I introduce you. I always call myself co-founder of Turn2. Yeah. Go ahead. Any, and I interrupted you. No, no, no. I then I had a very brief answer. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's what I had. Turn2, perfect. Um, Matt, I have to make you a co-host. Hello, Sabine. I'm Matt. Nice Hi, to meet Matt. you. Nice to meet you. Um, Herr Wurzer, here we go. Oh, we lost him. But the live stream is there. Okay. Uh, Anything else, Amber or Azade, in terms of preparations for the moment? Um, I don't think so. Okay, we are good to go. Um, could I do a very brief yes. one minute tech check? Yes. Would that be possible? Because I have a video which I would like to share, maybe if time allows. Perfect. And uh, it would be great to, to check whether that works. Yeah, please. You, you, you have full rights and privileges as co-host. Okay, so I'll you can, just share. You can completely take over the conference, actually. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> that would be too much of an honor. So do you see my screen? We see the blue slide with turn two in the bottom right corner. Exactly. So uh, what I'll do is I go in the, that's for the slide before and just go on. Do you now see full screen? Yep. Okay, good. So that works. And we started to hear. Uh, Install. Use. Okay. That's all I wanted to check. Ah, and you I can see the, the, circular, the circularity of the, uh, of the ride. I got it. Okay. Okay. So, and the, um, the uh, audio quality is also uh, uh, okay when you listen to the, the video. Yes, that worked. Any, did everybody hear that? Perfectly. 
Yeah. So that's that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, that was it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabine. Okay, then I will leave you. I will just uh, um, go outside in the garden for ten minutes before you start, and I just leave you do do your process. All right. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she's on uh, mute, I guess. I'm going to. I, 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 I muted it. Hmm. <clears throat> I want to go to a garden. <laughs> <laughs> Just have new work here. Mm. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, I need to double check something. David, you have the names of all the students. Uh, I I do, but I did not load them. I did not do a manual load for that. So for all the students, it would be great if they just raised their hands, and then I can move them into. No, panelists. I mean when when you said you were going to thank them for volunteering. Oh, I was going to thank them at the closing ceremonies. Got it. Do you want me to th thank them up front? No. Whatever works. Okay. Just don't forget Mojo. Mojo, yeah. <laughs> All right. Is Gabriel back? No, but he's watching us on YouTube. Okay, um, I am going to go on mute for a moment. Uh, I'm going to step away and make my second coffee. Uh, does anybody need me for a minute? No, okay. No, we're good. I'm eating as well. Mm. You should come to LA. We've got some very, very good food. I know. You guys have the best Persian food, too. Well, yeah, and there's this woman who's um, constantly giving us Persian food because she lives with my parents. And her nice. mom gives her and her mom gives her a bunch of food. And then it comes to us. I think it's amazing. <laughs> she a good cook? No, no. It's like when she goes to the, the, the Persian grocery store and just gives us all this great stuff. Um, Gabriel's back. Yeah, did you need anything? Right. Or... Very, very good. Uh, no, Gabriel, do you need anything? No, no, I'm just... I'm, gonna... I'm just gonna go make another coffee before... I Perfect. Do, do that, do that. Super. And her mom gives her a bunch of food and then it comes to us. <laughs> I can hear myself yeah. on YouTube. Like she goes to the, the, the Persian grocery store and just <laughs> all this great stuff. Um, mm. Good morning, John. Morning, morning, everyone. I let me change you to co-host so you have control as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
I would have to wait for David to do that. Apparently only the host can do that. Oh. Okay, we'll wait for David. But you're you are the you're the panelist, so you should be fine. Yeah. Is there anything I can help with? I when you are turned into a co-host, mm -hmm. um, the um, the authors when they show up, they're supposed to raise their hand. So if they if you see somebody who's raised their hand, please uh, put them in the the panelists group. Uh, yeah, but the session starts at uh, ten. I mean, uh, well, the keynote is at ten. Yes. Yeah, the, the first one starts at eleven. Yes. So starting okay. eleven. Okay. All right. I'll do that. Thank you, Jerome. Sure.
All right. Can everybody see the welcome screen here? Actually, I just see you. You just see me. Oh. How about now? That's good. Excellent. All right. Well, I want to start by saying welcome to everyone who's attending this welcome session at 930 in the morning, which is bright and early on the West Coast of the United States and a little later in Europe. We are certainly straddling many different time zones um, with this conference um, and trying to make it so that as many people as possible can attend. As you know, the theme for this year's conference is Human Plus, as we were putting that together. We really felt like CIMOD has always had a emphasis on sustainability, on the application of technology and computer science in the fields of architecture and urban design, that it straddles across both professions and academic realms, um, and that this was an opportunity in the midst of the pandemic to really bring it back to why we do this. Um, and that's for the benefit of ourselves and our environment. Um, so Human Plus will be the theme that we, we uh, reiterating again and again as we go forward. And um, I'm looking forward to a number of our presenters, our keynotes, and how their specific research um, moves around this theme. Uh, I had the unique experience of having to expand our registration, thinking that 500 people was plenty and getting email notifications asking if they could still register because we had exceeded our 500 plus um, uh, capacity. And so now we have well over 500 people who have registered. Um, if you haven't already, we encourage you to do so. It is free. And... Um, our Zoom license allows for up to 500 people to attend. If for any reason you can't get into our Zoom, please note that we also have a YouTube Live, which you can watch the sessions online on YouTube with just a little bit of lag um, without having to go through the registration process or be a part of the Zoom. So we welcome you to attend through that as well. Um, you can access all the sessions through our program. You can see here uh, this handy dandy um, uh, uh, time zone changer. So if you're confused about which time zone you're in, you can change this so that the schedule will customize itself for you. We have three keynotes today um, and paper sessions throughout all the way until the end of the day. And then of course we have our happy hour with Mojo. If you don't remember this from Simod last year, uh, Mojo is a star character in the Simod conference. Uh, you can also access through our virtual venue. You can link to any of the papers through the venue here. There is a password for that pa those papers, which you can get through the registration. It will come directly to your confirmation email. We have a series of workshops, which our workshop chair, Matt Schwartz, will talk about in just a second. Um, and then we have, of course, our presentation. So you can link into any of our presentations through our presentation link here as well. Um, and then at the end of the day, we can visit the bar, all get together for what's undoubtedly the best part of CIMOD is when we actually interact with one another. Um, so don't miss out on that just because it's virtual. Mojo will be there. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David Gerber, who's our general chair, who's going to introduce the team. Thank you, Amber. Um, I really briefly just want to call attention to what is a fantastic team. Uh, there's myself, um, I'm on the West Coast in Los Angeles. Uh, Amber, who is actually our program chair and fearless leader for the next couple of days. Uh, Azadeh, who is uh, the person in charge of all the heavy lifting in the background, which is our peer review and scientific committee. Matt, who has actually been helping throughout and in every way possible and including the last uh, day of workshops. And Gabriel, who's uh, the former chair from last year in Vienna, who has signed up to keep us all going technologically and with great spirit and mojo uh, over there in Vienna. Um, it's a fantastic team. I want to thank all of you. Um, it's really important that we acknowledge and thank those that have made this possible. 
Um, the, the host institution is my institution, that's the USC Viterbi School of Engineering, but really all of the institutions involved uh, deserve thanks. Uh, that's NJIT, that's CMU, and that's Syracuse, as well as TU Vienna. Um, the uh, Autodesk sponsorship has um, started from the beginning of CIMOD and continues to this day, and I'd really like to thank Alex Tessier in particular uh, for making that happen for us. Um, NREL has been a, a sponsor for CIMOD for a number of years now. Uh, some special thanks really goes to uh, Tarek, uh, who is at Georgia Tech, and Azadeh for making this all happen. And special thanks goes to Amir Roth, who is the person that uh, also helped uh, push through. Uh, without these sponsorships, uh, many of our programs would not be possible. So again, thank you very much to all of them. Ah. Um, Amber, do you want me to take this? Please. Okay. So you, you will notice that in our registration this year, um, number one is that it's free. Um, it's partly because we're not running a physical event. And it's partly because of the sponsorships. Um, and it's partly because uh, we'd rather see um, the, the effort and time and money perhaps going to some good causes um, it was our ultimate goal to offset our carbon emissions as a community and a conference uh, across the 12 years of the conference. Uh, and, and so here you have an opportunity to, in a sense, uh, take the registration fees and give it to a good cause. Uh, the second one there is also Girls Who Code, another cause that we uh, are supporting. I'm going to really, really quickly uh, introduce our keynotes uh, uh, because each keynote will actually have a proper introduction. Um, but we have Sabine Rao Oberhuber, who is the co-founder of Turn2 this morning. We have Upali Nanda, who is the principal and director of research for a HKS Incorporated, which is an A&E firm. We have Birchin Bedrick Gerber, who is the Dean's Professor at USC uh, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. We have Dan Sullivan, who is an architect and an entrepreneur. And then on Saturday, we have Hao Li, who is the CEO and co-founder of Pinscreen, as well as computer science faculty, formerly at USC and now at UC Berkeley. And with that, I hand over to Azadeh. Thank you, David. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Azade Sawyer. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Architecture, Building Performance and Diagnostics at Carnegie Mellon University. As a scientific chair, I'd like to highlight that none of this would have been possible without all the authors who submitted their inspiring and high quality work and our more than 100 international scientific community who uh, thoroughly and diligently reviewed so many papers this year and participated in, in many discussions. So we adhere to the tradition and protocols of ACM by having at least two reviewers on the papers. And in fact, more than 90% of our papers had at least three re reviewers. Uh, some of them had up to five. And at least two reviewers had to agree to accept a paper before we could accept it in this conference. I just wanna highlight that. I'd like to thank all the authors and our amazing scientific community for their hard work and for their patience with my, of course, never ending urgent emails. Uh, this year, we asked many of the reviewers to participate in a discussion. This is where the reviewers didn't agree um, on a paper. So we enabled a, a discussion to facilitate a dialogue among reviewers on the quality of the papers um, and to come to a consensus. We also had a few instances where reviewers agreed to shepherd a paper so it could be included in the proceedings. Um, so this is the list of our reviewers, very international from, from everywhere, thank you all. And I can't end my part without going over some stats. So here we go. Um, we had a total of 91 papers this year, 43 full papers were accepted and uh, 23 short papers. So we had an acceptance rate of 47%. So my sincere gratitude to all of you for being part of this amazing community. And I hope that we can, um, I hope that you can participate in the next few days as much as you can. And I'm gonna pass it on to Matt. Thank you all. Hi, thank you. Uh, so this year uh, we had four workshops. 
Um, it was a really interesting and dynamic set of workshops. We had some corporate tools to academic playgrounds for simulation and manufacturing. Each of the four workshops were three hours each, and we ended up with more than 100 participants. Uh, so we'd like to thank the workshop organizers and just briefly highlight uh, what they did. Um, in the Azteco workshop, they covered the importance of simulation processes, automation, and virtual design. Uh, with the focus on the ability to connect multiple types of simulation and data models in the same workflow. It further highlighted some importance of using analytical and design exploration techniques like optimization and machine learning, generating more value from your simulation models. Um, in the Welcome to Machine workshop, it gave a great lecture on the uh, inner workings on how to build your own low cost CNC machine. In the Climate Studio for Daylight and Energy Analysis Workshop, participants were given an overview of daylighting and thermal simulation details. And in the Urban Thermal Comfort Workshop, participants went step-by-step -step through pulling real data from online databases into Grasshopper and simulating multiple comfort factors. David, do you wanna take a second to talk about uh, the preprints? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so for everybody's knowledge, at the moment, all of our papers are actually not searchable and findable by Google. Uh, why is that? And the reason that is, is that at the moment, we are using preprints for the conference. Uh, and we're using preprints for the conference uh, because we're going to uh, discuss at the closing ceremonies um, how we will be proceeding with the proceedings and how we will be indexing the work going forward. So for the time being, everything is under lock and key. Uh, except for those who are attending the conference. Okay. With that, um, we do have a, a little bit of extra time. If anyone has any questions that they'd like to address to our chairs um, regarding program, regarding access, um, of course, there's the Q&A uh, in, in all of the panels. Um, as we go through the paper sessions, um, we'll encourage you to use that Q&A as a way of um, engaging the authors. Um, and then there will be a verbal Q&A that's moderated by our session chairs at the end of each session. We will do our best to stay on time. So if you are an author and listening now, um, be mindful of the time limits that we've assigned to short and full papers uh, so that everybody gets um, a fair opportunity to disseminate and share their work um, and that our audience gets the opportunity to participate um, as engaged question answer and, and answer sessions. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, are there other questions that might come up? So, so I think we will actually take a brief pause and come back and start uh, with our first keynote, which is Sabine on time and Perfect. allow everybody to filter in. Absolutely. Get some more coffee. <laughs> All right. Thank good you. Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. And we look forward to a fantastic day. Uh, someone's hand is raised. If, if you have a question, please uh, put it in the chat. If you have raised your hand because you're a panelist, uh, please wait until 11 o'clock when the sessions start and we'll promote you, um, we'll basically move you from the attendees list to the um, panelist. Thank you. Uh, one other uh, thing to note uh, for everybody, panelists, attendees, all of the above, Everything happens in this one uh, Zoom webinar, except for the after party, where uh, Mojo will be the star. And again, if you have colleagues that are somehow joining and they can't get into the webinar because we have 500 uh, people, which isn't where we are today, uh, where, isn't where we are at the moment, then we have to uh, ask them to go to the live stream, which is already up and running.
To anyone who's just joining in, I just wanted to let you know that we'll be starting our keynote in about five minutes. Um, our keynote speaker is Sabine Rao Oberhuber, and I'll be doing that introduction again in just about five minutes. So stay tuned, go get a cup of coffee and meet us back here. All right. So it's right at 10 o'clock. I'm sure that we will have participants coming in and out. That's the one nice thing about being all virtual is that uh, it's not as distracting as it used to be when someone would come into the room. Um, and uh, so, with that, we can start on time with our first keynote of CIMLA 2021. I am delighted that we get to introduce uh, Sabine Rao Oberhuber. Sabina, Sabine is one of the early pioneers of the circular economy, and she's co-founder of Turn2, a Dutch service company focused on achieving a circular economy. Turn2 works with manufacturers and municipalities to facilitate new processes and methods that reduce or eliminate material waste. Turn2 is forefronting a transformation that happens through four different lenses, through design, through finance, through data and IT infrastructure, and through a mental re-envisioning about what products and processes might be. With her husband, Thomas Rao, Rao uh, Sabine co-authored the book, Material Matters. This book dissects and critiques our current linear systems of production, consumption, and waste, and proposes a new economic paradigm to radically change the status quo. Please help me in welcoming Sabine Rao Oberhuber. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for these kind words, for this introduction, and for all above all for inviting me to this great conference and uh, um, to deliver the keynote speech is a very, very great honor to me. Um, I will start sharing my screen and I hope that uh, you all, you're still there. Great. Yes, okay, okay. Somehow I just lost the um, Zoom. Um, okay, but you you see um, you see my screen, so that's the most important thing. Okay. So thank you so, so much. Uh, yes, my talk will very much evolve about around the uh, topic of designing the circular economy, which is on the one hand really designing the things we make, but also designing our system in a new way because we truly believe we have to rethink everything what we do, not only the uh, buildings we make, but in fact, the entire architecture of our economic system, because Kenneth Boulding, a Canadian philosopher and economist framed it really beautiful uh, by saying anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. And in fact, we believe it has been madness how we have been unilaterally been looking through this economic lens over the last decades, which brought us in the situation we are in, namely that we are all sitting in remote um, COVID, I think, um, honestly, is one of the uh, um, results of having ignored what we called um, is the fact that we are guests on this planet. And we are, when you're guests somewhere, you have to be aware that there are house rules. And I think uh, what we are seeing is that we have ignored that in this uh, system we live, the planetary boundaries, we have ignored the house rules. And what we see is in fact uh, that we have trespassed the boundaries of our living planet in many, many ways. Uh, climate change is one very important topic, but there are so many others like the loss of uh, biodiversity, uh, the acidification of the oceans, and all of them are intertwined. So not there's not only one single problem we are facing. In fact, that's a, um, a myriad of problems which are all interlinked. And uh, just to make it very practical what that means, uh, I live in Holland, uh, which uh, you, as you might know, is, um, for a large part and certainly the economic motor of the Netherlands is uh, under sea level and what we have is by the state uh, website which is uh, uh, called bmigoingtobeflooded.nl and we when you put in your po postal code um, you will get uh, the results of being uh, the chances of being flooded and what it reads is yes in that case it's Groningen a city in a university city in the north of Amsterdam uh, of Holland where you see yes uh, you can be um, flooded by three and a half meters and by the way it's a chance of bigger than 10 percent that you are going to uh, um, have this in your lifetime and it also can be tomorrow so beware. Um, it's really a very uh, strange to me that we are still um, ignoring for large parts of this fact and I'm really happy that uh, what just has been said in the introduction that uh, Simout has been always very much revolving around sustainability, a topic which we really need to address. Because what is underlying there is, as I said, an, the architecture of our economic system. So what we call nowadays the linear economy. And it is based on a, a couple of flows, of flaws, which I would like to share with you. One is that we have designed industrial linear processes. So um, this take make waste uh, paradigm um, results in what you, uh, for example, see here, huge amounts of waste. This is not a, an artificial skiing slope. It's um, um, piles of waste in the city of Beirut. At the moment, they could not export it to Russia anymore. And all those are bags of waste. Uh, the second one is that we have started to separate the power and responsibility for the things we do. Um, I think it can be framed very um, beautifully um, how Milton Friedman, I think uh, one of the um, 
yeah, outstanding economic thinkers who whose uh, um, thinking has influenced uh, the way we do politics, the way we look at business for a very long time. Uh, the responsibility of business is to increase its profit. So um, coined in the way the business of business is business, um, ignoring what it means for the rest of the planet. Um, and together with that, this whole paradigm of exponential growth. And what that means, um, I mean, I'm very glad for one uh, fact with COVID, we are really learning what exponential growth means, what it means if you have something today and then it's doubling tomorrow. What do you see here is the impact of the construction industry. Um, on the left-hand side of the slide, you see uh, the an amount of cement the United States has used in the 20th century. And on the right-hand side, you see the amount of cement uh, China used in just three years from 2011 and 2013. And given the fact that we are now 10 years further, um, it probably is much more than that in, in the meantime. Um, and that results that even the literal sand in the sea is getting scarce. I don't know how many of you are aware, but there is an illegal mining of sand going on around the world. And many of the big developments, for example, in the Middle East are being built with illegally mined sand from the Pacific Ocean and uh, whole islands are disappearing. And very few people are aware of that. And that all comes, in fact, is being fueled by uh, what we call the linear business models. So in the old times, uh, things were designed to last. And what you see here is the birthday cake of a beautiful um, light bulb, uh, which is still burning in California. That was the birthday cake in 2011, so 110th birthday. But I looked it up yesterday on the webcam and it's still burning. And the funny thing is, uh, the webcam, which is looking at this light bulb since about, I think, 10, 15 years now, has been replaced three or five, four times in the meantime, but this bulb is still burning. And uh, um, the thing was that uh, during the Great Depression, people started to think, oh, if we're going to make things that last, it'll going to be a, uh, create a problem. So Charles Kettering, the then general manager of uh, the then CEO of General Motors said, the key to economic prosperity is the organized creation of dissatisfaction. And in fact, that is what we're seeing today. We have very much became accustomed to this type of uh, looking at our products. If you look at what um, we I, I mean, I as a child at least used this telephone on the left hand side in my grandmother's house, even in the in the 80s. And I have just heard that they are still working. Um, I'm not debating uh, functionality with what we're seeing on the right hand side, but um, we have to honestly ask ourselves whether it's, it's really normal to replace those telephones every two years. And uh, when we even um, realize what we are discarding with them, then it uh, becomes even more grotesque. So if you see um, on the, um, the first part of the slide in the, in the 1980s, a telephone consisted about of 11 elements. And in the meantime, you have uh, sort of the whole periodic system in your telephones. And if you are aware that uh, in one cubic meter of telephones of mobile phones you have more gold than in one of the in in, in the one cubic meter of um, gold ore of one of the richest mines in the world and you don't have only gold you have silver you have platinum you have all the rare earth metals in those telephones which we are discarding it's huge 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 numbers then um, and making in fact uh, unusable then you really have to ask yourself what we are what we are busy with. And in addition, um, uh, research has shown that it's not uh, the um, climate impact of those products we are discarding so e easily is also huge. So 45% of the climate impact we have is actually caused by our products. So this means that we really have to rethink our, um, our um, system. And uh, on the one hand, we have to rethink um, our business models. We have to rethink the design of our products and of our buildings. 
but we also have to um, think how are we going to manage the system, the materials in our system, and how do we, uh, in fact, uh, get to this cultural change this all means. And I will just share with you a couple of examples which we have developed over the course of the last uh, years. Um, I will present you, in fact, the work of three companies. Uh, there is one, Rao Architects, which is um, founded about 30 years ago as one of the pioneers in sustainable and energy producing buildings. Um, the second is Turn2, the company I founded together with my husband, who, which is uh, focusing on really the transition to a circular economy and developing different business models. And the third is a tech startup, which um, is the cadastre for materials. But you'll all, all hear more about that. Um, so creating a different circular model means that we have to rethink not only our production and the design of our products, which is sort of um, very much evolving ar around reducing input, reducing virgin material input, but we also have to think about the use cycle of our products. So how do we make sure that we are using them longer, that we are using them more intensely, maybe with more people together? How we make sure that we maintain and upgrade them, repair them, re reuse and redistribute them? And all that starts, in fact, with design. If your um, stuff is not being made to be maintained or repaired, then it's getting really difficult. But at the same time, if your processes don't, down, don't allow to repair things and your business model makes it too expensive, for example, then you also have a problem. So all those things are really um, have to be uh, developed in a holistic way. And uh, this one of the was one of the first projects where we, in fact, uh, uh, realized that we needed this different type of thinking. And that was when we remodeled our um, office at Raw Architects in Amsterdam. And we thought, oh, we don't really want to have this responsibility for products anymore, which when at the moment we dispose of them, we don't know what to do actually in a responsible way. So Philips came to us and we asked them, we would like to buy uh, light from you and don't want to have the owner of the lighting equipment. And by the way, if you are delivering light, you're also responsible for the energy bill. So what happened is one, A, we got much less lighting fixtures uh, because Philips really calculated uh, um, how much um, fixtures they needed to install to, uh, to deliver us the lumen we needed on our desks. And secondly, they were installing a whole um, system of um, mo uh, monitoring and uh, reducing the energy input of the installation and all turned around, in fact, uh, because of uh, the responsibility for the whole performance of the product, which was suddenly given to the producer who could do something about it. We took that to scale at uh, Schiphol Airport and they have uh, um, a model where they remodel their lounges every, all, all, uh, every 15 years. And the problem was they could only get uh, lighting equipment which would last for six years, um, uh, which would burn 24 hours, seven days a week. So having something uh, in a 15 year cycle, which is lasting only for six years is a really bad business case. So they turned to us and said, could you maybe help us to convince Philips to deliver us light instead of selling us lighting equipment? And so that's what they did. And now as Philips became responsible for the product they made and for the delivering a service for 15 years, they looked at their lamps and actually remodeled everything. And it turned out that the six years were determined by a little driver which was installed in the equipment in such a way that you would have to, to dismantle and destroy everything. But now as they got the responsibility for the functioning and for the uptime of the, of the light, uh, they changed the design. The um, driver is now in the forefront of the equipment under a little lid. You can easily open it, replace it. And it's even been monitored by IoT. So we, they are replaced before they are, um, it's breaking down. 
And in fact, Philips also realized that it would be very smart to make sure that at the moment they get it back, they can retrieve as much value from the equipment as possible. So the um, lamps are now made for maintenance, they are upgradable, they are modular, they are um, completely designed for disassembly and recycling so that uh, as soon as Philips get its back, um, it's in fact a sort of um, deposit of raw materials. Um, we did the same thing for um, washing machines together with Bosch. They are now selling washes on description. On sub subscription, it was in fact a, a, pro, um, a, a pilot started with a pilot for a housing corporation in a segment of users which were sort of endangered by energy poverty. And by um, developing this project, um, we could uh, help uh, people to get high quality machines they normally could not afford. And at the same time, um, save a lot of energy and with this energy um, pay for their machines. You see the same thing being uptaken um, by other um, suppliers of large equipment who are dependent on uh, raw materials. For example, uh, Mitsubishi has now developed a uh, um, uh, project, project uh, or product which is called uh, MUs, which is in fact elevators as, as a service and uh, where they are selling the performance and uh, the, the less you use the lift and the less maintenance is needed by, um, by Mitsubishi, the less you will pay. Um, all this is only possible when you really rethink your design. So design for circularity, making products as material depots, in fact, is very important. And uh, now I will show you a couple of examples from um, our uh, RAW office, what we did. We had an assignment um, to um, design the headquarters of Leander, which is a big uh, energy network company in Holland. And it started with that. And uh, um, this ensemble of, of uh, buildings was so bad that nobody wanted to work there. Um, they have a sort of flexible workforce and people can choose where to go. And obviously nobody wanted to go there. And the assignment was to tear it down and build a tower. And we said, no, we are not going to tear this down in terms of embedded energy. This is not the responsible thing to do. So we came up with the concept to preserve what you, everything which was there and enhance it. And uh, um, for example, we uh, took uh, um, material which we repurposed, but we also um, made sure that we uh, used almost everything which was already there. So we had a facade from scrap wood, but we also reused the ceiling tiles, we reused uh, the facades, etc. But we also um, uh, made sure that everything which were sort of virgin material which would go in there would be reusable later at a later stage when that building was not uh, needed anymore. And for that, uh, we were thinking about the big steel roof construction with, what, um, with which we covered the existing buildings. And what our requirements for this steel roof construction was, was that it was to be safe that it needed less material, that we could easily uh, assemble it, disassemble, transport and reassemble it. And in fact, uh, the steel roof companies, they were looking at us blankly, not understanding what we needed. So we thought which type of um, uh, sector would need this type of installation, which type, uh, which uh, uh, sector would think in steel roof construction, to which you could easily assemble, disassemble, uh, transport and reassemble. And we came up with these guys because roller companies, roller coaster companies need to do this every week. And uh, we had the same reaction from the roller coaster companies as before from the steel roof companies. They thought we were sort of mad. But then we told them, well, probably you can design for us a horizontal roller coaster. And that's what they did. So if you look at the construction uh, carefully, you still see the roller coaster in the roof. And by the way, it was 30% less steel, which we needed because the business model of uh, 
the uh, roller coaster company is seriously harmed by every extra kilo of steel they have to transport because it costs them fuel and therefore money. And uh, so that is, uh, I think, a very beautiful story that there are so many solutions out there. You just have uh, uh, not to confine yourself to the sector you're in. Um, and the whole thing is 90% uh, circular. There are certainly st still some things which we could have, uh, we couldn't, could not tackle because it was an existing building. And um, it is also obviously energy positive. Um, this is another project uh, which has just been uh, um, opened recently. It's uh, uh, the headquarters of Triodos Bank, uh, one of the um, most sustainable banks in the world. And there um, it was a new building and we took a really integral design um, approach from with a, a circular wood construction and to make sure that uh, in terms of energy, water, um, uh, material use, everything was thought of. Um, so it's, it's made of a, um, a standardized uh, wood construction of CLT. Uh, which meant that we, uh, the whole uh, construction process was not really a traditional construction process, but rather a logistics process. It was made for disassembly, so 160,000 screws are holding this building together. And by uh, um, documenting the whole building and also financially evaluating all the materials which are in this building, it really, in fact, became a materials bank. And we are very proud to say that it's also, it was elected the office building of the year 2019. And we just uh, won the Briam award of this year for office buildings. And it got a number of, uh, um, of awards for the most sustainable building, etc. cetera. Um, what this sort of uh, development means if we are st um, still, um, um, thinking that through is that buildings um, are becoming more industrial um, uh, products. So it's more like buildings as machines. So this is a, an innovation we developed um, for the uh, airport of Schiphol, which is a, a, a rotating um, terminal platform. And uh, what you see here is that when you start thinking of sort of a more modularized and um, standardized elements, you get to a completely a much more efficient uh, um, uh, processes in terms of the amount of material you need, the amount of equipment you use, and uh, you can reduce enormously um, the, the, um, also the footprint in terms of what you need in terms of space, in terms of uh, as, uh, what you emit in terms of CO2, et cetera, et cetera. So we do see there's a lot of uh, to be gained in the standardization of what we do. But another element is documentation. Um, we uh, sort of uh, coined the phrase that waste is a material without identity. And uh, the two buildings I showed you, um, the first one got one of the first um, material passports of, I think, the first material passport in the world, which, uh, in fact, was at the time a big, big uh, pile of uh, Excel sheets. And we realized that would not be scalable because one building with a material passport is not really uh, something which is going to change the world. But if we would document all materials in all buildings on the um, on the planet, then um, and make sure that we are keeping this material in the loop, then it will make a big, big change. So we thought of how could we make sure that we get a standard way of creating material passports and a central registration for those passports. And we came up with, um, in fact, the idea of creating a sort of land registry for material called Madaster, so we derive from Cadaster. Um, we engaged uh, um, in Holland in 2017, 33 organizations from the whole construction industry to help us, and we call them Kennedys. We say, listen, we want to do a moonshot shoot with you together. We don't know how we get there. We don't know exactly what we are going to find there and what is going to be the result of it, but we want us to help to create this vision. And we created together 
an online platform with a full service website, which in fact, uh, by uploading a building information model will give you the exact amount of material in each layer of brands. Um, and it will also give you a financial valuation. It, it will give you also a circularity index. So it will also tell you how easy it will be to dismantle and reuse the uh, materials in the building. And uh, uh, one of the first buildings uh, which we got in there was uh, the, um, the um, nest. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about it, uh, designed by the kids in Karlsruhe and uh, Stobek architects, which was designed from existing material. And we think that is uh, in fact, uh, one of the future applications being able to design uh, new buildings with existing materials. Um, what is also very important that uh, Madassar is sort of an um, ecosystem, created an ex ecosystem of data. You have, the, you have uh, the possibility to enrich your information with LCAs, with product and uh, information, but also with pu public data. For example, the financial evaluation of materials is being uh, made possible by a link to the London uh, Metal Exchange. And we are very proud to say that uh, um, uh, we have now over 8 million square meters registered in Madassar. Uh, we are um, uh, present in, uh, in five different countries and uh, um, the, the rollout of Madassar is going really, um, really smoothly. Um, install, use, recreate. Install, use, recreate. Install, use, recreate. Everything is temporary. Only the consequences are permanent. The sun makes finitude in nature infinitely available. Data makes finitude of materials in the circular economy infinitely available. In a linear economy, materials get wasted, finitely available. Mining, construction, consumption, demolishing, waste, depreciated buildings, materials without an identity, finitude is final. The earth is a closed system. Once it's gone, it's gone. In a closed system, all materials are limited additions. Let's go back. The final destination becomes the starting point. Hindsight becomes forethought, right off becomes right down. Anonymity becomes identity. Worthless becomes valuable. Buildings become material depots. Real estate becomes mobile estate. CO2 production becomes CO2 reduction. Install, use, recreate. Install, use, recreate. The cadaster of materials, the metaster, documents the identity of materials, generating continuous access to materials. Your data is online, secure, and always available to you. This results in safety, safer choices, health, better design, convenience, effective internal and external communication, value, Financial and circular residual value of materials. Insight. Search, analyze, steer, and manage. Reduced cost. For instance, discount on insurances. Lower financing needs. Value for money. Circularity. Eliminates waste. Documenting existing buildings leads to material mines. Documenting new buildings leads to material depots. Valuation of materials leads to buildings as a material bank. Install, use, recreate. Material with an identity always keeps its value. Madaster. Yes, we will even won the digital top 50 um, number one tech impact for social and uh, the number one tech for social impact award. Uh, sorry, there's an M missing, I just see. 
um, which is given out by Google and McKinsey. And uh, we do believe that uh, with Modaster, we will be able to sort of create a library of materials and have a sort of global asset man management of our materials in our economies. What we need for that in addition is not only technology, design, um, knowledge, material knowledge, etc. We also need a mind change. And um, I love uh, that I found these pictures um, some time ago um, on a kiosk in Schiphol. And you see um, two magazines which are covering Germany exactly the same week. In the left-hand side, you see this little dwarf saying, is this still my country? So very much afraid of what is coming. On the right hand side, it's the economist saying, cool, Germany. And I think it's sort of, in fact, the same lens, or that is, in fact, the lens which is um, through which you're looking at a given um, situation, which is determining, are you going to embrace it and really change, change it and make new things happening? Or are you sort of sticking to your old paradigms and, uh, in fact, uh, being afraid? And for that, we, we need leadership, we, knew, we need new type of leadership. Um, for example, um, this uh, guy is uh, Mr. Hoeting. He came to us in our office in Amsterdam and we asked him, please, could you sell us light instead of lamps? And he walked away, was quite uh, frightened, in fact, and didn't know what to do. But then uh, sort of discovered his internal leader and called us uh, on his way back to Eindhoven and said, listen, I love the question you just told me. I, I don't know what to do about it. Um, I can't, still can't get really my head around it, but I really want to work with you on this matter. You have just to promise me one thing, don't tell it to my boss. And that's what we did. So we developed this whole uh, light as a service case undercover. And as soon as it was finished, um, his boss was very keen to have a video recorded with this great innovation Philips had just made. Two years later, the freshly appointed CEO of Philips, Franz von Houten, declared that by 2020, Philips would not sell lamps anymore, but only lighting. Um, it's even a Harvard business case. Uh, um, so I really... Uh, um, strongly recommend uh, or ad advise everybody. So if you are a boss, be the one people can turn to and uh, um, yeah, propose their wildest idea. And if you're working somewhere in any organization, be aware that you can be a change leader. Um, what it needs um, for this um, is sort of, all sort of uh, internal attitude, uh, intrinsic motivation to do this. Um, I have found mine F definitely um, in my children. This is an ad for a very precious Swiss watch, but in fact, uh, it could be me and my little daughter. But um, my conviction is that we actually should treat any material as a precious Swiss watch. And I uh, sort of recoined uh, the um, slogan of Patek Philippe saying you never actually own material, you merely take care of it for the next generation. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow, what an amazing way to kick off our conference. Uh, certainly setting the tone for thinking about how we as humans have an impact and also um, what we need to be doing now uh, in regards to generations and really changing the way that we think um, and not just what we produce. I think I'm going to have install youth recreate in my head for a little while as a little bit of a mantra. <laughs> um, I'm gonna kick off by asking some questions, but I also want to invite our attendees to start chatting in our chat text box. Um, I will, repeat verbally the questions that I see in uh, there to Sabine. Um, and uh, also um, you guys can communicate with one another through the chat as well. Um, so with that idea of install, use, recreate and, and building those machines and shifting our idea about architecture from 
a property that we own into something that we would use and maybe like rent, not even really own. I think that there is some element of that in like rental real estate, but we renovate and remodel in the most maybe like disgusting fashion in terms of like throw out and, and reuse. Um, I think some of that has to do with the permanence of the materials that are related to construction, i.e. like the steel and concrete that is the skeleton of a building. Um, do you think in this shift from um, real estate as property to architecture or building as um, machines that we think of as products, like industrial level, do you think that the materials themselves will shift in addition to having more demands on a certificate or an understanding of the life cycle of those materials? Yes, uh, definitely. I think that is one, one aspect which is, uh, is ver very important. Um, but also sort of the design features. There's another really um, uh, lovely story of, of another building where we um, were asked to deliver a town hall for 20 years and we uh, really tried to get it as a service and uh, um, um, demanded from all the suppliers that they they would be able to take their material back after 20 years and so what suddenly we got a phone call of the supplier of the wooden beams asking us if he could make them thicker for three centimeters and um, even though um, construction wise we would not need it and he uh, and we asked him yeah you can do it but why and that he said yeah when i'm getting those beams back I have much more flexibility to their second use because they have much more carrying capacity. And then I uh oh. Okay, sir. Sabine. Okay. I'm sure that Sabine is working on recreate, uh, reconnecting if she's realized that she's disconnected. Um, I'm going to repeat my encouragement to type in questions into the Q&A box or the chat. It was going so well. I will, I will uh, look for her uh, rejoining in the attendees list. Great. There she comes. Ah, there. And <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't um, know what you're really saying. I think we kind of got cut out. Um, do you want to maybe finish the end of that question? I think I got, you were about halfway through. Okay, okay. Well, what, what we, um, um, we got that, that request of uh, the company providing this uh, wooden beams. I don't know if you heard that saying. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be thicker, even if we didn't know, uh, didn't need it for this first uh, construction we were making. But he was arguing that uh, by making them thicker, he would have much more flexibility as soon as they would come back to reuse them in a second cycle, which I think is really important that um, when we start designing, that we have sort of this uh, future of our materials in mind. Absolutely, that we don't just think of them as like, what, you know, what do we need right now, but what do we need for a much longer period of time? Yes, absolutely. I mean, with the, if we look at nanotechnology, it's exactly the other way around. Their uh, materials uh, being used are in such um, low quantities. And so thing, uh, this gold, for example, we are at the, at the moment losing 12% of the current uh, um, production of gold, which is the first time in mankind that we are squandering gold. Normally, uh, probably something which you're wearing could have been mined by the Romans. Hmm. Well, that's a, like a vast difference in thinking about like the life cycle of materials that we rise, we, we reach back that far. Um, and certainly our fossil fuels, et cetera, reach farther back than that. Um, so I like that idea of expanding beyond just like, what do I need right now? Um, which might be a problem with the idea of the transition between uh, buildings as uh, like industrial products uh, that, that we have this kind of throwaway culture. And so we'll have to make sure that our mindset shifts on like a kind of 
literally global scale in terms of like, we don't throw away the things that we hold in our hand and we don't throw away the things that we occupy. Um, I think our chair did, or David Gerber or any of our other panelists might have questions. Um, hi, Sabine. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, really an amazing talk. Uh, I knew about some of your work, but the talk really um, provided lots of fantastic detail and successes. Um, I have a whole series of questions, but I think I'll just ask two and one at a time. Um, one is at the macro scale um, and thinking about uh, the planetary boundaries and the Stockholm Resilience Institute's sort of push towards um, sharing that knowledge. Um, so less from a architect, we're building a building and, and having some small wins to a much bigger scale. Um, how do you talk about with your clients or how, or communities um, about these planetary boundaries and how imperative uh, they are? And in a sense, also, how do we backpedal from having crossed one or two of them and then back as architects and people in the built environment, what are the key things that we can do? Uh, and uh, it, it sounds kind of dire. And so I guess, how do we maintain that optimism and walk back from the cliffs that we've created? Yes, okay, I, well, that's a great, great question. Um, what we see is as soon as we start working with clients, um, uh, certainly, um, when we are work, um, um, working and in, at uh, turn two with uh, sort of corporate clients, you see that suddenly they start to see a lot of opportunities because the circle economy provides not only uh, a way of sort of operating in the safe boundaries of the planet, but they also it's it's also a business model, and uh, that is what uh, makes people excited. That somehow suddenly they can uh, bring together their sort of intrinsic human motivation of doing something good with the um, obligation they have to be functioning in a business with, which has to make money, which until now, in fact, sort of we have been forced into, I would say, split personalities. And I'm very, very optimistic as soon as we really unleash that power within people to believe that they can make a positive contribution and see the possibilities that we still can go back from that cliff. So, so you led right into my second question, which is one of economics and, and economic incentive. Um, and you know, it's, I don't think we as architects or not everybody on the call is an architect, but um, uh, we as architects are really trained well enough in the beginning to understand our economic impact, our economic potential and value. Um, and it's clear that it's a mindset change, not only for the, the let's say the economic drivers, the Philips and, and the big corporations, but also us. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the question there is, how should we, most of us on this call are educators in some capacity, how should we be teaching the next generation the systems thinking that I think you're really talking about and the modularity that is implied in it for reuse and regeneration in a sense? And what are the key principles that we should be, in a sense, putting into the young minds that we influence? Oh, wow, that's a great, great question because I think uh, the importance of the uh, Education has been so much underestimated in that. And I'm still furious when I look at the t textbooks of my son who's studying economics. And uh, I really see still these old paradigms uh, um, being written down and taught in 2021, which, uh, um, yeah, we have to, I think, um, systems thinking is uh, one of the key words. I think it's uh, so important for young architects, but um, to understand that it's not about fancy forms. It's nice when a building has beautiful shape, but there's so much more to it. And um, certainly when I see um, when it comes to sort of the functioning of the building and the importance of uh, um, all the installations and really 
uh, the intelligence we had to go into them also have be to become from architects. And at the moment that very often is uh, sort of outsourced to engineering firms, and then you get something like, a, we would saw in, in, in car games where you would say you get a spoiler, but it's sort of a, it's a, but it's not part of the entire design. And uh, um, in Rao, we have found that as soon as you start making this energy concept, the materials concept, it's a part of the design, you can reach mu so much more than if you just put something on top. Okay. And on top of it, um, it's getting uh, much cheaper because it's part of the design. But so are we getting re remunerated for that level yeah. of engagement and intelligence? Because typically we're not, right? Mm. You guys may be the, uh, the exception, but also the rule to follow. Anyways, yes, yeah. I mean, there are, and I think um, you probably know that much, not even much better than I, that there are a, a lot of perverse incentives at the moment built into, uh, into, in, into, into our system. And that is certainly something we, we have to address. And yeah. Um, yeah. Sabine, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, David. Um, Sabine, that comment like makes me think about the difference in between like an American approach to development and construction versus like a Dutch uh, where we see um, the idea of payback over time, um, that you're making really an investment uh, versus uh, let me get this made and basically get rid of it for profit <laughs> as quickly as possible. I know that's not universally true. And I know that the audience that we're talking to today is definitely um, invested in trying to make that shift. But that's certainly the frustration um, that I've had in my own uh, practice in trying to innovate um, where are we looking at Dutch models uh, for retrofit, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from the audience. Um, this one's from Christoph Weibel. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, Christoph asks, uh, he says, first of all, great presentation. Thank you. What are your thoughts on the concentration of capital? Already now we can observe the concentration of real estate leading to exploding rents in big cities, which is turning materials into a live service would create further dependencies on those corporations owning these materials. Um, so I think it's a question of big business uh, and control. Yeah, I think that's a very, very great uh, question. Actually, a key question. Um, I will come to that in one second. I just wanted to um, uh, respond very quickly to what um, Amber just said about economics and the, econo um, the possibilities of sustainable design. What we found is in uh, the, the, the buildings we created uh, with this circularity in mind was that we also could, could build them faster. So we, for the Triodos Bank, we could reduce the uh, normal construction time by four months. And we, when you calculate that in terms of cost, that's huge. So um, that's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, in terms of uh, Christoph's uh, question, um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. We were also, um, um, we've written a book uh, called Material Matters where we exactly are thinking around uh, what and how could that look like and, like, and we uh, sort of think that we, if we start thinking who should own materials, maybe they should be part of a sort of commons. Uh, so we are trying also to create a madastra in a way that uh, there's a sort of uh, um, commons element to it. And um, I've been um, studying Eleanor Ostrom's work um, to really uh, understand how we could start managing um, those uh, um, yeah, uh, resources humanity relies upon and without them um, sort of creating a new feudalism that is in fact what is also on the lure if you look at uh, the concentration, potential concentration of ownership through service models. So yes, we, I think uh, that is a very, very big question. I don't have a uh, absolute answer to that, but uh, it's still some, um, yeah, we are still researching in, in, into that. And I'd love to see uh, academia also <laughs> uh, looking much more deeply into this, into this questions. I, I agree. 
Um, another question from our Q&A panel. Um, again, a compliment on the great presentation with an exclamation point. Um, and the question is, do you use life cycle assessment in your circularity assessments? And I suggest, I, I would imagine the answer is yes, but maybe you can more deeply go into how yours is particular. Yes, I mean, if you look, at, for example, at uh, Madaster, it uh, provides also a tool for designers um, to upload um, uh, um, the building information model already during the design. And uh, as Madaster is connected to LCA databases, you can also make during the design process a sort of an evaluation of the materials you choose. And uh, it's definitely something we are, we are working with. Great. Another question. Uh, glad to hear, and this one's from Masa Nikofar. Glad to hear about the topic of our circular economy in the conference. I wanna ask how to address the challenge of connecting different flows in a circular city. So I think certainly a question of how do we scale this up to an urban level? Yes. Yeah, well, that's a very, very interesting, interesting question. And we're also looking at uh, indeed city development. And there you also start um, uh, seeing sort of the limitations of space we have. So we have sort of um, also with the one client developed um, a sort of spider web where you would uh, plot uh, the amount of space you would need, for example, um, uh, your renewable energy um, uh, um, uh, production, you would need uh, a space for um, collecting water and recycling water, um, you would need a green space um, for uh, your climate and the climate adaptation in within cities. So there's, a, a, I think, a very in interesting and important puzzle to be solved to, um, to create a, a circular and sustainable cities. Do you think that the building scale or the urban scale is more challenging in, in terms of uh, integrating a circular mindset? I think this, the, the urban um, scale is more challenging than this building scale. I think in terms of buildings, if you have a standalone building, I think uh, the technology is there, then the knowledge has to be taught and, and uh, really spread so it can be scaled. But I think in terms of buildings, um, I'm not uh, um, at all pessimistic that we will be very quickly having uh, circular buildings, but a circular space with all the different also interests you have to uh, um, integrate uh, will be much harder. And in addition, uh, we are at the moment uh, engaged in a European project which looks at uh, closing water and waste cycles on site or the bio waste cycles on site. Um, you still see that there, there's a lot of a um, regulations hampering that process mm -hmm. and also um, consumer or um, user attitudes towards this type of uh, um, treatment on site because there's a lot of culture involved in, as well. Yeah, maybe a, a difference between feeling like you own it versus it's like provided to you and you're entitled to it. Um, yes, that's one thing. And the second thing is we have sort of um, uh, been so much, you uh, got, got so much to you sort of to outsource our, um, I don't know, black water flows, et cetera, not, not uh, um, uh, treating that them anymore and uh, uh, seeing them also as a source of nutrients, for example. Hmm. So um, the project we are involved in is uh, trying to retrieve um, the nutrients from the black water and start sort of composting in a much more local environment uh, rather than sort of letting it flush away and, uh, and treating it as something which is disgusting. It's, there's a little irony in this topic, which is that this is something that uh, was being deeply looked at in the early 70s by Sim Vanderin and a whole series of, of folks on the west coast of the United States. And it's finally coming back to the Integral Urban House uh, book. Yes, I mean, there's a lot of uh, those topics which have been explored in the 70s. And uh, so this morning I've been sp speaking about uh, uh, also the disillusion um, this uh, uh, generation has uh, sort of created because uh, all those um, beautiful utopian ideas have not, uh, which sort of 
uh, also seem straightforward and for everyone uh, normal to embrace have not materialized. But somehow now they are um, um, uh, having the a rebirth. The progress just is having a rebirth, right? Yes. It was, and it was killed by big corporations, ostensibly. It was, absolutely. Yeah. Like uh, um, I, th I, th I think the, the whole story of Eleanor Ostrom and and and, and Hardy uh, with the um, tragedy of the Commons is exactly one of those stories. Yeah. Another question from our audience. This is from Miriam Kurstami. Do you see any differences and maybe a pros and cons analysis between prefab construction and on-site construction? Um, and that's in particular to circularity. So prefab versus on-site construction. Do you have a preference or do you see a, a, a value to one over the other? I think there is a absolute value to both. Um, actually, what we see is that the, the, um, we, we um, see more and more prefab happening and uh, um, the advantage of prefab is that you can start to really uh, um, modularize your uh, construction process and making sure that you produce things with, which you can reuse at a later stage. Um, but uh, at the same time, um, I would also think it's sad if we are uh, completely losing our uh, skills in on-site construction because there's also a lot of uh, this craft element, I think, is still something which uh, we sort of should uh, um, aim to preserve. Um, where I'm still also myself struggling, which is what, what is the best way forward. But I hope that somehow also with the 3D printing, et cetera, we will be able to marry it, to marry both um, um, uh, principles yes. somehow. Right. So I think it doesn't matter so much which way you're manufacturing it on site or uh, in a factory, but really thinking about like, where did it come from and where is it going uh, yes. much yes. longer term. Yeah. Um, another question from the audience, is the land and site resources part of the catalog on Madaster? Sorry. Not, yeah, I'll ask it again. This um, question is from Stephen Wasilewski. And so uh, I'm quoting it. Is the land and site resources part of the catalog on Madaster? Um, it is... Uh, the, not the resources as such, but um, you have also a part of your portfolio, have the map where it's on. So you have also the cadastral information. I don't know if that is what you mean, but if there's more sort of the resources on site, that would not be part of um, Modastra at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, well, we are closing out this session and I want to try as much as possible to keep on time, but a uh, huge appreciation to you, Sabine. Um, again, just a wonderful way to kick off our keynotes and our CIMOD 2021 uh, conference. And so thank you very much for being here today. And we look forward to our authors and paper presentations moving forward. Thank, thank you so much. I hate this part. Like you should get huge applause, but like, <laughs> you'll probably just go write some emails. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the invitation for this really very interesting conversation. I always love to have this uh, uh, Q&A um, afterwards with uh, um, really intelligent and uh, uh, incredibly forward thinking audience, which is always the, sort of my treat at the end. So. Thank you very much. And I see Azam who uh, sort of suggested me to uh, to be part of this. So thank you very much to you in person. Thank you so much uh, for joining. Really thank you. happy to bring this to, to the Simad community. Thank you so much. And to have a great conference. I'll try to make it to the mojo. <laughs> Perfect. That would be thank fantastic. You. <laughs> OK, thank, thank you. you so much. Bye. Bye. Okay, so everyone, we'll be making the transition into paper session one. Our CIMOD chair, Azade, is co-chairing that with Tomas Wortman. Um, and we will uh, be bringing the panelists uh, forward. So give us just a second and we will take care of that and move into our paper session.
Hi, Thomas. Hi, David. Good to see Hi, you. Hi, Azadeh. Hi, Thomas. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Great to see everyone. Um, I just want to remind everybody that if you're a paper presenter, please raise your hand so I could move you over. Ah, there they are. I believe I got everybody. Yeah, I think at least uh, Chris is here, our first presenter. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us here. I think this was a super cool keyhole, uh, keynote. And so I hope we have uh, um, just as exciting a uh, paper session. I'll be ruthless about the timings. So uh, let's start right away um, with Chris Weibel talking about physics meets machine learning, coupling fast fluid dynamics with regression models for wind pressure prediction on high rise facades. And I just want to make sure that everybody um, adhere to the, the, the rules of the time. So please, if you have a full paper, make sure you're less than eight minutes. And if you're presenting a short paper, keep it less than four minutes. Thank you. After all papers are presented, uh, we'll start the Q&A. So thank you very much. Um, I would need rights to share my screen. Yeah. You should you should do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So welcome everyone. Um, um, this paper is on coupling fast fluid dynamics <clears throat> with uh, regression models for predicting uh, pressure on high rise facades. So um, I reckon this is a bit of a more uh, narrow topic now than the bigger picture talk from before. But I hope you can still uh, stay with me <laughs> and try to listen to it. So this paper um, has been co-authored by Ran Zhang and Thomas Wortmann, both um, should be, I think, here in the audience. Um, yeah, let's um, dig into it. So the topic is on uh, airflow prediction um, for buildings. And um, some of you might have um, had their own experiences using programs such as CFD um, and uh, realized, of course, their uh, utility in building design, but also came to realize probably that they are quite expensive computationally and can take um, several hours or even more um, until you get your reliable results. And this is obviously <clears throat> a problem if um, you want a performance-driven design approach, uh, meaning that you want to um, design your buildings based on performance feedback, which ideally should happen in real time or um, if not real time, as fast as possible. And why is this important? Because you want to incorporate performance into an intuitive design process or into sophisticated design methodologies, such as optimization. So there are different um, approaches to uh, tackle this uh, problem of uh, high computing times with CFD, um, shown here as A and B. Uh, a would be using simplified models or simplified physics. The problem here being that um, while they represent a general physical method, uh, they usually um, uh, will have a quite limited um, focus on the system they're trying to describe. And the alternative being surrogate models or machine learning models, um, you could also call them like that, um, which also have been researched on quite um, intensely in the past years, where you try to achieve a high accuracy, but only to a certain subset of the system that you're trying to describe. And that means that it's usually not very general. So in this work, we're trying to couple both things together to um, combine physics, models with statistical and machine learning models to maintain both high generality, but also high accuracy. And um, as you have already heard in the title, we are using fast fluid dynamics, which you can think of as simplified um, CFD, let's say. And if you look at those two graphs, you will find um, pressure nodes on different um, points of the building. And each of these colors represent different locations on a high rise building. And for CFD, and if you compare the graph for CFD with the one with FFD and look at um, like just one color, the orange circles, for example, you find that um, the trends are similar in both uh, models, 
but FFD has uh, well higher fluctuations here, but also the magnitudes are quite different. So on CFD, it goes from 4,000 to minus 4,000 uh, Pascal and FFD is quite different. The point being here is that if you try to correlate both models together, ideally you would have a straight line and then you would just need one coefficient to scale it up. But um, obviously this is not the case. And this is where we believe machine learning could help. Uh, we are interested in finding some sort of model, some sort of relationship that can um, reliably uh, correct the simplified FFD model. By the way, I did not mention it, but FFD, a good implementation stack could run in real time. So we would be able to study design alterations and get the feedback in real time. So that's a big potential here in using FFD. As a methodology, we're trying to, or we will compare classical um, machine learning approaches where you just use a regression model uh, to output um, or to predict, in this case, facade pressure on a high rise building, uh, only based on geometry inputs. So shown in this example, you will have one tower and you would like to predict the pressure distrib distribution on this facade uh, trained on proper CFD simulations. And this is what we call the more classical um, machine learning approach. You're trying to replace an expensive simulator entirely. And this one we compare to our coupled approach, where actually in the beginning, you already start with a simulation result. In this case, um, this one re uh, representing the output of a FFT simulation, which runs significantly faster than a proper CFD. And you use this result and then try to correct the, um, the, the let's say wrong or not so correct FFT simulation with machine learning to uh, again reach CFD quality. And as a case study, we're looking at a high rise building in um, Shanghai with, um, it's quite tall, I actually forgot how tall, I think 200 meters or something. Uh, but the point here being that um, we are looking at different variations of this high rise building. And uh, what can change here is um, the, the radius or the radii of at different uh, sections of the high rise building. And that would change, that, that would result into different geometries. And in total, we have 100, uh, 100 different cases. So that's our training and validation training data set um, that we use to develop our models. And as an output, uh, we look at uh, pressure distribution on the facade um, and as boundary conditioning having one wind direction. So jumping into the results, this graph would show the ground truth or the, the proper CFD result. And this one, by the way, is um, the tower. Just um, if you unwrap it into one, one plan, that's, that's, it shows the pressure distribution and the red part obviously being uh, facing the wind direction and the blue parts being on the, on the backside or on the leeward side. Now, if we look at the base case, the um, prediction model that is using only machine learning without simulations beforehand, um, this is one of the results and it looks pretty good actually, but what you can see is certain regions are smoothing out and details are sort of being lost. Now, if we compare that with our coupled approach where we use a, um, a fast fluid dynamic simulation beforehand and uh, apply machine learning on top of that, we can actually find that more details of the original ground tooth are being maintained, at least for this example. Um, and that's a good thing, obviously. However, what we can also observe is that the error metrics that we have used to compare quality of the different models and approaches actually show that our coupled approach is worse. So these numbers show mean absolute error and mean absolute percentage error. And both numbers are worse than for the base case. So this is also something that we have to look into in future to use proper evaluation metrics that can also incorporate certain qualities that we are interested in, such as details. As a conclusion, uh, with our work, we have shown that coupling physics and machine learning can, it, it may improve prediction uh, quality. But um, if you look into the paper, we also critically talk about that. The results are not fully conclusive and um, definitely more work is needed here. Uh, first of all, we would uh, want to look at into different evaluation metrics, but also as everyone knows who is working with uh, machine learning models and data science knows that the more data you have, the better. And with the 100 um, samples that we have used, uh, we were quite limited in what we could do. So the first step is, of course, creating more samples and more, getting more data. And that would also allow us to create more sophisticated coupling approaches. 
thank you very much. And I'm looking forward for the questions. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, please uh, keep your questions uh, until the end of the session. I mean, you can already type them into the chat or the Q&A, but we, we'll discuss them later. Uh, one little addition, we are already working to get more data. Now, uh, thanks, Chris, as well for sticking to the time limit. I hope that uh, Ilham uh, Mirabadi will do the same. It's a short paper, four minutes only talking about Horsefly, a simulation tool uh, to evaluate the view to the outdoors. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Johan. Thank you for having me. Uh, I must share my screen. Yes, I don't know how, sorry. Uh, how can I share my screen? I don't know. See the green button that says share screen. Oh. Okay. Uh, today we want to talk about uh, a simulation tool uh, to evaluate uh, the use of uh, its name is Horsefly. First of all, I want to talk about uh, something which every one of us I think about it. Uh, we are all trying to make better places for people, buildings which are uh, sub uh, supportive of the health, well being, and uh, comfort. Uh, we promote a number of uh, features related to building environment which help us to make our places and uh, spaces more sustainable. Today, I want to talk about one of the most important factors that's not be widely considered until recently view. Why I think so? Uh, because recently a lot of uh, research has been done uh, in this field, which was interesting uh, results. Uh, I will tell you some of uh, them. A view can uh, positive impact on uh, eye health, well-being, comfort, uh, focus, improve mood, and uh, so many other things which are uh, really interested in. The importance of view uh, also visible in uh, the new version of standards, IROP standards and new version of uh, read uh, and take some uh, set some uh, new condition for it. Uh, read uh, talk about three conditions: view access, view depth, view content, and view factor. A uh, new version of uh, uh, IROP standard. Uh, give a horizontal side angle outside distance of the view and an multiple layer scene from inside for a uh, view. Uh, the point is uh, the designer can choose uh, which to see or not to see by changing the shape, size, and location of the window. But we don't have a useful tools or any tools to uh, analyze uh, the view. Uh, so we design a new tools for it. We uh, take uh, we convert the uh, geometric geometric data, uh, which we uh, collect uh, to uh, use to tools. We uh, write it with uh, Python, uh, inscribed in Grasshopper. Uh, actually, we made it. Uh, I write it in Grasshopper because we want to uh, use it uh, for analyze and uh, analyze uh, standards and also. Uh, we want to uh, use it uh, with uh, Honeybee and Ladybug to optimization and view and uh, energy and uh, something uh, they analyze it. As you say, uh, as you see, uh, I have uh, two tab, one tab for uh, analyzing lead and one tab for analyzing the uh, 17 or uh, 37. Uh, you can see the uh, company that uh, we design, and also you can see the uh, lead company connection uh, in Grasshopper. Also, you can uh, see the EN7037 um, uh, 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 in uh, Grasshopper 2. Uh, these two can uh, both uh, calculate the score of your building and also can uh, in this, uh, design up uh, an optimization uh, window uh, which you need. Uh, for better understand, uh, we do a uh, we in a, in a room uh, a high rise office building uh, select and simulate. Uh, for better uh, results, we do it uh, with energy because uh, we know 
uh, best using energy need a smallest uh, window and the best view of a uh, window uh, need largest uh, window. So, uh, for this uh, view and uh, the optimal value. Uh, it expects that uh, this uh, can um, uh, this too uh, will make a significant uh, difference in new studies and uh, help uh, other people to increase their uh, researching. Thank you to the sentinel. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ilham. Uh, again, very good job also on the time. Uh, next, we have um, Amar about uh, predicting incident solar radiation on buildings envelopes using machine learning. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mar, and I'm going to be talking about. Uh, sorry. Uh, my name is Amar. Uh, I'm a uh, researcher, uh, uh, BT researcher at Cardiff University, under the supervision of Dr. Wasim and Simon. And uh, I'm going to be pre uh, presenting predicting incident solar radiation on buildings in follow-up using uh, machine learning. Uh, here is uh, the presentation outline that I'm going to be uh, uh, going through today. Um, as we know, the assessment of the impact of solar radiation uh, on building uh, envelope has uh, typically been achieved by simulation tools, uh, which is time consuming and uh, require advanced competition knowledge. Uh, and current uh, building simulation softwares has a uh, high competitional cost, as I said, and setting up the model is time intensive. Uh, so with the machine learning uh, uh, approach promises a greater efficiency in the evaluation of building performance. Uh, in this paper, we, <coughs> we presented uh, an alternative and uh, innovative approach to assessing solar radiation on uh, office buildings uh, using two machine learning models, uh, artificial neural networks and decision tree. Uh, we were able to predict solar radiation within seconds compared to simulation tools. Uh, and the goal of the conducting the simulation is to create uh, a trained surrogate model to predict solar radiation uh, in, in a significant, significantly less time than uh, the simulation. Uh, here it's the platforms that we uh, worked on, uh, Ladybug and uh, Grasshopper for the simulation, uh, and also Calibri and T2Box for storing the data and also then we used uh, Python for processing the data and uh, running the uh, uh, machine learning libraries. Uh, and here's the methodology. We have three stages uh, for stage one uh, model settings uh, where we define the uh, fixed and the dynamic inputs and uh, for the uh, model and the, the objective was to calculate the solar radiation on the facade. And then for stage two is uh, running the simulation for the solar radiation. And then for stage three is the training and testing uh, for the ANN and the surgeon tree. Uh, here is how we generated the data, data set. So, so a generative parametric office tower and its urban context uh, web design and uh, model using Grasshopper and then uh, a single closed uh, office space within uh, the office tower. Facing main orientation is simulated for solar radiation. Uh, and as we know, uh, um, employing sufficient data is really essential for machine learning. So a total of 50,545 solar radiation iteration were generated in the simulation uh, for training and uh, testing the uh, machine learning. Uh, here is where we define the dynamic inputs parameters. We looked at different uh, dynamic inputs, uh, such as uh, months, uh, hours. We have four months of the year, uh, different hours of the day, and urban context that is varying from uh, low and uh, medium and high. 
and uh, different orientations and also uh, the facade level of the uh, office that is changing based on the context. Uh, and then the generated data uh, were imported into uh, two machine, learn uh, machine learning uh, uh, algorithms, A and, and, and decision tree, and uh, a, a, tw a total of uh, uh, 12 variables were uh, used as an input for the uh, models and the uh, solar radiation uh, was the output. Uh, for the experiment with ANN, uh, to optimize uh, the ANN, we and choosing the right architecture, we experimented with the key fault cross validation. Uh, the purpose of key fault cross validation is to choose the right architecture. So we experimented with uh, different number of uh, layers and different number of neurons, and we split the data into 80% uh, for training and 20% for testing. Uh, here it's the result for the ANN and uh, the architecture selected after the five uh, fold cross validation is a three layer network with 256 neurons. And this one is showing a graph also of uh, the cross validation results for choosing the ANN with different uh, layers and different neurons. And then we tested the architecture with the 20% uh, uh, the 20% that is not seen by uh, the neural network. Uh, and this one is an example showing the heat map for the actual data and the heat map for the predicted by the NN. And then we experimented with the decision tree as well uh, by uh, choosing uh, the number of trees as a hyperparameter to tune uh, from 10 to 100 tree. And also we experimented with, with, uh, with the same thing that with the key fault uh, cross validation and, uh, and the data set was split into 80% for training and 20% for testing. And we can see from the decision tree result here, there is no significant variation on the uh, RMSE uh, and uh, the best result observed is when the, for the 83. And also we tested the architecture for the 20% uh, of the data. And here it's a, a sample of showing the heat map for the actual and the predicted, and which is uh, almost the same as uh, the actual data. Uh, and then after the training and validation had been conducted with a, a in, in a decision tree, uh, the trained decision tree uh, surrogate model was imported into Grasshopper interface using uh, GHC Python to predict solar radiation for a new scenario. Uh, we can see here the, uh, the result for the simulated and the predicted result by decision tree as well. And uh, for uh, the office towers and uh, the, the result is, really, is pretty close. Uh, in conclusion, uh, while both methods provide an acceptable level of accuracy, the performance by decision tree is significantly higher than uh, uh, ANN. And in this paper, we aim to find alternative approach for solar analysis using uh, machine learning methods because of the time that can be saved uh, uh, in, in the, in the, uh, during the simulation process to inform the design decision. Uh, we created uh, a large synthetic data through model simulation, uh, and uh, and also we can't generalize. Uh, I mean, our approach to other uh, problems because it's dependent on the nature of the inputs. And we observed that if the input data is mostly categorical, the decision algorithm uh, could perform better than AM. And uh, one of the main the limitation uh, is the unavailability of the data. Uh, so uh, that's why we performed uh, simulation to produce the data. And also we can generalize it to uh, other climates, uh, what, what we uh, examine only a hot climate regions. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you again for uh, also a very good job dealing with the time. Uh, next we have uh, Martin Petrov about the uh, latent fitness landscapes exploring performance within the latent space of post-optimization results. Yep. Um, 
I'm just going to wait to get um, so I can share um, the screen. Amar, if you could stop sharing your screen so Martin can share. Sure. Thank yeah. you. Uh, okay. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. Okay. So, Hello, everyone. Um, today I'll be presenting to you our paper titled Latent Fitness Landscapes, Exploring Performance Within the Latent Space of Post-Optimization Results. The uh, paper is co-authored by Thomas Wortman, and my name is Martin Petrov. Currently, I'm based in Copenhagen, and I am a design specialist in the in HD Lab. Uh, in this presentation, we'll present our paper focused on the use of autoencoders and function approximation to explore design spaces and fitness landscapes of post-optimization results. What we're trying to address here is the rising amount of data present in the models we use, even in early design stage. And we see this as part of the increasing accessibility of algorithmic modeling tools. For example, Unity 3D, Unity, uh, 3ds Max and Alplan all have their visual scripting environments, and some of the most famous ones used in architectural design are Grasshopper and Dynamo. The 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 opportunity to generate data also raises the question of performance, and uh, performance inevitably leads to optimization. Uh, the raising accessibility of algorithmic modeling tools have also opened the doors for many different methods and tools for optimization. And most tools for optimization require a good and intuitive way of exploring the fitness landscape. Optimizations work well with problems that can be numerically described, but architectural design, on the other hand, has many qualitative aspects, which are hard to simplify, to simply put into numbers. That is why we use the means of optimization, not as an end of the architectural exploration, but rather as a starting step that can guide and help the designer to make performance informed decisions. For this reason, our research paper focuses on developing a novel methodology and a pipeline that can help us explore high dimensional candidates and their performance in an intuitive and design friendly way. I'll start with explaining the methodology and then I'll delve deeper into the individual parts. The essence of the methodology is that we first optimize the parametric model, then we store the parameters and the performance of each candidate. We feed the parameters to an autoencoder, which maps the candidates into a latent space. And since we have performance of each candidate, we can also build a performance map on top of it, allowing us to explore candidates with similar parameters and performance. This is the more detailed methodology diagram. The methodology is split in two. Uh, the left, the left-hand side we see optimization and on the right, we see the post optimization. And in the optimization, we want to generate candidates and in the post optimization, we want to map them and explore them. And I'll now move into our case study. For a paper, we have used the parametric shell model with six parameters. The six parameters define a geometry of the, of the shell, which we then simulate using the spring particle engine kangaroo for a grasshopper and to evaluate the performance, in this case, the vertical displacement of the shell. We then optimize the model and record the parameter values of the uh, and the performance of each candidate, which we use as a training set for our autoencoder. So I've mentioned autoencoders a few times, and now I'll, I'll explain briefly how they work. Autoencoders are a deep learning network architecture with the main characteristic being the bottleneck uh, or the latent space in the middle. Also, in this architecture for the training, we feed the input and the output layer with the same data, which means that the training that, that a trained network is capable of reconstructing the six-dimensional six input from the two-dimensional latent space in this specific case. It is, essentially, it is essentially a very well-performing dimensionality reduction algorithm since it's capable to learn what the most important features of the data uh, are and reconstruct them from the uh, reconstruct the output layer. And compared to the traditional dimensionality reduction methods, such as principal component analysis, PCA, it performs much better on a nonlinear data. This allows us to then squish our six dimensional data, which are the six parameters of the parametric model in a 2D representation. And on the left, we can see each box representing a design candidate that was recorded from the optimization. Uh, in the middle illustration, uh, we use colors, orientation, and size of each um, of, uh, we, um, 
we use colors orientation and size to illustrate the six dimensions of each candidate and then interpolate the whole map to see this fluid transition between candidates and on the far right we visualize each uh each of um we we uh, we can visualize each uh, parameter individually based on where it is uh, on the map since we have performance for each candidate, we can also build a performance map on top of our latent space using a function approximation algorithm, uh, RBFopt. We have uh, described a more technical details on, of both the autoencoder and the RBFopt uh, in, in the paper. And in this case, we, uh, we have visualized that uh, blue is essentially uh, better performing uh, candidates, while uh, purple and red are uh, a um, worse performing candidates. Um, and at, at this, um, and this is what the designer can work with. On the right hand side, we have the parameter. On the left hand side, we have the parameter map, and on the right, we have the performance. Uh, and as we mentioned, the latent space and the performance map are based on the recorded candidates from the optimization. We have also developed a pipeline allowing uh, allowing the designer to manually input candidates of interest in the latent space. Um, so, for example, if uh, I'm interested in exploring this side of the map, I can manually draw a two-dimensional point and place it uh, in, in the two-dimensional map. Um, so, in practice, we can draw points in the latent space, reconstruct the six parameters, since the autoencoder can unsquish the data back in the decoder, and evaluate the results to compare it to the predicted value. Then we can also feed the manually input candidates into a function, function approximation to update it, allowing us to explore the performance better. So for example, we, we have the, uh, the predicted value of each candidate uh, in areas where we don't have candidates. We can, uh, we can explore areas of high predicted values, but then we can simulate the actual value and see how far is the prediction. And then we can update the, uh, the prediction based on the manual inputs. And what we see in this tool is a novel possibility of exploring performance, but also variety. The designer is the one that chooses whether to aim for performance or to explore new possibilities. The limitations currently are that a higher dimensional parametric model will be hard to map. Higher parameter spaces are also harder to visualize in 2D. So for example, if our latent space is a three or four dimensional uh, layer, that could be very hard to visualize. Also, the low number of recorded candidates can lead to overfitting of the autoencoder, leading to a biased representation in the latent space. And our next steps are experimenting with the multi-objective criteria problems, expanding and improving the user interaction and making use of a better and faster performing algorithms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, please uh, stop sharing your screen. Yep. So next we have uh, Mahasa Nikufar about hierarchical clustering for data supported urban zoning. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. I'm Mahsa. I'm a researcher from IAC. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to join the CMELT community. And on behalf of our team, I want to briefly present our project about hierarchical clustering for data supported urban zoning. As we know, decision making for circular cities is a complex process with various stakeholders for which multiple factors are needed to be considered. So there is need for decision support frameworks that can facilitate handling the complex data sets for analysis and planning the transition to a circular city. In this paper, we want to uh, specifically target two main questions about how can machine learning support data driven decision making for setting up protocols for urban zoning and how can machine learning be used to cluster urban areas that have similar data features. As a case study, uh, the city of Barcelona is chosen and uh, the focus is on the energy flow to set up protocols for implementation of energy solutions in the city. The methodology follows six main steps, which are about data pre-processing, the application of the machine learning algorithm and uh, then the comprehension of the results. And uh, during the process, two main platforms are used. The data set is created in the QGIS platform and the CSP is brought to a Python platform where the scikit-learn library is used to apply the machine learning algorithm. And then the results are exported and brought back to QGIS for a visualization of the results. In order to reflect the metabolic system of a city, 
Data is gathered in three main categories of social economics, spatial and resource flows related to energy, such as consumption and also uh, resource generation. The next step is to bring the different data layers in a unified spatial boundary to have data aggregation in a strategic grid. And in this case, the scale and grid structure for the case study is the super blocks of Barcelona. Then the next step would be that the decision makers can choose the data layers based on their objectives to cluster urban areas. And in order to feed the data uh, selected to the machine learning algorithm and normalization of data is required to bring all the values to uh, the value of between zero and one. The reason that uh, hierarchical clustering is chosen compared to k-means clustering, for example, is that it does not require a pre specified value for the number of clusters. It follows a tree structure and the results are reproducible through this method. So here you can see the spatial distribution of 10 main clusters around the city, which are based on the 10 layers of the data set. And in order to uh, comprehend the results of what are the behavior in, in each cluster, a radar chart is used to show the average values of each data layer for each cluster. This allows the decision maker to zoom into each cluster's values and understand its patterns to label each cluster as a typology. So as an example, this cluster has high population density, low level of income, high density of aged buildings, and it has good solar potential for renewable energy generation. So the typology that we can call this cluster is that it has a retrofit challenge, a financial challenge to support citizens, embed these solutions in the city, and uh, uh, it also has a solar energy opportunity. So if you follow the same process for all the 10 clusters, we can have the uh, main clusters renamed to typologies, which is the process that the decision maker is, is, uh, is doing. And at the end, you will have a protocol map, which you can uh, recognize the risk areas, which areas have retrofit challenge, which areas have self-sufficiency uh, opportunity, and even which areas have the possibility to become energy plus uh, uh, districts or zones that you can generate energy and also share them. So it accelerates the process. It takes it into account various features and you can customize zoning with it. So for future step, you can uh, apply uh, this methodology on different scales and flows and understand the relations uh, between different data layers. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we, uh, next at last, we have uh, 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 Xin Xin He, uh, Geometric Deep Learning Prediction of Shape Shifting Textiles. Uh, Masa, please stop uh, sharing your screen. Thank you. Is it okay now? Yeah. We cannot hear you. Maybe you're muted. Or if you're not muted, then please start. Um, Xing Xing, we still can't hear you. We still cannot hear you. Probably you have to set, you know, you have to, I guess you should go to uh, bottom left of the screen uh, where you can select uh, uh, where the mute button is. You can also select the microphone. Maybe you have the wrong microphone selected or something.
maybe meanwhile i will just pose a question uh, from the chat uh, about uh, horsefly so the question about horsefly was uh, horsefly looks like a great tool i have two questions is it publicly available and also how does it differ from the view simulation that is available in ladybug okay uh well we are going to publish it as soon as it's possible in a football i know uh the uh tool is ready but uh, we must do some uh something and after that we can go into publish it and uh, the difference uh, between uh, housefly and ladybug is uh it's a uh, ladybug is so much a uh, general but horsefly is a uh, design uh, for view analysis uh, analysis so it's a uh, so uh, uh detailing and uh, also is uh analyze that view based on uh the standard which uh is uh which uh, which is uh lead and uh i was uh Green building a standard. So it's the difference between that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Shichin, maybe try again. I just saw you connected to audio. Maybe yes. that has. Uh, can you hear me now? Ah, perfect. Yes, please. Start. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so now you can hear me, right? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that, everyone. Let me set the timer. Okay, um, so this is Xinxing, uh, the presenter today. Uh, I'm going to present our paper uh, developed in the material balance research group with uh, Julie Grassi uh, and Professor Pauletti at the Technical Department. Uh, so first thing first, I'm the last one to present. So please relax a bit your body and grab a cup of uh, coffee and tea, something. So as we in uh, like tech or oriented symposium, uh, so I would like to parametric definition that define my, our paper. So uh, it's a research on geometry deep learning that aims to predict the deformation of shape shifting behavior in the pre-stretch test time, as you can see uh, in the bottom. So the first question uh, and motivation is that uh, why we care about graph or graph machine learning? Uh, the, the first major essential of this is that uh, applied to the non-Euclidean data, like you can, as you can see to the right. And normally if in using ZNN or GAN, the data structure is Euclidean data. And, but in architecture, most of the data may be uh, non Euclidean. Uh, that's why the graph structure, data structure uh, it is, is of uh, fertility in architecture. As you can see, a uh, few papers developed from last version of SIMAOD. So, and another reason why uh, to use machine learning is that. Uh, tuning parameters in simulation and especially in uh, finite element uh, analysis is complex and not end to end, the relationship. And it is also uh, computational expensive. So that's why uh, our paper proposed the uh, geom geom geometric deep learning. So if conclude our work and our research in one sentence is that we try to learn node to node transformation, as you can see here uh, in the diagram. So from uh, before the deformation, the nodes and the connect connectivity is the same. But after the, trans the deformation, uh, the amount of vertices and also the connectivity typology uh, doesn't change at all. So as um, every neural network developments, uh, the first thing is that the, the data. So ideally, we can use the like real real data for the printing prototypes, but that's beyond possible to fabricating everything like thousand or four thousand pieces. 
Then we compromise to use a uh, syntactic data set. That's the rules uh, based on these kind of uh, rules, physical rules to create parametrically the data set. Then the question uh, shift to uh, how, how are we can authorize, let's say the syntactic data, how we can use to put them into our uh, neural network development. So our, our strategy is to introduce the 3D scan and uh, 3D reconstruction using the structural line uh, scanner to bring back the fabrication, the real objects to the, the, to the digital space, as you can see from here. And then we apply few uh, geometric um, like values to evaluate these kind of uh, matches. So after the single objective optimization, uh, we can, and then the digital outputs is quite similar to the uh, real world geometry. Then we can say this kind of data, uh, it is authorized and can be used to the neural network developments. So in the design of the whole architecture of the neural, mo neural network model, we choose the uh, GMM convolutional layers. Um, these four, they are very expressive uh, neural network layers based on the geometric data like point clouds and meshes. Uh, the reason why we choose this guy is that it has a uh, dedicated performance on shape correspondence, uh, which is very closer to our research objective is that to predict the deformation. Um, and next step is to uh, engage in uh, feature engineering. Uh, as you can see, the filaments are printed on, on top of the fabric. It has some kind of deformation like this. So we have to encode it, this kind of uh, this piece of information to the pseudo coordinates. Um, so this is the feature engineering uh, like key point of our neural network development. So uh, as the result, I will like bring up two uh, key loss functions as the, to discuss the results. The first one is numerical uh, loss function and the other is geom geometry loss function. And the left part is the anti-classic uh, subset of the data sets. So uh, from the numer numerical uh, perspective, it can somehow like predict the shape very well. But for the geometry loss function, um, because it, it across the, um, the variety of the like data set uh, too much. So it may, it may not have the like proper performance as uh, the mean square error. So what's the limitation of our research is that the first uh, different finite element analysis methods can affect the output and our uh, data set. And also there is some bias in replication, the 3D printing, and also the deformation of a specific fabric can maybe cons consider as an out as outliers, like uh, if we evaluate the normal consistency. So uh, what what we imagine the future world is that uh, if we can try to like zoom in the, the scope of the process, also to be a graph, like to apply the uh, temporal graph neural network to the whole process. And another angle and perspective is that if we can apply a differential uh, rendering, so the key uh, benefit is that it will not include 3D supervision, which is uh, much faster than the uh, 3D registration. So that's my presentation, um, thanks. I think I'm um, on time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the presenters uh, for sticking into the time limit. So now we have about 10 minutes to discuss. Um, Avadi is co-chairing uh, with me because uh, I cannot ask myself questions. Um, I want to start this uh, question from Gabriela in the chat that 
I was also asking myself, and it, it's a question for uh, Simpson, but I think it also applies uh, to Amar and, and to Chris in a certain sense. So her question to Simpson is, um, okay, well, what is actually, brief, I would rephrase it like this, Gabriela. Um, what is actually the value of machine learning? Because you already have your simulation model. And so Gabriela says, well, if the, if the, uh, if there's um, inaccuracies in the simulation model, what's the point of machine learning? And then I would ask the other way around, if the simulation is accurate, why would we need a machine learning model, right? Because uh, I would think Kangaroo is quite fast. So, right, so this is basically about generalization and what, what is the value of it. And similarly, I, I could ask Amma, uh, what's the point, right? 50,000 um, radiation simulations, um, which I would doubt how generalizable they are, something you can discuss, but basically your generalized case looks very similar uh, to your training data. And your, your training data is highly structured, I would think. So how generalizable is it really? And uh, then Gabriela is kind of asking similar questions also of Chris. Yeah, what about this data set? Uh, how generalizable uh, can it be? And so we could we could ask. Uh, I, I could also ask. Uh, now I ask myself a question, Chris. Like, what's what's actually the point of what we're doing? Since we already have FFD, even even though you kind of explain that. But so I think this is all sort of one complex of questions. So but maybe since it can start. You are muted again. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I, I was just looking for the question. Um, so basically my question is there. So the question is, what is the point of machine learning if number one, the, syn the synthetic data you're using is inaccurate, but also if the synthetic data you're using is accurate, why would I need machine learning? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that is the uh, very good uh, question. So uh, I think that is why I apply such um, like evaluation before I use the synthetic data. So that is uh, quite curious and um, yes, to, to the data set. So, so for me, my, my strategy would be first, if uh, I have some kind of optimization process before I use the synthetic data. So that's the first one. And the second one, if, what if we use the inaccurate uh, simulation outputs? So that's uh, in, in my presentation in the last uh, few slides, uh, I, I mentioned about the normal consistency. So that is one uh, matrix and values to exclude the outliers because uh, the normal consistency uh, may, may only work in our cases because our cases is works on the deformation. And the deformation, if the, so the normal consistence, consistency can uh, evaluate that kind of uh, deformation is valid or not. So I think this is uh, one thing. Okay, I think my answer would be like this. If I came up uh, like later response. I can, I can continue. Yeah, thank you. So to me, it's like in your paper, it's it's methodologically is super interesting. But in a sense, for me, you could have stopped at the first step where you say I'm tuning my kangaroo model to be more accurate. That is already quite interesting. And once you have an accurate kangaroo model, maybe I don't need machine learning. But okay, let me continue with Amar. Right, same general topic, but I'm going to combine this with a question from the chat that asks us how long did it actually take to run the 50,000? Right? And so how long did this take and what does this mean for the value of the machine learning model and its generalizability? Uh, hi, hello. Yeah, I act, it's actually took um, four to five days to produce all the data set for all cases. So, um, I mean, with machine learning, it will uh, be less time uh, for sure. And uh, our approach is, I mean, um, 
worthwhile only if the number of cases, as I said here in the, in the text, require prediction significantly outnumbers the number of cases needed for training. So, uh, I mean, if there is like, let's say multiple of offices, uh, office towers that required uh, for simulation, it will, it will consume less time with machine learning. So uh, the, I mean, uh, the, the, the prediction, the simplicity for the prediction for the machine learning, okay. And also the time that uh, can, is, is gonna be less for uh, compared to uh, simulation tools. Okay, and so now finally, maybe Chris or also Ranjang, uh, do you want to comment in, in this uh, general area of samples and generalizability? Um, yeah, I mean, I think often in our domain, it's to really cut down simulation time. And especially those who design, um, they want to have fast feedback because it wouldn't, like if you need to wait a day or even an hour or less, like 20 minutes even, or 10 minutes that just hinders your workflow. And I think that's one large motivation in our domain to use machine learning. But I think if we look at where the big money is, um, it's more on representing social dynamics, for example, stuff that where you just don't have a model yet because it's too complex or not, not comprehensible to build a model. So um, yeah, maybe in the future we will see more of these models too in architecture that represent machine learning models that represent things that have not been simulated yet because it's based on things that we can't easily explain otherwise. Yes, I also agree with Chris because one of our most important motivation in our paper is that we want something faster, no matter we use with, uh, simulation and machine learning. Because if you like CFD and FFD, we have got the data, but if we want to achieve more, we, if we are a very greedy person, we not only want fast, but also the precision of the CFD value. So we use a couple regression, uh, make the connection between the FFD and CFD. So we can use the FFD time to achieve a CFD, the precision. So that is a very ideal thing for us to achieve, I think. David, I see you have a question and I, I, yeah. have, I have two as well. So go ahead, David. I, I I'll go ahead and jump right in. Uh, I thought the presentations were uh, really a nice grouping uh, and I compliment all of the research. I guess I have a critical comment slash question, which is on one level, I think it's fantastic that our community is developing these machine learning techniques of all kinds and being critical about it. But then the, the sort of the critical comment, it's not directed at any one particular paper is, shouldn't we be using these techniques in a sense to drive more predictive understanding of things like uh, Sabine's topics of our own circularity in terms of how we're building or things like uh, human wellness in our built environment. And I guess that's a comment for you guys to, to think about since you guys are building the expertise that we could then use in that direction. Thank you for letting me interrupt. Can I reflect on David's comment? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think like as Sabine also was mentioning in her speech that we need a systemic change and it's not only about the technical but rather a social technical change that we need to have, especially on urban scale when we want to like transition to a circular city. And I think that like we need to have a system entry point, and maybe that's the part that like we maybe we do not know enough about our cities, and that's why like having that data first to have a have a cognitive understanding of what are the flows in the city, what uh, what is the current like situation, and then to be able to make a decision, we use machine learning techniques uh, as like an accelerator in analysis, but not. As a, as a final, so something that gives us the final solution. So that like it, it accelerates the part that we have to deal with the data. And then once we understand the analysis, then we bring together different stakeholders, different perspectives, and then reflect on what decision we want to make uh, about the, the future of our cities. 
Well, we should, um, we're out of time. So we should probably switch to the next panel. And uh, if you are a presenter in the next panel, please raise your hand so I can move you to the panelist group. And then I'll move this group over to the attendees. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, everyone. It's good to see you, everyone. Thank you. Great work. Um, Amber, if, Amber, if you can help me Thank move you. the people that have presented to the attendees and I'll move the ones that have raised their hand over to the panelists. Fantastic. Um, Kiara Fagan is our uh, session chair for session two. Um, and again, if you're an author in the next session, um, help us out by um, raising your hand so that we can make you a panelist. Hey, hello. Can you hear us? We hear you. Um, we do have two video feeds here from Stuttgart. One is this camera that's from our cave, and the other one is Leila. Uh, that's her. perfect. Um, I cannot share my screen at the moment. So we want to do a live presentation from the cave, but also show uh, two, three slides before. Can you please uh, allow us to share the screen? We are working on it. Ah, perfect. And then, Gareth, if you want to introduce the session and then introduce our first presenters. Sounds good. Welcome to paper session two, um, a urban scale modeling generation and visualization. The first paper up is Digital Twins for Air Quality Assessment in Urban Regions, presented by Layla Kern. Very much so. And today I'm here with Uwe Wessner and myself, Layla Kjell, and we're presenting this work, which was done in collaboration with Thomas Ritalas and Vineyard and Target Density. And I'm glad to announce that we are alive at our institution here and that we will have a short demonstration soon. But beforehand, let me give you an introduction. So um, this work originated from the project Open Forecast, which is a collaboration of several, by several German research institutions. So today we are at HLRS, the High Performance Computing Center, but there were several others involved. And the open forecast project, so the, the key idea was to use open data and to create new products based on this data by using high performance computing. So there are several use cases and different applications. So for example, we use satellite imagery then process these images by um, different um, technologies to extract certain information on agricultural data, and then we enabled um, services and also integration into a portal based on this data. And another use case, which we're going to show you soon, is about air quality simulations, where we use different um, other open data, and like sensor data, emission data, and process these data sets in air quality simulations. And then we created a digital twin and visualize the digital twin. So let's go into detail on the air quality use case. And um, we use the supercomputing resources here at HLRS. So we have our super, supercomputer Hazelhan, where we um, executed some uh, simulations. So it's the weather research and forecasting model in combination with an additional component. So um, what is special on the simulation is that they were high, very high resolution, but also it's a coupling. So it's not just the pure meteorological um, components, but it's a combination together with uh, chemical simulations. So this couple of approach is um, yeah, very sophisticated and we use this one then in the software whistle, which is for um, parallel visualization. 
which ran on our visualization cluster. And then we, uh, we combined this with further other data sets, so like the sensor data I mentioned earlier or geographic information to create our digital twins. So to give you an idea of how the digital twin then uh, yeah, look like, we'd now like to show you a demonstration. So I hope you can see the screen by reverse now. Yeah, if you could switch to the other video feed, to this one here, it would be nice if you could scale this up. Um, or if the individual participants can switch to that screen, that would also uh, work well. Uh, I'm standing here in our cave, which is a projection-based virtual environment with three screens, the ceiling and the floor. Unfortunately, you only have a 2D image, um, but in here I have I would have a 3D image normally. And uh, where we start off is right in front of our building. Um, here in front of us, this is the HRS building. And uh, to the left, you see the rest of our campus. Um, we have a highly detailed digital twin of the whole campus in here with a couple of bin models of buildings which do not exist yet, like this one. Uh, which is a Fraunhofer Institute building, and the model is coming in uh, from Revit, um, all of that's been software, and uh, some others. We even have a cable car, which is not um, there yet as well. Um, in this digital twin, we try out new buildings and uh, new infrastructure. Um, and we have traffic simulations based on Sumo to simulate the traffic in that digital twin. And uh, these traffic simulations then also uh, provide an input to the air quality simulation. Um, the uh, simulation is uh, quite detailed. Uh, it's on a 50 meter uh, raster, which is a lot for uh, weather and climate simulations. Um, so even small details in the landscapes are taken into account. And if you want to have emission data at that higher resolution, you also have to get that, uh, for instance, from a traffic simulation that shows you where the cars are driving and where the emissions are coming from. So this is a little flight through Stuttgart. Um, you already see, um, I hope you do see, uh, a nicer surface showing the CO2. Uh, what is the current uh, nicer surface? Uh, PM10 uh, distribution. So that's particularly better um, throughout the course of a day uh, over Stuttgart. You see that in the morning uh, there's basically nothing, and then later during the day um, it it sums up and. Uh, um, there's this day that we were simulating is uh, January uh, about a year ago, um, where there actually was a, a bit of a, a special situation. The wind direction changed. Uh, Leila, could you uh, show me the particle traces as well? So the visualization system that we use is this one, it's parallel, and uh, the all the data is, is so big, it wouldn't fit into memory of a single machine. Um, but uh, we can uh, process, post process those simulation results on a cluster and then visualize it here live in the 3D environment. And you see streamlines, they are also processed in parallel, um, computed in parallel on that cluster, and we can then visualize them and, and analyze them. And you actually see that the wind direction changes. Uh, I will try to um, show you that a little clearer if I scale things down. Uh, we've been at scale one to one, um, and now uh, we are we have the whole city as a model state scale, and you see the uh, west-east um, direction in the morning, and then later on the direction changes, and you see the uh, turbulence that's caused by the mountains near Stuttgart as well. 
At the same time, we can now have a look at NO2. Um, so uh, there's hardly any difference in NO2. Uh, Leila, could you put the uh, particulate matter on the floor as well? Um, so we can change different between different types of visualizations. Um, so the isosurface now represents um, NO, uh, NO2, and uh, the color on the surface of the Earth uh, represents particulate matter. And then you see the difference in those two. Uh, they behave very similar at the beginning, but then once the Earth warms up, um, the NO2 is uh, moving upwards much faster than the particular measure. We're going to have to move on to the next presentation in a second. So if you could wrap it up, please. Okay, I think we've done, we've, we've seen a lot of it already, not everything. Um, but if there are questions, uh, please um, do so. Are there any questions? Can we do uh, questions and answers now, or no? Okay, we'll do question and answers at the end, and our guests will be able to ask you questions through the panel. Okay. Um, so what I currently did is I, I switched to a different uh, type of 3D model uh, that's from photogrammetry. As you can see, we now have uh, nicer pictures of the buildings, a nicer 3D geometry, so we can also uh, have different uh, data sets as the 3D model sources for our digital twins, either BIM data or uh, LOD2 uh, from CDGML or the LIDAR uh, or for planetary scans of the city. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next paper to be presented is Evolutionary Computing in a Performative Facade Design Process by Adam Oswald. Okay, can you see me and my screen? Perfect. Okay, hello, my name's Adam. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about my paper. Um, and yeah, so here we go. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure how urban scale my paper is, but uh, it, it describes basically a case study usually utilizing computational design tools. Um, and I'm designing a solar shading device for a medical outpatient building. Uh, so I completed this work while I was an employee at a firm in Southern California. And this project is I think under construction now. <clears throat> uh, so I'll be describing a process that kind of intentionally uh, incorporates a human computer interaction in a design optimization problem with the intent of capitalizing on the unique strengths of both people and software. So like I said, this project is a medical outpatient building. It uh, specializes in cancer treatment in Southern California. Uh, and the top two floors of this um, are focused on chemotherapy chemotherapy infusion, uh, where patient experience is a critical factor in both care delivery and the architecture. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these are some of the early floor plans, and they give a sense of what and where these infusion bays are. They're in pink at the perimeter of the building, and this gives patients access to daylight and views. Uh, the patients will spend several hours per visit here and return for multiple treatments over months or years. Uh, so comfort and well-being are important design drivers. There's also a cost dimension as the client understandably wants to deliver healthcare as cost-effectively as possible. So minimizing construction and operating costs is a driver as well. And while there's clearly a lot of effort going on in, in the planning and interior design of the building, my focus is on the exterior and the facade contributions to these goals. So this problem of optimi optimizing the solar shading devices can be characterized by these four objectives. Minimizing the solar heat gain in the room, maximizing access to views, providing adequate daylighting, and minimizing the construction material needed for fabrication. On the computing side, this process utilizes a number of different tools. Environmental simulations are done in Ladybug and Honeybee. The parametric model was developed in Rhino and Grasshopper. 
Three genetic optimization solvers, Galapagos, Octopus, and Wallacey, were used to develop the design solutions. And the reason we used three different solvers uh, was to utilize features unique to each and to experiment with all three as we integrate them into our workflow. Uh, hopefully this animation comes across. Uh, this is what uh, kind of an early optimization run looks like in this process. Uh, there are a few plots here. Uh, the radar plot in the top right is showing the fitness of each design ob objective. Uh, then there's a donut and line graph at the bottom, both showing daylight levels in the room. And then the model view uh, also visualizes daylight. Um, uh, but also it shows uh, solar gain on the window and the shape and size of the shading device itself. Um, so this initial study <clears throat> uh, showed that daylight in the room had very little variation compared to the other objectives and was not significantly impacted by the shading device. And you can see that in kind of all of these plots, um, especially in the radar plot where some of these variables are moving around a lot up here and some of them aren't moving at all. And that's pretty clear in really all the plots and in the visualization. So daylight wasn't really getting affected. So we dropped it out of the optimization. Uh, so solving for different objectives like this, there's no one best solution. Uh, instead, we have to trade off the different objectives uh, and, and when the computer does that, it considers kind of anything that does that to be optimal or Pareto optimal. And so the Pareto front uh, over here in the right, uh, you can see this line projected, which is kind of showing the leading edge of uh, the solutions that are all considered to be uh, the same, equally good. Um, uh, obviously, we can't, we can't produce this many design solutions. So we have to zero in on one, which is why this process has a few more steps. And this can go back and forth between uh, what we're doing in the computer and, um, and uh, what the human design team is doing. Uh, so these are uh, three kind of 2D projections of a 3D design space uh, with these three variables that I've been talking about a little bit, uh, the view score, the area of the shading device, and the solar gain. Uh, this is a minimization problem. We're trying to minimize all three measures. Um, and so one way we can start to think about organizing this a little bit is by looking at these as clusters of uh, solutions. And so I'm kind of just doing this intuitively just by drawing on top of this um, by saying, here's some areas that prefer some uh, parameters versus others. Uh, but you can also do that computationally. Uh, so this is what that looks like uh, with a machine learning tool. Uh, this is in the plugin Wallacy for Grasshopper. And this is doing a k-means classification, which does the same kind of thing, uh, just a little more rigorously. And it's showing different clusters of solutions. And each cluster em emphasizes a different set of trade-offs. Uh, so what that looks like in something that our human designers can look at and understand a little more quickly and intuitively is this. These are the same eight clusters as it's showing. And you can see pretty quickly that uh, some of these plans especially uh, are working really well and others are kind of not at all. And you can see that in the shading devices, uh, for example, number five here, just as a shading device that's completely flat against the window and it's not gonna work for us. Same thing like with number one, there basically isn't a shading device at all. It's super tiny. Uh, so four of these can just drop out immediately. And that's something that we can do as people, but the computer kind of struggles with a little bit. Uh, so this is what we're left with is four solutions that, uh, again, we're kind of trading off different parameters. Some things are completely agnostic. It's a you know really good balance, but doesn't actually do anything that well. Others are more extreme, both in terms of what they're doing well and what they're doing poorly. Uh, so what this lets us do is kind of build up toward this last optimization run, which is going to be a single a single uh, solution. So we need to describe that solution in terms of some math. And so it's a pretty simple equation. It's really just a weighted average of these three variables uh, with us saying with these weights, what matters and what doesn't matter. Um, and so uh, we've seen this radar plot in the middle is kind of keeping track of each of these. We've normalized and scaled each variable. so. Everything just is a zero to one and that allows them to work with this equation. And uh, then this big image on the right, lots of information here, but really what this is just showing is we're trying to control a few parameters. Uh, like our uh, lead designer wants to really make sure this outside edge of the shading device looks vertical in elevation. So things like that, that the computer doesn't necessarily care about, but the designers do. And so it's easy to uh, you know, drop that in there and just kind of define it with some little equation. Um, and then finally, we want to try to make sure that this 
uh, surface itself is a surface, it's planar. Uh, and so uh, when you drop all that in, you get the same kind of things, it's even faster. Uh, but basically we're just showing uh, the same kind of thing. It converges on this one solution, which is what we wanna see. Um, and we're tracking a few things, sun coming into the room, the little red dots here are showing view rays coming out of the room, which is kind of just a proxy for how much does this thing cover the window? Uh, so fewer red dots is better. Uh, so uh, my last slide here, uh, this is the final design and kind of what happened over the course of the study. Uh, we started with nothing. Uh, we get a little bit of solar gain reduction. That's because we're not showing there's walls here. There's a glass here that uh, is obviously blocking some sun. Uh, the drawn just initial designer idea and then what the final solution ended up looking like and it, performance gains, which were modest in terms of solar gain, good in terms of views and the area ended up being almost identical. So it's just a geometry only solution to uh, optimizing for these needs. And so that's the project. Uh, hopefully you'll have questions later. If you want to learn more, uh, please check out the paper. Great, thank you very much. So the next paper that we are going to be presenting is revisiting the Lanzhou new area, a computational framework to assess spatio-temporal development strategies for new town planning. And it'll be presented by, I'm sorry, I'm gonna butcher this a little bit, um, Sir Joshua Mojo During. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, can you see my screen and hear my mic? All right. So yeah, um, yeah. the paper I'm presenting today is revisiting the London area computational framework to assess spatio-temporal development strategies for new town planning. So our idea was to conduct an experiment and take our tools and models for urban design performance evaluation in the design process and use them to evaluate master plan pro proposals quantitatively and even more important to tr trying to track down the spatial temporal development of a city as observed from satellite images through our models and indicators. And why we found that interesting is um, because master plans or plans are by design optimized to work best when they are fully implemented. And this can be risky, especially in large scale new town projects with uncertain rough prospects um, where we can not be sure that the full scale um, of the city will actually be reached or if it maybe will end up with a medium sized city instead of a, instead of a metropolis with um, a million people, the master plan was done for. So for the purpose of this paper was to get the first insight on how we could uh, use our tools uh, to account for a spatial temporal aspect in urban design, large scale urban design, to help ensure a city works well at uh, any stage of development. That would be like the long-term goal of this. So in terms of um, objectives, we want to, with this paper, we looked into questions of how does the city perform in different stages of development? How can we use our tools to improve the growth trajectories? And then an additional one, um, how to integrate data of actual human activity into the analysis. Um, yeah, then we, for that, we track, map, and analyze the longitudinal areas at growth trajectory. We compare it against an alternative trajectory. And finally, we use car counts of satellite images as a rough proxy for human activity. Now, a bit of background of the longitudinal area. It's, um, it's, it's a new town project in Western China here. And uh, it's planned for 1 million people to be reached uh, in less than 30 years. It's one of 17 national level uh, new areas in China. The first one was Shanghai Pudong, by the way. And um, yeah, but aiming for such a huge town to be built in the kind of a Western area in the desert to achieve 1 million people in 30 years is quite ambitious, especially given the time frame, and therefore likely to fail or not live up to these um, quite big goals. Um, yeah, there are some more impressions of the city. So, uh, and this gift shows the development process of the last of five years into construction. So it unfolds very fast, especially the basic infrastructure, right? Like roads and highway systems, schools are almost built at once. You really see this explosion here in the last five years. And on the right side is the current state of construction, five years ago. Um, colors highlight blocks that have been readily constructed. 
So overall, it's quite dispersed. And uh, here on the top right is the university district, 15 kilometers away from the, from the city center, so to say. That's also kind of sparse. So there's a lot of infrastructure being built for relatively few developed blocks, not to speak about actual inhabitants. And that can be um, problematic, especially when looking into the, um, the efficiency of the spatial structure. Let's imagine we have a really nice master plan that has been optimized for short commuting times and what else we care about. So we have a high composite performance score here. And um, that's great. But what about the time aspect? How do we reach this final spatial structure? And how does our system perform in the meantime? If the city grows fast to full size in just a few years, as often officially assumed in these kind of large scale projects, the time aspect doesn't matter so much. So maybe we lose on the way to the final spatial state, we use some uh, performance potential here in red. When the city grows much slower than anticipated or never reaches the whole scale, then uh, things could look a bit worse. So there uh, could be a huge efficiency uh, loss. And yeah, to get closer to something like a composite performance score, we need some sort of toolbox um, that computes a set of indicators for us, we implemented one in the Rhino Grasshopper with two modes, one for sketching out scenarios or yeah, scenarios, and one to compare the multiple scenarios of time step uh, at once to look into the graph trajectory of different, um, different solutions. Um, we limited the input data that we can, we, so we can extract them from typical master plans, street lines, land use plans, point of interests. And the toolbox is made of these core modules, a weighted network graph, then some data aggregation uh, functions, and then a gravity model, of model to um, distribute trips between origin destinations. Um, yeah. If, if possible, try to start wrapping up, please. Pardon? Ah, okay. <laughs> then very fast. Um, to run the analysis, I just skipped. This is the observed a graph trajectory for um, four time steps. Then here are some visualizations of how this looks, street network and population density. And then we made an alternative one. And this is quite a um, simplified example. We kept everything same except the sequence of blocks developed to make this comparison. And then here are some results. You see like uh, the green is the, uh, the blue is the earth observed draft trajectory and the green line is the alternative one. So there are quite some, some differences and the red line is how the final master plan would perform um, with the given indicators. And here's some overview for uh, three main sections of indicators we agreed into there. This shows how, how much better the alternative scenario performed compared to the observed one. So there's quite some differences which would indicate it makes sense to kind of look into these, uh, these issues. Um, if you still have a minute, the last part was looking into, uh, okay. So we only accounted for build structures. So far, we don't really know if people are actually using them. So for that, we looked into how we can account for human activity levels. In the end, we used uh, car counts because there's uh, temporal data available. Of course, this is very rough proxy. And then we compared, computed the GFA elasticity of activity level. So we compared the change of parking cars, uh, compared the change of GFA, and then how different land use categories uh, perform in this uh, degree. So a higher value means that for instance, educational land use, 10% uh, increase in educational GFA leads to 19% increase in these activity levels. And for residential uh, land use, this is much lower, which kind of makes sense because the government can assign a university to move somewhere and then allocate jobs there top down. So yeah, there was a first look into this. I think that gets this kind of analysis gets more interesting when compared to other cities, because then we can see um, which one makes a better job and actually uh, attracting users to the build structures. Okay, if you're out of time, then uh, this is a summary and thanks. Thank you, sorry to rush you. No problem. So the next one being presented is modeling residential urban water demand in urban arid climates, a case study of Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and it is being presented by Faisal Al Nasser. Yes, hello, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm just I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can everyone see my screen? 
Okay, so uh, we're gonna have a presentation on modeling uh, residential urban water demand in urban climates. And the case study uh, is uh, on the city of Riyadh. So I'm just gonna briefly uh, give a description on the status of water demand in the city. So uh, it is expected to increase uh, in the following uh, decades. Uh, and thus uh, the forecasting of urban demand on water uh, is important uh, for, the, for future policies and for the supply system overall. Uh, as Riyadh has an extensive water supply network, uh, uh, which takes from groundwater and seawater. Uh, the purpose of our research is to highlight uh, the current status of the urban water use in, uh, various, for various purposes in the city and to assess the water consumption at a building level. Uh, we used available data from smart meters as well as uh, from uh, uh, different uh, data sources such as s satellite images uh, and uh, uh, GIS uh, shapefiles. Uh, and we aim to provide a decision support tool to help planners addressing long-term long urban water supply uh, planning. Uh, our approach was to develop a bottom-up modeling approach for assessing uh, residential water demand. And we link uh, water demand to energy demand as well uh, to also understand uh, on a, both a building level and a neighborhood level. Uh, so uh, we developed our platform on, uh, on UMI, which is the urban modeling interface, uh, which uh, runs on Rhino. Uh, and UMI uh, looks on uh, both the water system and the food system and the energy system. Our focus was on the water system for, for this paper. However, uh, the platform uh, addresses uh, the encompassing uh, three uh, main systems. So this is just an overview uh, of, uh, of OMI uh, uh, and our focus, as I mentioned, uh, will be uh, on the water model. Uh, so just uh, a glimpse on relevant literature review, uh, many uh, papers have identified that the main uh, uh, domestic water use determinants are the household size as well as uh, the vegetation amount and the pool, uh, pools and uh, uh, the areas. So we have used uh, these metrics to identify uh, the, the, the water demand for uh, neighborhoods and buildings as well. Uh, for the data acquisition, uh, we have uh, land use data, uh, which, are, uh, which are being collected by different uh, government entities, as well as sat high resolution satellite images uh, and metered water readings, as well as uh, in situ weather readings. Uh, so for the model overview, we have uh, all of these data sets. Uh, we have from the satellite images, we have used uh, uh, indices uh, to extract uh, the amount of vegetation, uh, which is the one you can see here on the right, uh, to extract the live vegetation for each parcel, each uh, building in the neighborhood. And we used uh, a water index, which also is an algorithm to uh, capture the, the water water uh, bodies, uh, which we used to identify the amount of pools in each uh, house, as well as uh, the weather readings. We have used them to uh, use those readings uh, to develop a model for the evaporation and evapotranspiration rates. And we have combined these with uh, uh, meter readings, monthly meter readings, to develop a model uh, to understand the water consumption. Uh, so we have built uh, this uh, uh, relationship uh, between building area and water consumption. Uh, so as we can see here is the regression fit. And we also compared uh, this model. Uh, we have validated this model using, uh, by splitting the data set into a training and thing. And so we have uh, found that uh, the relationship uh, uh, grows uh, until a certain point uh, where it becomes flat, which is uh, the main reason that we suspect that's the case is because uh, when houses uh, become grower, uh, actually the consumption is, tends to be more uh, uh, on the, uh, the, the, I mean, the number of people, the occupants of the house doesn't differ by much. Uh, also, uh, after uh, uh, conducting uh, such models, we uh, used OMI, uh, we have uh, used OMI to uh, compare uh, the water, the water impact uh, 
uh, on environment uh, with uh, the energy impact. So as I mentioned before, OMI contains uh, capabilities to run simulations on uh, energy related uh, systems. Uh, so uh, we have compared uh, the environmental impact of water with uh, the one uh, being uh, impacted by the energy system for building level. So uh, for the water, uh, so this is a plot that we have used from another paper. Uh, so for the water uh, demand, uh, we have cal we have uh, calculated uh, the the environmental impact as being uh, uh, the energy uh, being consumed to. Uh, pump uh, the water from other cities to the city of Riyadh, as well as uh, to desalinate the water, as well as uh, for inside uh, inside city uh, transportation of the water. And we have compared that with that uh, with, the, with the impact that is done by uh, the, at, the, at the energy level for buildings. Uh, so this is an overview of how uh, the water module runs on UMI. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, the user can uh, enter uh, uh, the 3D buildings uh, at Rhino and then incorporate the GIS shape files uh, for the vegetation pools and parcels in polygon form, and then to specify the land use. And uh, here, as you can see, here is how the visualization will be uh, for the platform. Uh, so that's it uh, for our presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone. Great, thank you very much. Um, so the final presentation for this uh, paper session is going to be presented by Terry Peters. It's using high dynamic range photography to analyze gaps between predicted and measured illuminance values in a classroom space. Hi there. Uh, Terry's actually not presenting. It's uh, actually me, Randy. Apologies. Cool. Share screen. Hi, I'm sharing screen. Cool. So hi there, everyone. I'm here to present a short summary on my paper, which is co-authored by Terry Peters at Ryerson University. It's called Using HDR Photography to Analyze Gaps Between predicted and measured illuminance values in the classroom space. Uh, so build, building form simulation, also known as BPS, has been, used, uh, as a, has been used as a tool to design sustainable buildings, but studies out there have shown that there's been uh, gaps between the predicted results and the measured results uh, of the simulations. The study compares the predicted illuminance values with the measured illuminance values of a classroom space. Uh, HDR photography is established using uh, capturing multiple photographs using uh, various exposures and merged together to formulate one single image. Uh, the luminous values from HDRI is, is, has been taken from the classroom space and uh, a 3D model of the same classroom was created uh, and the results from the two were uh, compared to each other. In the study, the uh, numerical simulation results were and false color images generated using CIE clear sky and Perez sky models were then compared to those photographs photographs in the classroom. Uh, so the study tests a workflow that might reduce the luminance predictability gaps in lighting simulations by comparing uh, numerical simulation results with uh, false color images using the typical CIE clear sky and Perez sky models. Uh, using this uh, workflow, um, it was found that there was a relatively low margin of error between using uh, CIE sky models when compared to the images captured in the, the uh, classroom themselves. Uh, the root mean square error was measured to be around 40 candela per meter squared, which is a difference in 22%. Uh, and this results in a best par case valuation in lighting research. Uh, it was found that the Perez sky model underperformed in comparison to the, uh, the CIE clear sky model with a 
error width of 54%. Uh, so simulations like uh, Climate Studio for Rhino allows designers to predict certain uh, performance metrics, but it's usually difficult to gauge whether or not those values are correct or not. Uh, by incorporating HDR photographs, which allows to take, which allows for data of actual sky conditions and to reflect its uh, surfaces such as desks, furniture, dirty windows, uh, it provides the end user more data. Uh, combining the digital and physical measurements leads to a better understanding of where discrepancies can occur and why they occur. And ultimately leads to a better performing building by creating more accurate results. Uh, currently, HDRI is a growing uh, tool used in dealing studies, despite its relatively expensive equipment and the necessary workflow to achieve accurate results. But at the end of the day, it showed that uh, using HDRI, we can understand whether or not our models being created is in fact yielding good results or poor results. Um, in this simulation, the best case scenario showed that the CIE sky was able to predict within 20% of the physical measure results. And additional work could be used to explore the impacts of using different lighting conditions and different uh, materials in a uh, climb studio. And that concludes my paper. Great. So thank you all so much. These were really incredible presentations. And I really encourage everyone on this call to try to go online and at least skim these papers because I think you know we're forcing them to present very quickly. And there is so much thought in each of these that I'm sure we didn't touch on all of the valid points. There's been some really interesting dialogue going on in the chat. So if anyone has any additional questions, please drop them in there. Otherwise, I'll start going through them and I have a few questions of my own, but please feel free to add anything as you guys think of it. Um, I think the first question I was gonna put out there was for Adam, because I think people started to touch on it in the dialogue, but your presentation for performative facade design, um, people were talking a bit about the metrics for that. And you know, I think there was an interesting discussion, if you scroll all the way down in the chat, about um, the impact that would have in different climate zones. So I'd love to hear how you think you could prioritize those different metrics, either if that's a, a human job or if that could be integrated into the script or how you would see that changing for different regions. Um, I imagine it's the kind of thing you could integrate into a script if you wanted to. Um, I mean, it's obviously not really rules or limits on that kind of thing. Um, I'm imagining like in the firm I was working in when we were doing this work, um, it feels more like a human job. Uh, it's just somebody deciding, because you can do it so quickly, like people can synthesize that kind of stuff. Somebody can say, oh, our building's in Sweden. Okay, this is a dramatically different climate than Los Angeles or San Diego. Um, and that needs to be kind of the first thing we think about. Uh, whereas some of the other things, like uh, what does a good healing environment look like for a cancer patient? Uh, what are the kinds of uh, things they need in terms of access to views and access to daylight? Um, a lot of the stuff is going to be a little more constant, I think, uh, because uh, people are kind of going through the same thing as, as patients with a scary medical condition. Um, and I think. Um, yeah, I think there is a big human aspect in the design side in trying to figure out what should we be designing for and how should we be doing that. There's kind of some, like not need to go like try to filter that through a computer. It's like I'm human, I can understand what another human is going through probably better than an algorithm. And so let's go ahead and use that and design the algorithms in a way to support that process rather than try to replace it. Great, thank you. Um, I'd love to invite all of the speakers to turn your cameras back on um, and also anyone else whose photo has popped up here just so the dialogue feels a little more personable at this point. Um, I think if we scroll all the way back to 11.12 at the beginning of this presentation, thank you. Um, there was another question that came up during the digital twin, which by the way, you guys have had a 
really fascinating background through this. It's been a little mesmerizing to watch. Um, but, you know, again, I wish each of these presentations could last an hour. But um, someone had asked, can you do simulations for inversions? Um, that, that is part of what you've seen. It was a day with uh, inversion kind of uh, situation um, in the morning, and then it cleared up and, uh, and started to um, get convection going. But it was a clear inversion situation in the beginning. Great, that thank you. Your question. I think that was pretty straightforward. Um, for Randy, someone had asked, could you expand on what your study was looking at that is different than how HDR pho photography has been used for luminance in the past? Um, and again, I'm saying I, but this is coming from, I can't see all the details because I've minimized my window. Um, but they said, I remember years ago using HDR for luminance values as a standard workflow. So if you could just talk about the differentiation for a second, please. Yeah, I was, I was just uh, writing my answer. Uh, so my study builds up upon existing studies. Uh, it it uh, incorporates more reflectance properties of more surfaces just to uh, get a better understanding of how accurate this workflow could be. Great, thank you. Um, and again, if anyone has questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Otherwise, I have sort of a generalized question for all of you, which was, I would love to hear how you think city size would impact these different approaches in terms of if having those additional data points would refine things more, or if you would then be measuring for too many qualifications. I think, Adam, in your, in your case, maybe replace city size with a more appropriate metric like additional um, optimization parameters. Um. So I can go first, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you can start piling on, yeah, different parameters or more and more data and uh, get something that is different, hopefully not too different. I mean, I think the idea of a lot of this work is to uh, try to simplify, to create models that let us understand big complex phenomena without having to actually deal with all of that data. Um, and certainly that's what I'm trying to do. And uh, you know, the work that I'm showing is obviously optimizing for a shading device on a room of, of a building. Um, and you know, so hopefully we're able to extrapolate up from there, um, but maybe not. And maybe as we get, you know, a better idea of how to deal with all the data and how to wrap our hands around everything, uh, we can arrive at maybe slightly different solutions. I, I'd say more data doesn't always help. Uh, it would have helped us if we would have had more detailed uh, boundary conditions um, because we were simulating at such a high resolution, but that's difficult to get. So course data is easy to get, but really fine resolution boundary conditions for the simulations are very difficult. But then in the end, you do not want to simulate one single day, but if you want to optimize the city, you want to simulate many different conditions in the future. And then the question is whether that uh, increased accuracy would be any helpful, I, I guess not. Uh, but it really depends on the type of question we would like to answer with our simulations. Uh, on a city scale, we would look at each part of the city's behavioral aspects uh, in water consumption. And of course, it depends on water consumption and data availability. Data availability. Yeah, I guess having having more and more simulation and data points makes it quite is one of the biggest challenge or a really big challenge and topic itself. Though in trying yeah to make sense out of that and integrate that, mm, yeah, but I think it, it has definitely potential. Huh? Perfect. So I think what I'm hearing from all of you, I mean, I think we've all heard the term like garbage in, garbage out. It's you want data points and boundaries, but it needs to be, I guess, definitive data for it to be able to build up and support the models that each of you have created. And obviously I'm extrapolating a little bit because each of you have very unique 
studies to approach, but I, I think it's really interesting to learn about, you know, the different approaches to this and what, as data collection begins to expand, how that can influence different types of work. Um, it looks like we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, I think the first one is for the digital twin, well, actually, I think the next few are for the digital twin presentation. Um, I wondered what the urban design performance score, how to measure the performance of urban design. That might be for Suryosha. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, yeah, that's a tricky question, I think. Um, for, for this particular case, we were kind of limited uh, by models we have, yeah? techniques we have to analyze a, a design and then also data input. So in that case, we really thought of, okay, we have a, a master plan basically with few free information, but what can we make uh, do with them? So land uses, land use distributions, transportation networks. So in, in that case, most of the indicators we post there, I think in the paper, there's a little list of them, it has to do with um, kind of uh, more or less traffic and accessibility, very rough stochastics, very rough estimations, but maybe better than nothing. So, yeah. Uh, just to build on that a bit, uh... Um, in terms of the evaluation of both sort of a global performance, but then also local performance. Any thoughts? Uh, how do you mean that? Um, in terms of the ur urban measuring, urban uh, the performance of urban design, uh, there could be successful large scale uh, uh, measurements, but uh, locally they, there's a poor poor urban quality. Yeah or, yeah, or vice versa. I mean, that case definitely we only looked at into the large scale, right? There could be very different uh, ways of implementing um, uh, on the micro scale how that looks like. So yeah, I think the scale is a good point that you need to look at it in, in steps, different scales. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, if I... Oh, go ahead. Um, I have a question for digital twins. Um, first of all, really appreciate you guys putting together the visualization that you could share the cave with the rest of us. Certainly, I'm sure we lose something in the translation over Zoom. Um, as you were putting together your work with the idea of it being disseminated in the cave, but also sort of limited to this 2D um, output, um, was there anything that you were integrating into your process, um, thinking about the visualization via the cave but also the limitations of COVID and Zoom. I mean, um, we, we have the same issue here. If we use our digital twins, our virtual twins uh, for participation events, uh, we can only host uh, a couple of people in here, like, let's say 15 people max in our cave. So this is for smaller groups anyway. Um, but for larger groups, we, uh, we would go to, uh, if, places like a 3D cinema. And there, uh, COVID actually uh, plays us a favor. Um, uh, there are two large cinemas in Stuttgart uh, that are shut down. And uh, those places are empty now, unused, and we will use them for uh, participatory uh, events next year. We will have two years where we can use that building for free, basically, and uh, we will take that chance. Um, but um, in, in any case, uh, we, we do not only use caves for our visualizations, but uh, also just uh, uh, 2D projections. Uh, we support head-mounted displays. Um, the, the software that we develop uh, is collaborative, so you can uh, hook up multiple virtual environments uh, through the network and then do a, a collaborative networked uh, visualization um, alongside your Zoom audio conference. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions if anyone wants to sneak one in otherwise. Mm -hmm. okay. I, actually, I, I can throw out a question. Um, this is David Gerber here. Um, this is actually to the group rather than a particular paper, but when you guys are talking about digital twins, um, 
for me, the, the question is whether or not you guys feel like um, the link between the physical environment or physical product and that of the virtual environment or virtual product um, is being built so that uncertainties can be minimized. And, and not just from a, let's say, interactive or visual sort of point of view, but from a mathematical point of view. Too generic a question, too vague. So I, I, I would direct it at, at Uwe or, or Sir, Sir Joshua, I guess. I mean, if, if you ask me, um, it's, uh, there are possibilities to visualize uncertainty and we have to um, actually work on that. But um, especially on the topic of digital twins, um, this, is, this is difficult. If we use augmented reality to combine the virtual and the real world, um, th then our digital twins are actually uh, what, what they should be. They are a link between the real physical and our virtual hardware. And you can also visualize that live. But uh, doing uncertainty visualization in such a case is even more difficult than if you're just targeting a virtual environment. Um, but yes, we have to work on that. And, and this is even more difficult if you want to, as, as we, we want to use our digital twins for uh, participation to allow uh, general public to understand our simulations and, and work with them. And there um, it is so difficult that you don't convey an image um, that, that they understand wrongly. Um, no, no, yeah, I, I, I feel you. I think there's, um, two levels of, of participatory uncertainty. One is the expert, which are you guys, right? Learn, there's a, there's a learning loop by connecting the digital and the virtual. And then there's the participatory, which is the novice or the population. And that's a whole other level of uncertainty. And then there's two other levels of uncertainty, which is the uh, capture of the physical environment in your case and how much uh, accuracy you're getting and more accuracy over time and then the accuracy of the, of the virtual. Uh, so that's, that's where my question is coming from. Yes, and, and <laughs> the more complex these systems get, the more different types of uncertainty you have, and it's getting more difficult to um, understand this as an expert and, and even more so uh, as a layman. Um, but on the other hand, um, in, in the real world, we, we also have uncertainty and we learned to live with it and, and everyone can deal with it. So I think um, we shouldn't be afraid to show a simulation and uh, have people start discussing about it. If they are not really sure they understood it correctly, well, um, then this is a good means of, of getting together and uh, discussing it. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that shouldn't be shouldn't hinder Thank you. us to go forward. Thank you. That brings me to, I think, one final question I have for whoever can unmute their mic the fastest here. But it seems like a lot of these papers are touching on the importance or the potential for collaboration, whether it's you know, the collaboration of multiple components that you're optimizing or studying. But I'd love to hear from ideally all of you, or at least a few of you, in terms of if you think the predictive potential is greater or just the analytics feedback in terms of understanding how our cities are operating versus the value in understanding that the impact of that the different metrics of our cities have? I'll keep talking until someone unmutes, but you know, I, I just no think it's really starts. interesting. <laughs> You know, I, I think some of you have touched on the opportunity these present for different disciplines to work together to understand rather than a single metric sort of in a box, you're looking at something that's very um, dynamic in terms of it being an entire city or at these larger scale master plans. And so the potential for understanding how 
multi m multiple attributions can work together to then impact something. And whether you think the value that provides that feedback is greater to understanding our current cities and the current challenges that they face, or if it provides a greater opportunity to understand how to improve that environment with, you know, things that we add into it. Well, I would say it goes hand in hand both, right? That um, also like, like we had some workshops, for instance, with our real-time analysis tools, and that was kind of good to see how it also increases um, the understanding of what impact maybe your building position has on wind or other things on mobility. And then it's also great to discuss um, and, and try out different things. So in this sense, it increased the understanding and potentially also uh, the quality if the models were more or less correct, of course. <laughs> but yeah, I think those together. Thank you. And thank you all. I think we've gone one minute over, so I'm gonna wrap up. Please remember there's a networking opportunity at the end of the day. So join the Mojo's meetup if you guys are able to. I'm gonna hand it back over to whoever has control because it is not me. But thank you all very much. These were really wonderful. Thank you, Gara. Thank you, Gara. Next up will be our team. How's it day? Yes, sorry, thank you, Amber. I was, <laughs> uh, I was putting Upali in the spotlight so she, everybody can see, everybody can see her video. Um, all right, well, it is my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Upali Nanda. Uh, Dr. Nanda is a principal, at, um, principal and director of research for a HKS, a global architectural firm where she uh, spearheads research projects globally. She also serves as the executive director for the nonprofit Center for Advanced Design Research and Education and teaches as the associate professor um, of practice at the Topman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at University of Michigan. She serves on the board of directors for HKS and the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. Her doctoral work on synthetics um, has been published as a book um, also available on Amazon. Her award-winning research has been widely published and cited in peer-reviewed journals and mainstream media. In 2015, Dr. Nanda was recognized as one of the top 10 most influential people in healthcare design by the Healthcare Design Magazine. In 2018, she was honored by um, Architectural Record with the Woman in Architecture Innovator Award. Um, and in 2019, she was recognized as one of the nine people shaping American design by Specify Magazine from Metropolis. Upali, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure to see you. I look forward to your presentation. Likewise, Azadeh, and there is nothing I'm going to say from this point onwards that will live up to that introduction. So <laughs> this is all downhill from here. Um, let me know when you can see my screen. We see it. Hi, Polly. Hi. Perfect. Uh, well, I don't think I've ever presented to such an illustrious group that is en masse smarter than me, but I do appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today is something that's very dear and near to my heart, uh, the idea of occupancy outcomes. Um, and I'm gonna make the case that the project begins after occupancy and why we can only make better buildings and cities if we understand humans. That's our thesis for today. Um, like as it is said, I wear multiple hats. Um, I'm anchored in the practice um, and very familiar with the vagaries of practice. Um, I have a foot in academia and a foot in the nonprofit world. And that's very intentional because it's a cause for constant amazement for me to see the gap between our capacity as an industry and our practice and profession. So part of what we'll talk about today is going to be how do we come together? Um, because last year and the year that we are having right now, if there is one thing that became clear is the high level of interdependency between fields and also the high level of siloed work where we just were not able to come together. Like by any measure, we had one big global problem to solve. 
but we weren't able to come together as a collective to do so. So the other thing um, that I'd like to kick off this conversation with is a statement that I truly believe that the problems of our decade cannot and should not be solved by single individuals or institutions. We are entering the era of coalitions. We have to create big coalitions. We have to create big partnerships because all of us doing tiny, tiny, tiny things is not being able to make the impact that we seek. Um, so I'll go through the presentation. I hope we will have some time for conversation because that's one of the reasons that I'm here in front of this group. I have absolutely no simulation experience. I come to you from a very um, human focused perspective, but not a human centered perspective. So let, we'll talk about that in a second. Some of the things that have changed in the past few years is our profession of building has had to think about both footprint and cloud print together. And we understand space. Our understanding of technology integrated space is weaker. As we start having the capacity, and I'm sorry I missed the previous conversation, we can create digital twins. The logic for that is so clear, but that is not the practice. Why? Um, so that there are some of these emerging technologies and emerging sensitivities that are coming out that we're just beginning to understand. We understood building for the census. Now we have sensing buildings. Again, where do those two meet? I come very much from the sensory design perspective. Now I understand that our buildings can sense, but where is the conversation between the two? When are our sensory scientists talking to our technologists and simulation experts so that we can really understand how a building and a person can have a conversation? And that's uncharted territory as well. I mentioned this before that I think in the past year, <clears throat> at least for me personally, a huge uh, realization has been that we have to move away from human centered to living centered. We have to understand what the role of the human is in a larger eco-center system and how we contribute to it, how we shift things. But it does require us to deeply understand the motivators of humans because those motivations make us human-centered rather than just being human-focused, understanding what does the hum how does a human think? How do we think? How do we make decisions? Why is it that when the logic is so clear, we still make decisions emotionally? And that's just how we are hardwired. Like a deep understanding of what it means to be human will help us to really start getting towards systemic change. And finally, the, the concept of data versus delta. I'm all for data. I'm a researcher, I love data. I can geek out on data all day long. I married a data scientist. But somehow along the way, the delta seems to be lost. Like what is the difference we're actually making when we have these mountains of data? What do we do with it? What is the impact of what we do? And to me, all of this comes down to really being able to link design and outcomes every step of the way, being very clear about the difference we wanna make by design and understand where we are on the trajectory of being able to meaningfully affect it. Uh, let's take something really simple like daylight. And there's so many articles on the impact on energy, impact on sustainability, impact on health, many, many, many articles. But for those of you who are studying daylight, there are nuances that we haven't even started scratching the surface of. Um, towards the end of the presentation, I'll actually speak about um, a very anecdotal qualitative finding around uh, daylight, which we got from qualitative research that we wouldn't have ever thought about when we were doing our simulations. Or we can talk about, again, something that's very top of mind for us around materials and cleanability and ventilation and the link to pathogen spread, right? This is top of mind. And the logic is clear, the science is clear. Why do we struggle so much with it? And really, it's not just about what's clean air, what's environmental quality, what's indoor air quality, it's the perception of cleanliness and the link between the perception of cleanliness and fear, which is very much a human psychology component to it, 
And that has resulted in the high amount of hygiene theater that we see today, which is not supported by the science, but is supported by our gut instinct as humans to just want reassurance, to be able to understand. And if the science is too complicated, you've already lost me. It doesn't meet with my motivator of reassurance. So these are things that are fascinating to me, not just the impact we have on humans, but how do humans make decisions? And how do we get data in front of decision makers in a way that they can move from data to Delta? And also being able to accept that there are impacts of the built environment that are way beyond what we can measure. Like this is a study I did years ago um, where we showed different types of art to patients in a psych holding room and measured the impact on prorenatal as needed medication and found that patients who were exposed to a particular type of biophilic art or nature-based art required less medication and had less visible signs of aggression and anxiety. And um, this was published in the Journal of Mental Health. But think about this for a second, that you can have design and you can have art as a non-pharmacological intervention, but how difficult is it for us to establish causality in studies like this? But going back to the key thesis, at least I should be able to say that when I select art, this is the outcome that I intend. When I create an environment, this is the outcome that I intend. And whether I am completely able to test that outcome, whether I can completely say that that outcome is purely because of the design intervention is a different conversation, but the intentionality comes first. And of course, after that, you have the whole conversation around prediction versus future. You can predict a lot, especially on the building performance side, but where is the proof? And I will say again that often a lot of the prediction we see in the field today ignores the human variable because the human variable, as one of my colleagues says, is the messy variable. It's difficult, it has a lot of uncertainty. But without the human variable, even if you're addressing it within a huge spectrum of uncertainty, you're not gonna be able to get to the predicted outcome. So this feedback loop between prediction and proof is also missing somehow because we are not responsible for getting occupancy outcomes. No client is holding us accountable to occupancy outcomes. So this link between prediction and proof is so important. And what you see here again on my screen, this is the acoustic simulation that we did for a sensory well-being hub. And we really tried to understand, okay, what is the acoustic condition gonna be? But the proof was really in students who were using that space and how they interacted with it. And they were contributing to the acoustics. And there was a dynamic relationship between the human and the environment that is very difficult to get to with clear predictive tools. So again, the group that is listening to this conversation perhaps has more nuanced understanding of what we could do. But the claim that I'm putting out there is we need the proof to improve our predictions. And the proof today is in how humans engage with the environments we design and the outcomes that come out of that. One way of thinking about it is that you could think of every project as a lab and you could start asking these questions, right? Like we work, our research is divided into five cores, digital and material technology, climate and carbon, business and economy, art and aesthetics, and people and society. And I anchor this on people and society because as clear as we are about the other outcomes, the messy variable is how people interact with it, how people make decisions, and if the building is operated and experienced the way it was intended. So these questions around how did my systems perform? How did my building perform based on the projections in terms of EUI? How did my occupant feel? Did I get an ROI on my capital investment? Was the solution beautiful and elegant? We have to ask these questions on every project, but we are not today required to ask these questions because typically an architect hands over the drawings to the contractor or the owner and operator and does not have accountability on the occupancy side. So we are creating labs every day. The day that the project opens is probably occupied differently than how we intended, but we don't have a feedback loop in place to get that in. 
So this entire concept of the proof is in occupancy. And if we are not committed to getting that proof, how can we be confident about our predictions? The very base level would be to committing to occupancy valuations. And you'll see the strikeout I have about post-occupancy valuations. I have never understood the term. I've been constantly perplexed by pre-occupancy valuations. No idea what that is. It's occupancy valuations. Once an environment is occupied, that's what we want to evaluate. Um, there's a colleague of mine who often says there's nothing post about occupancy. Occupied environments is when our designs really come to life. So that's simple, right? Committing to occupancy evaluations should be base, should be just the way we practice. I'll, I'll again put this out there as a provocation that studying buildings without people is like studying drugs without clinical trials. Like you've done it, you've intended it, you, you put it out there, people live in it every single day, but we're not studying the outcome of the lived experience of the people who are there. How is that okay? I think part of it is really taking the human perspective to both the discovery component and the diagnostic component. Understanding what are the issues with occupied environments, especially if it's a renovation or uh, a new build where the same group or the same set of people is gonna move into the new build, right? Um, we have to get comfortable with ugly spaces. We have to get comfortable with going in, not just with our sensors, but with our sensing organisms, with the confidence that we are also human instruments. Observations can also be powerful. And once we get the two together, the really strong quantitative data and the really strong qualitative data, we can start moving the needle. Occupancy evaluations can be tiered um, at a very simple level. You can just go back and say, okay, occupant survey, general metrics, there are so many validated tools out there, that should be easy. Tier two could be a little more nuanced where you put your sensors, where you engage more deeply, where you do expert audits. And deep dives are when you can really start doing systematic longitudinal studies, layering spatial, environmental, and human analytics to get to correlations and perhaps over time, causality. This is an example of an impact report, right? This is really simple. It makes clients really happy. This is a lean IPD project. Success metrics were defined before the project started, there was a tri-party agreement between the architect, the contractor, and the owner's rep. And they decided that here is our metric for success, for safety, for local participation, for energy performance, team performance, schedule, lead, quality, and satisfaction. And profit was at risk until you achieved these outcomes. Right? So that, that's a very clear business incentive to get to those outcomes. And at the end of the day, we were able to go back and say, okay, it worked well, there were no change orders, we were before schedule, we were under budget, we increased the patient satisfaction, we won awards, we exceeded the lead target, all good. All good in terms of reassuring and saying, okay, this project met the needs. If you see the wheel that I have there, the things you were not able to get to was really health and wellness or local participation or the things that would have sustained effect over time as well. We weren't able to get to those outcomes. We learned a lot in terms of simple lessons learned. I, I love this one. Waiting areas and outpatient settings without a staff member present are less likely to be used. Why is this interesting? I can create the most gorgeous space with the most gorgeous intent, but people follow other people. And the dynamic of how people interact often determines use and behavior. So again, thinking about the human element becomes really key, although it's such a small finding. Same thing, like we can look at cleanliness scores, we can look at the average points of improvement, we can tell ourselves, okay, here are things that are important, here are things we did well, here are things we didn't do well, hopefully that'll improve the next project. Uh, we can go in with our sensors, we can really look at the lighting levels, we can say, okay, were people satisfied with their workspace? Were they satisfied? And you can see these numbers that it's good, but it's not great. What was the gap between what was very precisely simulated and tested and how it was used and what, how that satisfaction really worked. And this one is my favorite. I am not a sustainability expert, so I have to give credit to our sustainability team for this, is comparing the proposed EUI versus the actual EUI and seeing that we were quite below the national average and definitely below what we predicted. 
So again, I know that it's super difficult to go back for measurement and verification. And that's just the low hanging fruit. That should be easy. That's rapidly available data. So how do we go beyond that to the more complex human component of it? Here's another one where we did a study and we found that after a new building, there was actually a very significant drop in the fall rate. Many things were designed in that hospital with the intention of making it safer and reducing the fall rate. But an evaluation doesn't let me isolate which features specifically had an effect. So here I have an outcome, but I have no causality. I can't really go back and say what we designed was responsible for this outcome. So you would argue then that we really need to invest in labs or science in labs where we can look at one variable at a time. And this is an example of a very rapid sensory design lab prototype that we did where we said, okay, we're gonna make a makeshift lab and we're gonna test the impact of views and acoustics on student achievement and anxiety. Um, and we found that relationship. We found that direct line of sight and a specific window of acoustics really impacted self-perceived student achievement and anxiety. But this concept at the time, which I was super excited about thinking, if we can create pop-up experiment spaces, then why wouldn't we do it on every site to understand what the impact is? We should be doing pop-up experiment spaces all the time, not just mock-ups, but pop-up experiment spaces where we are carefully thinking about one variable at a time. But the incentive isn't there. The incentive isn't there because we are not a prototyping culture in our services of design. We are comfortable doing something completely new on every single project. So this concept of constantly evolving, constantly growing and constantly testing is not yet incentivized for us. So I would almost argue that projects for a lab really should be prototypes that can be used in many projects where we really can change it. Maybe a cladding, maybe a particular building um, detail, uh, maybe a certain type of prototype space. But labs in practice really should be sister sites for deeper academic labs for rapid practice input. The idea of us having a lab space, but not connecting with academic partners who are going deeper feels like it has no intellectual sustainability. That great work is happening, but we are not all en masse as a profession being able to benefit from it. What we can do is commit to being a living lab. We can commit to really measuring our own workspaces. And this is something we have tried doing. We have tried various experiments with various sensor providers to really get a sense of our own workers. We just completed a year long study uh, with self-reported perception. We have done work with two newly created offices to understand the environmental impact, the human impact and the business impact. That we can probably do, um, especially if you have a research team, right? If you have dedicated resources, you can look at the spatial analysis, you can do surveys, you can look at energy use. And you can come back at the end of it and say, oh, when we moved into this new space, we had an increase in sleep satisfaction. We had an increase in lighting satisfaction, air quality satisfaction, acoustics, thermal comfort. Um, we can look at the environmental impact to a certain extent. And we can look at the business impact, the things that the C-suite is really, really interested in. But that also takes time and method. And again, the lack here often is that sometimes practice is creating its own tools when tools exist in academia and should be used. The other thing is our data that is created by experiments like this should be open source and available to anyone who is interested in digging deeper. Uh, we also started uh, playing with the lab in our bag so that we could take sensors, key sensors, and. Um, I think Millie is on this call and talk, can talk more about it to get some basic environmental quality information. But again, sensors get sophisticated every single year and it feels like you're just a drop in the bucket in terms of what you're measuring versus the complexity of what the question is. The key component for us that we're really focusing on right now is understanding how we can layer spatial, environmental and human analytics, trying to develop tools where we can put the behavioral component, the behavioral layer, the human layer on the environmental or the spatial quality. 
I mean, here's an example of space syntax work where you can see on the bottom, on the top, you can see the integration analysis and you see this area here if you're following my cursor where space syntax analysis shows that this is really, really low integration spaces. And at the bottom, you see that our occupancy data confirms it. And this now starts getting us to this point where we can correlate quality of space with quality of behavior. But again, there's so much to do in this space that it can become exhausting very quickly. So again, you have to go back and think about where do I really want to invest independently and where do I want to invest collaboratively? Right. Um, here is a great use case that comes out of analytics like this is starting to create profiles for people that our data on how humans behave in space started creating profiles of how different people were actually using space. And now we are starting to think about, well, maybe it's not the macro environment, maybe it's the micro environment based on space use and personal profiles that we want to design for. Um, and this is the work around an evolving work ecosystem where our boundaries have fundamentally blurred and walls are no longer defining built environment. And finally, I want to stop with this example of a project we've just started. So I talked about occupancy evaluations, talked about just doing simple impact assessment, talks about labs and controlled experiments, talked about being a living lab. And where we have finally landed up is really being a live-learn lab and working in coalitions. Uh, this is a project in UC San Diego that has just recently opened. Um, and when we got this project, we decided, well, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to do this research independently, especially with an academic institution that has such incredible talent within it. So we proposed this idea of the capital project literally serving as a living lab for research and innovation on campus. Uh, what you'll see here is the provost statement that the New Six College is a living lab that uses architecture to augment positive behaviors and integrates that understanding into current academics as well as future capital planning. Why would we create academic campuses and not use academic talent on those campuses to partner with us in research? So this project became a coalition between a nonprofit, HKS, the university, the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. It's a site for a longitudinal study where we are uh, leading the study, but the talent is coming from students on campus. Um, it's the source for two courses, one for sustainability, where students come on campus and learn about the innovations, one for neuroarchitecture. It's becoming part of the faculty research agendas. And what we are most excited about is that we have an on-site live learn fellow. For over six months now, we have someone who lives on the campus that was designed and collects the data methodically for us, but also gives us really qualitative insights on a daily basis. Uh, and here you'll see some of our insights on how during, um, and, and that really, at least for me has, blown my mind because we've started looking at windows differently. During COVID, we've started finding out how windows have become a source of social signaling. They have become sources for TikTok rooms. Uh, uh, one thing we realized very early on in her observation was the issue with blinds, that the blinds were designed very much based on daylight and daylight coming in. And we did not think about nightlight and the privacy concerns of the view going out. And so now the blinds had to be changed and what it does to energy performance, we're still trying to figure out, but that's a great example of someone who's living there, it gives you insights that you might never think about. And so at the bottom here, you'll see what I have in terms of data, like, yes, we're doing really good quantitative data analysis around measurement and verification with sensors. This is our behavior mapping work, trying to understand patterns of space usage, usage versus patterns of space itself and the qualities and the affordances. But the delta, again, is the experience that cannot always be quantified. And that is okay. It's okay for us to measure both what is completely quantifiable and what might be qualitative, but can give us an insight so we can start thinking about, hmm, how would I measure it? What would I really do? to dig this thread further. 
So I really wanted to keep time for us to have an open conversation. So I end with two thoughts again. One, that design really is a hypothesis and it's what happens during occupancy that is the outcome. And second, that our buildings and our cities are living, breathing organisms that only come alive and inhabited. So occupancy outcomes have to be articulated in the design intent. They have to be understood during discovery and diagnostics. They have to be tested during design and verified and assessed after occupancy. They are the oxygen, I hope, that can bring new life to our profession. So with that provocation, I would love to open it up for questions um, and really encourage all of us to think about this idea that to be equitable, sustainable, and responsible, we have to understand what it means to be human. So I love the theme of the conference and I look forward to having the conversation. A quick call out to the team. Um, and I hope we can have a dialogue. Thank you, Polly. Uh, one small uh, thing is um, if you're available later, um, there's a highly relevant uh, follow on set of speakers that you might like to participate in that conversation as well. I saw that, David, and yes, I will do my best to join. Thank you. How's it day? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, David. Uh, okay. Um, I have a, uh, um, I really love this notion of the messy variable. And um, I have a bit of an architectural, I don't know, architectural philosophical question. Um, and it, it's a, it's reductive to say this, but you know, modernism uh, in many respects was trying to cure the ills, of, at least in the you know, Western European societies, the ills of uh, poor health uh, brought along by uh, the inequalities in society. And part of that solution was a overgeneralization or a generalization or a homogenization of the human, of us as mm -hmm. of society. And then, uh, you know, we fast forward through architectural, let's say, epochs, and we get to hyper individualism hyperformalism, um, And so I guess the question I, I'm asking is, where do we draw the line between the individual and let's say mass customization and its implicit costs as well as opportunities versus in a sense, aggregative measurement of us. And in a sense, again, going back to um, a generalization or homogenization of the human, because it's, we're all very unique. We have all kinds of different set points and all kinds of, let's say, you know, technical differences. Uh, and how do we navigate that? That's a great question. And I don't think there is a clear answer to it. Um, I think you'll see more and more this, the God complex of assuming that we understand how other people think is a very fundamental <laughs> issue with our profession, <laughs> right? Uh, we assume that because we want to do good for them, we know exactly what's good for them. So that's one of the reasons why I said the discovery phase of really co-designing, of understanding your, your users and not just asking someone what they want, but deep immersion, deep observation of understanding what the context is, is, is super important. Like keeping the ego aside is, is huge. And, and I think it's problematic. Um, I, I appreciate that because one of the things that makes architects phenomenal architects is the ability to create something from nothing. They have that ability and that sometimes that ability is at odds with empathy. And so you have to really, and, and it goes back to the idea of coalition saying you don't want a team that only has that skill set. You want the team that is trained and tuned to understand what is being said, what is needed, what is unsaid in the needs of the people that we are designing for, instead of quickly running to solutions. So the whole idea of problem seeking before problem solving is yeah. a very fundamental one. And so yeah, I, I think we're not educating our students very well in terms of empathy or, yeah. or 
for being patient in the process. We're also, as an industry, constantly under deadlines, which is another issue. Yeah, but absolutely. But I want to I want to add something to the thank, question. Thank of, you, Polly. Yeah, I want to add something to the question of empathy. Actually, um, this is a semester that we're, we're we are focusing on the difference between universal design and inclusive design. And mm -hmm. since you brought up the, this idea of empathy, I'm wondering um, how is it possible for designers for design for all possible users? And what are some of the challenges with that mode of thinking? Do you have any recommendations or suggestions for designers? I think the first point to that as a day is realizing the impossibility of that like really embracing it and saying it's not possible. But if you've heard about that quote that when you design for the extremes, you benefit the means, that helps. Really. But, but, but really does it? Does it help that, if, you, that, if you put everybody under a curve and you just say that it's- that, that is where the extremes comes in, right? So the idea of designing for the extremes is we tend to design for the middle because we want to generalize and design for the middle. If we keep the middle aside and say, let's look at the extreme case. Let's look at our most vulnerable. Let's look at those extremes and then really design for those extremes. The middle will get taken care of. So I, I, I think we can't. And we have to realize like this, this idea that almost uh, architecture, the built environment, is the stage on which the theater of life happens. And we don't have control, complete control over the theater of life. New things will happen every single day. We don't own that script. We don't own people's lives. But the fact that we don't go back and see how is this unfolding? Like, how is it that our culture as a profession is not to keep going back to what we've built and see how it's become new every time because of how someone engaging with it interpreted it, right? So I think that's really fundamental. We tend to encourage our students to do case studies and learn and then do, but after the do, there is no requirement to go back and say, did, did, that, did that work? But I, I do think as a way that prompt between universal versus inclusive is really, really important. And I'm glad you're taking that on. Yeah, it's, it's been challenging because in architecture school, we always talk about universal, but not so much inclusive. So we've been yep. at CMU, we, we started a studio on that. So it's, it's, been, it's been fun, but definitely challenging. Um, Upal, you also mentioned um, human centric and that, that is always interesting to me. Uh, you know, who, who is the human? Who are we actually talking about? And you said you're gonna uh, mention that. So I'm wondering if you could give us more <laughs> information on that. The, the prompt I was putting is that I think we really need to move from being human-centered to living-centered and understand that we are not the only species that inhabits this planet. So we really don't want to be human-centered, but we do want to be human-focused, which is very different because humans are the ones who are making all the decisions. So understanding humans is really important to shifting that focus from human-centered to living-centered. It, like it, it's always fascinating to me that the building performance conversations are happening with planning facilities and design, but the human-centered conversations are happening with the C-suite. Why? Like, how did we, like, I think the fundamental problem in practice is that the operating expenses and the capital expenses happen in two different buckets. So we don't really see the built environment as a strategy for our human and our organizational outcomes. And that really needs to happen. So there's one group that is all about building performance and is talking about building performance, but is only talking to the facilities people. Whereas you really need the CFO and the CEO to understand that creating sustainable buildings, sustainable work cultures, sustainable humans, like the whole idea of the UN SDGs benefits your organization, not just your building. And, and that I think is one of the challenges that we have, that who are we speaking with? We have to stop speaking to each other. Um, we have uh, one of the panelists hands up. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question if you like. Uh, actually, no, I'm uh, from the audience. Uh, my name is Alfonso Hernandez. I'm with Gensler. 
Um, so one of uh, oh, and I know Pali personally. Hi, Pali. Uh, yeah. uh, so one of the issues with um, uh, post occupancy evaluations actually is the fact that uh, sometimes uh, the studies show something that is unexpected, uh, and you know many architects actually don't don't do that because of reliability. So mm -hmm. I was I was curious about how HKS did their um, how 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 they approached uh, this this uh, um, situation of you know having done a post occupancy study yeah now that things uh, you know is 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 shown that the um, built uh, building performed as suspected or better than expected but what happens if it's the opposite. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And oftentimes I think that the incentive for not doing simple occupancy evaluations is because we are worried that we're going to find something that we don't want to deal with and that we don't know how we're going to take it back to the client. Uh, it's one of the reasons why for us at HKS, a lot of the work we have done with functional performance evaluations has really been, the cost has been absorbed by HKS. We have wanted to go back and do it. It's not the client asking for it. But nine times out of 10, we have also found that when some of the results are not what was expected, it's not just because of the space, but because how it was operationalized. So we designed for a certain intent, but the users of the space had no idea what the intent was. And the operations of the space were not designed in the way that the space was designed. So that disconnect between operations and space often leads to that gap. Um, I do feel though that clients appreciate that, that if we go back and say, hey, this is not exactly what we expected and this might be why, and here are some things that could change right now, there is an appreciation for authenticity. If you really badly screwed up, that might be a different issue. But oftentimes coming back and saying, here's what we were expecting. This is not exactly what, but we think this can be improved. This can be changed. Uh, that helps that we've always gotten a positive response. Uh, I actually feel that when clients just hear that, hey, we did everything great, congratulations to you and us, it, they're not very impressed. So always making sure that you're saying, here are some of the things that we think didn't go exactly how to plan. It may be because of the design of the space, it may be how you've operationalized it, it may be something that we just missed. But the bigger challenge, Alfonso, is the fact that, um, Teams turn out, the team that is really your client during a project is not always the team that is living in that. And that's often the bigger challenge of closing the feedback loop because there are years between the design, the occupancy, and when you can go back and look at the results. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Know. <laughs> and if you want to share insights from Gensler's perspective, feel free. I know you guys do a lot of that as well. Yeah, yeah, no, we do. And uh, um, but there's always also the uh, you know the the issue of uh, yes, yes, I agree on the on the um, part that um, you know many times is how you operationalize, not yeah. necessarily how you design. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there is the fact that uh, sometimes you're, you're, when you were, you're simulating, you're making a lot of assumptions and then you have to calibrate those models before yeah. uh, uh, you know, comparing with anything that is existing already. So it's also a question about, about data itself. Like, uh, you know, the climate yeah. data has gaps. Uh, to give you an example, also uh, infiltration on the envelope has, you know, it, it, it's a lot of assumptions made on 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 that as well. Yep. Uh, occupancy is a you know a, <laughs> a lot of assumptions around that as well. So yeah. Uh, um, so before comparing anything with a, a simulation, it needs to it needs to be uh, uh, calibrated. Yep. Agree completely, and I think the uh, the fact that our data isn't clean, the data is not consistently collected makes it impossible for us to create databases against which we can actually benchmark, which again would be my ask for academic partners saying it, it can't live within single industry or industry partners alone because we shouldn't be designing, testing, evaluating our own projects. 
you still have the issue of bias within that as well. So it, it's right, but it shouldn't be done solo. So again, another great opportunity for using practice as a test lab for what we could do in terms of really looking at the occupancy side. I'd like to ask a question. Uh, this is on, on behalf of Esther DeSufi. Um, and she first um, compliments you on the fascinating speech. Um, and her question is, considering that built environments change over time with society, mm -hmm. how would you recommend designers deal with this contingency? Um, and she's asking if there have been considerations of collaborating with social scientists who engage in qualitative work, such as ethnography. Um, and yes. how would you deal with connecting insight from qualitative research with sensor measurements in practice? And it's a phenomenal question. And if I didn't spell it out, I'll spell it out again. But I think qualitative research is very, very, very rich. So on the attendance today, we have our Live Learn fellow, Eleanor, who does a lot of the qualitative research and really being in the buildings. And we have Babak Soleimani, who's our data scientist, whose work is really trying to think about how do I take qualitative insights and translate them to quantitative. Uh, so I could not agree more. I think we don't have to rush. Qualitative insights by themselves are rich and worth their weight in gold. So we do not have to rush to, rush to quantify it. That's, that's the first thing I would say, that we actually have an anthropologist on our extended team, and we learn a lot from her. We have ethnographers we work with. Social workers get a completely different, social scientists get a completely different perspective. It's worthwhile. The second point I would make is today, we do have the opportunity to work with both big data and thick data. So quantification is possible, can be very, very rich, but we have to really scale it. That's why I use the data versus Delta. Think about the difference you're trying to make and think about what type of data is right for you to be able to make that difference. And don't be distracted completely by searching for more data, because if it doesn't, if, affect the decision you're trying to make, that can become very distracting, especially in applied projects. So uh, I think quantification is possible. It can give really, really rich insights. I don't know if, Babak, you want to speak up to that. I know that's something you work with. But including qualitative scientists is essential. Well, I think, I think, Bob, sorry, I think Babak is actually watching on YouTube. So he needs oh. to... So if, Oh, you're here. All I right. just promote. I just promoted. Okay. You got promoted too, yay! Yeah? Yes. <laughs> but no, I, I agree on that point uh, with Rapali. It's uh, I, the way I think about it every time is uh, qualitative research is more about what questions to ask and what are the issues. So it's more a divergent mode of investigation in that sense. Uh, especially when we go to new context, it's just understanding what is important in here. And then uh, quantitative is more of a convergent, which is now that we know we can uh, narrow it down. So I think they go hand in hand. Um, as in a, in a design process, you have that more exploratory phase, which is like you, you know, look at different options and then you kind of narrow it down. So that's, that's kind of the way I look at yeah. it uh, from, from qualitative to quantitative. Great point, Baba. The balance between exploratory and confirmatory methods, the divergent and convergent methods is really important. And the key question also when you work with social scientists is that the problems that they identify or how they engage with people is so different. And they may not always see the built environment as a strategy towards those solutions, which is something you can bring to the conversation. I see two hands. I think Az Azam was going to ask something first. So Azam signed up. No, no, Matt, go. Uh, well, I, I have I have so many questions, but you know, I'll try to I'll try to limit it. Um, thank you so much for the for the talk. I guess one thing that I would like to ask is what is the balance between uh, maybe into the point of the human centric versus living organism centric? You know, there's other things on the planet besides us. Um, wouldn't like the planet be better if we weren't making buildings at all? And, you know, we were just not living in concrete 
environments in steel and glass. So with that focus, you know, how, how would you see the optimal balance between it, it, caring and ensuring that the environment is safe, that all the living organisms that we have are safe, that I don't have my fly zapper trying to kill all the flies to stay out of my room, you know, what was that balance or relationship going to end up like in the living focus? That question is so much bigger than me, Matt. Like I, that it's, it's a great question. I, I remember being on a sustainability talk, maybe with Billy, where the person said, if you really want to be sustainable, just to your point, stop building. And certainly stop building suburban house. Like there are, there are fundamental things that we could do. We can't even get people to recycle. Uh, and, and that's why I said, understanding human motivations is really important because people reacted very quickly to the pathogen, to the pandemic, because it immediately affected them. They have difficulty reacting to something that is going to be a change over time. Like there's something about human motivations where we cannot respond to, some, to a change that is so far in the future that I can't see it. And, and that's where really understanding how do humans make decisions, where, like, which part of their brain are they responding from? What are the motivators is really, really important because there's some things that you're like, but this, it doesn't even make sense. This is going to affect you. I can guarantee it in 15 years. But 15 years is far enough. If it's not affecting me in the next 15 minutes, I'm not able to really compute it and make a responsible decision around it. So. I, I would almost answer it's not, the philosophical question is bigger and I'm not sure I have an answer for it because I think we truly have to think about it. But the tactical response is understanding the motivations of how humans make decisions and what motivators do, we, do they make it by. So if you want to move to a living centered perspective, the consequences of those decisions have to be broken down at multiple levels to how it's gonna affect you now, midterm, long-term, et cetera. Um, the other thing I would also say um, in terms of having this conversation is that uh, we have weaponized language and we have created such big complex words for so many different things that it's really, really difficult for the average Joe to make a decision today. So, simplifying what we are doing and why we are doing it would help all of us. If we could just find a common vocabulary, a common lexicon, that would help all of us. So maybe uh, I know David has a, a question, but I'm gonna ask my second one now, because uh, that, <laughs> that, that kind of uh, builds off of it. Something combining this and something you said earlier, um, what is more of the role for education of narrative for a student? So. To say we have to simplify language, to say that we need to make uh, the decisions more clear, why we're doing this, who we're doing mm -hmm. it for. Uh, it seems like in, in school, we, we focus a lot on do some precedent study, figure out what the meaning of the building was, and then spend 45 minutes explaining to me the narrative of what your building's about um, and not actually do an occupancy evaluation, not understand how people use it. Yeah. So in terms of education, what do we do here? Is this not the the way to, uh, forward or do we restructure narrative to make a simpler narrative? I, I think one of the points I was making towards the very end, Matt, is occupancy outcomes have to be talked about in the design intent. You have to clarify your hypothesis. You have to put it out there saying, I believe that I'm doing this because it's gonna affect these stakeholders in some way. Now, some things I have control over, some things I won't but understanding how this could play out after I build it, it has to be out there. I mean, for me as a researcher, it's always fascinating how I have to guess what the design intent is. And then you, and what happens is you land up post-rationalization. You go and look at outcomes and you say, oh, we intended it all along. It's great. Our, our occupancy evaluations look phenomenal. Uh, so that risk of post-rationalization is huge if you're doing work after occupancy, but you didn't link your design to outcomes when you were designing on that drawing and said, this is why. And so really talking about here's what I'm doing and here's every component of how it, I think, is going to affect the end user, the environment and the stakeholders. So I think this idea of the environment, 
the experience and the economics of it, all three of those, being able to speak about them together is a skill that we don't know. Um, and I think that is very much like I teach at Michigan as well. And it's, it's always interesting to me that you would do the most phenomenal work, but the intent is implicit. And it's so implicit that by the time someone is measuring impact, you're not able to really check it or measure it against the intent. That would be my two cents. And let's really, really clarify. Let's put it out there. Let's really talk in hypothesis while maintaining to David's earlier point that we don't have control over all the variables that affect the outcome, but we do understand our intent and what other variables could really come into play towards the outcome. Awesome. Thank you. Azam, do you have a, a question you would like to ask? No, no, go ahead, Dave. Um, it, Upali, it's a bit of a shift um, from from the conversation, um, which is really fantastic. Uh, but I guess my question is, you sit at the director level of a global firm, mm -hmm. and um, how do you, in a sense, how do you manage the economics of this part of the conversation in the day-to-day? -day? Because a lot of, um, I think, a lot of challenges that we face as a profession is how do we pay for this, right? Um, and it's a it's a big question because obviously there's lots of clients that are interested, there are clients that are resistant, et cetera. But maybe you could help us all elevate this kind of thinking and investment uh, in what we do. And I think it's a great question, David. And I would say that the cost has to be distributed across academy and industry. Like that's why I really pushed so hard on coalitions. Uh, it, it is not something that practice can afford alone. It's not something academia can do because you don't have access to the projects that's seamless. And uh, we really need like a match.com of what is academic interest? What is the industry opportunity? How do we bring these together so that we are benefiting, like we're elevating our profession instead of trying to elevate one organization at a time because our profession is so complex that it cannot be done. And I am happy to volunteer HKS as a test bed to the academic collaborators who are here, um, as, as well as my role on UM to the practitioners who are here. Like, we have to start those conversations. Thank you, Rupali. Great answer. <laughs> uh, that did relate. That did relate to my question, which was, yeah, how to. Um, uh, you mentioned open sourcing, and uh, the coalition, which I, I love, and uh, and thank you for the offer to to um, uh, to work with uh, the people in the community here. Um, uh, I guess the the question is, um, you showed one example where that was happening. Is that uh, how's that going? Is that working? It's going out? great. I mean, I think Eleanor, who's our fellow, is actually on this uh, group right now. And uh, I can put a link to the chat, but I think it's great. Like, what I love about doing it in this format is I think long after HKS leaves, the research and the development and the education will continue. And that's why I use the term intellectual sustainability. Like, why is it that we have such great ideas that die on the vine? We have such talent, such technology but it just doesn't work. And an example I've used in the past is like, when you go to a doctor, you don't want the doctor to say, hey, this is my research and I'm gonna treat you based on my research. But you just want the best treatment and the best research that's out there for him to treat you with. And I think the same applies to practice-based research that we want the design community to have access to the best research. And that can only happen with a collaborative framework and then go for it, like innovate from it. Um, that, that really should be, we should not be differentiating ourselves on the kind of IP that should be open shared because it benefits everyone. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much, Apali. Are there any more questions? I think there was, we only have one more minute, but there's one question uh, by an anonymous attendee who ask what shared themes about the human experience have you seen across your uh, Live Learn Lab? Um, well, I, I think again, Eleanor is there, but if you shoot me an email, I'd be happy to give a more detailed 
response. But some of the things that I showed around social signaling, I think the biggest insight for us has been how the window has changed, how the role of the window has changed when you have to live indoors for a long period of time. Um, and that's been a very fascinating insight. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Always a pleasure to see you and hear you present. Always. Always. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Polly. Thank you. All right. Are we on session three? We are moving uh -huh. into session three, and Al Stun has been promoted to a panelist. Um, for those of you who are presenters, if you would raise your hands, it helps us find you and promote you to panelists as well. All right, well, it seems like, it seems like we've got the, the first speaker uh, on cue, so that's great. So yeah, welcome to session three on uh, day lighting. Uh, I'm Alison Jakubiak, uh, professor at University of Toronto. I'll just be moderating this session. So we have uh, four eight-minute presentations and one four-minute presentation. Uh, to the speakers, I'll just uh, you know give you a heads up when you're when you're getting near the end, and uh, if you go more than thirty seconds to a minute over, to cut you off with no mercy. Um, <clears throat> Beyond that, uh, we're going to hold all the Q&A to the end, which I believe is how the rest of the day has been going. Um, however, for attendees, if you have any questions you'd like to ask the panelists, uh, don't hesitate to uh, type them out in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> and so with that said, uh, I'm very happy to welcome our, our first uh, speaker. Uh, it, you know, this here's where I should have asked how to pronounce everyone's name, but Evel Sepulveda, um, <clears throat> who's going to speak about the influence of daylight modeling decisions on daylight provision and glare protection. Uh, and he's from the Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. So take it away. Okay. Uh, hello to everyone. My name is uh, Abel Sepulveda, and I'm going to tell you today some uh, things about our investigation about the influence of daylight modeling decisions on daylight provision and glare protection. Um, first of all, uh, as you know, the human-centric design is nowadays one of the central criteria in architectural design, um, of course, in future, as future line. Um, within it, the visual comforting buildings is a really key component uh, in uh, overall comfort of occupants. Uh, specifically, the use of climate-based daylight modeling it's really important to uh, ensure and the relay, uh, reliable assessment of the daylight provision and daylight glare risk uh, in buildings. Uh, specifically, you can see here some uh, uncertainty uh, sources of a uh, uh, generic uh, daylight model. So we, we have obviously the level of detail of the 3D model. Also, how do you model the sky? Uh, also the reflectance value to use in the model, um, uh, optical characterization of the complex fenestration system also. Uh, in this uh, investigation, we didn't, um, we didn't change the, simul in the simulation parameters or the calculation methods. We are focused more on and make sensitive analysis touching the yellow color ones. So our case study is based on uh, the analysis of one room East uh, oriented uh, room uh, located in Tallinn, Estonia. Um, we analyzed to the, the, the daylight and glare uh, issues in during two days, one sunny day and or another partially clear uh, sunny day. And we, uh, as you can see here in figure three, we just uh, wanted to evaluate two directions for the, uh, to evaluate the glare risk. So and we, 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 we did both uh, measurements and also simulations. So basically the first uh, analysis, uh, error analysis, I will say, uh, is based, uh, aims to realize which is the influence uh, of not having calibrated the, the reflectance values of your model. And uh, what happens if you don't calibrate the pyranometer, for example, uh, that allows you to model 
um, uh, re in a reliable way uh, as Kai. So here you can see the in five or four that uh, as our measurements uh, of solar uh, radiation measurements were taken by this not calibrated paranometers. So we can see here how when you, we use a Paris sky, uh, we have a really high related de deviation in terms of uh, illuminance. As we, for example, if we are using a uh, see a clear sky for, for, for clear sky conditions, which is in the case, I mean, in this case is uh, eight in the morning, a sunny day. So basically you can see, and also you can see how even with the calibrated model in terms of reflectance of the make opaque surfaces, you can see how the illuminance relative deviation is uh, around, let's say 20%. How about the, the impact on, on annual uh, metrics like the HDA? Well, as you can see here, if we consider, for example, the reflectance values recommended by the standard, the European standard, uh, instead of calibrated ones, we are like uh, underestimating the uh, dilate provision, in fact, because we have a difference, a relative deviation in around 27%. So this is really curious. And now is the time uh, to quantify what, what, what's the thing, what's the matter uh, if we use different three-dimensional models. So you can see, well, the answer is uh, in terms of um, illuminance, there is not a clear conclusion, but in terms of, uh, in this case, DGP, we uh, focus on, on like uh, these uh, hours, you can see how in, in five or seven, uh, for example, for north orientation, and you don't have any, uh, not so much uh, difference between and the level of detail that in the 3D model you, you, you are using. But on the other hand, we have a really, really difference uh, in terms of DGP when you just are including the exterior uh, objects of the scene uh, in comparison with don't have, I mean, having nothing outside. So this is really curious because the, the, the uh, relative deviation in terms of DGP uh, goes from 60% if we, you don't include the exterior uh, objects and to almost like the half of it. So it's really important impact. Now the optical characterization of the CFS could be also a, an issue, but in this case, we um, quantify, we, we have uh, model the fabrics we use for this model, uh, previously measured by uh, uh, proper uh, equipment. And uh, we just analyzed uh, June, uh, June 5th. So you can see how the DGP for different uh, views and or, or for example, for the north orientation, you can see how the differences between the these gray uh, colors are not, so, I mean, it's like not significant, I would say. But on the other hand, you have like a really big uh, difference uh, actually in terms of DGP, uh, specifically the relative uh, deviation in terms of DGP, if you just are including your the textile in your model, is like around 76% when your view is towards the window. So even if you consider a, a proper model for the exterior scene, we are just proving that you have to be careful because you have a still really high errors in terms of DGP, but not, in, uh, not that much in terms of illuminance uh, as you can see here in five or eight, but that goes from, 20% as maximum to almost, I, don't, I will say 30 in average. So practical recommendations. Well, um, pay attention to these details uh, when you are just uh, uh, using and um, designing modeling a uh, uh, dilate model because could be like really ha have a really high impact in your calculations, not only a static calculation, but also a annual calculations. Obviously, the um, the assessment of the uncertainty it's really uh, valuable. And um, I will say 
the quantification of the DGP uncertainty is not a joke, since you can you could have really high errors in terms of annual metrics, uh, for example, for the glare protection, uh, if you don't check your model properly. Of course, uh, as future work, I will say, um, to study the influence of the following model in decisions, like different sky conditions and locations, because this study was in the, uh, in the Estonian context. Uh, also to take into account exterior scenes, uh, such as rural or natural environments, just modeling trees, uh, trees uh, vegetation, for example. And also the optic focus more on the optical characterization of the CFS um, to evaluate how, how good is your, the, the model you're using and the radiance material, for example. Thank you for your attention. I hope you have questions. So thank you, thank you, Abel. That was great, and on time. We're 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 going to hold the questions till the end of the session. Uh, but speaking next is uh, Stephen Masluski uh, from uh, HSLU and EPFL, uh, so Lucerne and Lausanne, um, <clears throat> and he's going to tell us about his new software, Ray Traverse. Okay. Hi. Thanks, Austin. Um, can everyone hear me? I'll take that as a yes. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm presenting some work I prepared along with my co-authors about ray traverse. Um, ray traverse is a new method that guides the sampling process of a daylight simulation. Um, to understand how this method can enhance the daylight simulation process, it's used to, useful to view the process by parts. The model describes how geometry, materials, and light sources are represented. Uh, sampling determines how the analysis dimensions are subdivided into discrete points to simulate. These view rays are solved for by a renderer, yielding a radiance or an irradiance value for each view ray. And then finally, this output is evaluated according to some metric or otherwise preparing the data for interpretations. To make a viable workflow, each of these parts require, whether explicitly or implicitly, a number of assumptions that define the limitations and opportunities of the method. To explain this in practical terms, here are three examples of well-known climate-based modeling methods for visual comfort. Illuminance-based methods, including DGPS, uh, the simplified daylight glare probability, limit the directional sampling resolution to a single sample per view direction in order to efficiently sample a larger number of positions and sky conditions throughout a space. Unfortunately, even if the employed rendering method perfectly captures the true illuminance as a model for discomfort glare, it fails to account for scenes where the dominant driver of discomfort is contrast-based or due to small bright sources in an otherwise dim scene. The three-phase and five-phase methods focus on the model and render steps. These methods fix the implementations of the materials and sky models by discretizing the transmitting materials and sky dome in order to replace some steps of the rendering process with a matrix multiplication. Like the five-phase method, the enhanced simplified daylight glare probability method, developed to overcome the limitations of illuminance-only metrics, uses separate sampling and rendering assumptions for the indirect contribution and direct view rays. The adaptation level is captured by an illuminance value, but glare sources are identified with an image calculated for direct view contributions only. In all of these methods, the sampling is treated as a fixed assumption. Either the directional sampling is directly integrated into an illuminance by the renderer, or a high resolution image is generated. This is because at intermediate image resolutions, the accuracy of the results can be worse than an illuminance sample and are unreliable for capturing contrast effects due to small sources. So unlike sampling positions or time steps, which can be set at arbitrary spacing and easily tuned to the needs of the analysis, Directional sampling is much more of an all or nothing choice, where the additional insights offered by an image can require 1 million times more data than a point sample. But is this really necessary? Whether through direct image interpretation or any of the commonly used glare metrics, the critical information embedded in an HDR image is usually simplified to a small set of sources and background, each with a size, direction, and intensity. We cannot directly sample this small set of rays because we do not know these important directions ahead of time, but how close can we get? The ray traverse method provides a means to bridge the gap between point samples and high resolution images, allowing for a tunable trade-off between simulation time and accuracy. 
Our approach is structured by a wavelet space representation of the directional sampling. It works by applying a set of filters to an image to locate these important details. To match our sampling space, we apply these filters to a square image space based on the Shirley Chu disk to square transform, which preserves adjacency and area, both necessary for locating true details. For each level of the decomposition, the high pass filters applied across each axis, vertical, horizontal, and in combination, isolate the detail in the image, and the low-pass filter performs an averaging, yielding an image of half the size. This process is repeated, applying the high-pass filters to the approximation, down to some base resolution. Each level of the decomposition stores the relative change in intensity at a particular resolution or frequency. The total size of the output arrays is the same as the original, and can be used to perfectly recover the original signal through the inverse transform. The benefit to compression comes from the fact that the magnitude of the detail coefficients effectively rank the data in terms of their contribution to the reconstruction. By thresholding the coefficients, less important data can be discarded. Even after discarding over 99% of the wavelet coefficients, the main image details are recoverable and only some minor artifacts have been introduced, which you can probably barely see in the shadow here, depending on the resolution of your screen. This property, that the wavelet coefficients rank the importance of samples at given resolutions, makes detail coefficients useful for guiding the sampling of view rays from a point. This process works as follows. Beginning with a low resolution initial sampling, the large scale features of the scene are captured. Mimicking the wavelet transform, we apply a set of filters to this estimate and then use the resulting detail coefficients both to find an appropriate number of samples and as probability distribution for the direction of these samples. The new sample results returned by the renderer are used to update the estimate, which is lifted to a higher resolution. This process is repeated up to a maximum resolution, equivalent to, or even higher than, what a full resolution image might be rendered at. There are some cases where the wavelet-based sampling will not find important details, such as specular views and reflections of the direct sun. Fortunately, because our method uses sky patch coefficients to efficiently capture arbitrary sky conditions, similar to the three-phase method and others, we can structure the simulation process in such a way to compensate for these misses. I refer you to, to our paper on details uh, for how this works. Uh, instead, I'll spend my remaining time sharing a few examples of scenes captured with our approach, a high resolution re reference, and a matching uniform resolution image to demonstrate the benefits of variable sampling. In addition to image reconstructions, the relative deviation from the reference is shown for vertical characterizing energy conservation and UGR or the unified glare rating characterizing contrast. Relative errors greater than 10% are highlighted in red, whether they're positive or negative. This very glary scene highlights the different paths that light takes from the sun to the eye including direct views, rough specular, and diffuse reflections of both the sun and the sky. While the deviation in the low resolution image is unlikely to change a prediction in this case, the large errors show a failure case for uniform low res sampling. A more complex, but also more likely scenario is that roller shades will be closed. While there are open questions on how to evaluate the specular transmission of such materials, Raytraverse does not introduce any substantial new errors to this process. Raytraverse performs similarly well for partially open Venetian blinds, including deeper in a space where the floor reflection dominates. Raytraverse, without virtual sources or other rendering tricks, handles the case of specular reflections of the direct sun, a difficult problem for low resolution sampling. One case that we would expect ray traverse to struggle with would be a high frequency pattern like the dot print shown here. And while the sampling does miss parts of the pattern, especially the lower contrast areas, enough of the detail is caught to meaningfully understand the image and because of the direct sun view sampling maintains high accuracy. In cases where more image fidelity is desired, ray traverse can be tuned to increase the sampling rate with a proportional increase in simulation time. But in our paper, we show that the low sampling rates previously shown achieve a high level of accuracy for field of view metrics.
So uh, thank you uh, for watching my presentation. I probably went very fast and could have put in a few more slides, um, but yeah, I'll just save that time for more questions later. So thanks. All right, thank you, thank you, Stephen. That was that was excellent. Um, so our next our next presenter is going to um, <clears throat> be Tatiana Estrina, a recent uh, Bachelor of Architectural Science grad from Ryerson University in Toronto. Um, and Tatiana is going to speak to us about multi-objective optimization in um, MERB building types uh, for Toronto. I think I think Toronto. Take care. There, thank you. Please go ahead. I mean, <laughs> hello. My name is Tatiana Estrina, and I am an architectural science student at Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada. Today, I am presenting a short summary of my co authored paper, which I contributed to together with Dr. Terry Peters at Ryerson University. It is called Multi Objective Optimization for Daylight in MERBs Developing and Testing a New Design Workflow. This presentation will begin with a short background, explaining our previous study and the workflow we developed, as well as a summary of the results. I will end with conclusions and future work. MERBs, or multi-unit residential buildings, are the fastest growing building typology in Canada and present typology-specific challenges with regards to daylight. Currently, there is a lack of daylighting metrics for MERB buildings and a need for understanding daylighting in this typology. This paper builds on a previous singular objective optimization study led by Dr. Terry Peters that used Galapagos fitness values and solar angles to generate new MERB building forms using daylight as a driver. The workflow for this study consisted of singular fitness values that balanced floor area, daylight, and floor plate continuity. You can read more about this in our paper. Although this previous study led to very interesting forms and results, this optimization approach proved to have several limitations. As the algorithm valued all inputs equally, the generated floor plates were discontinuous. The lack of daylight simulation software within the workflow also proved to be problematic, as the results were not specific to any particular site, season, or time of day. In order to improve on the previous study, several software packages were tested and examined. The final workflow incorporated the Octopus plugin for Grasshopper, enabling multi-objective optimization of both area and a daylight factor simultaneously, while crucially accounting for a Boolean input. You can read more about this in our paper. Now I will summarize the optimization workflow. The form generation begins with the establishment of an overall building area, subdivision into three by three meter tiles, and the reorganization of these tiles into a spiraling configuration. Next, for any given floor plate, the static tiles, which include core and surrounding access corridor tiles, are omitted from the optimization process, which further reduces the number of possible floor plate configurations. The gene pool, which is controlled by the octopus node, generates true or false values for each tile, which are then applied to the floor plate, retaining or omitting the flexible tiles based on the Boolean values. A Python node then provides a validity analysis of the generated floor plate iteration in order to ensure that the floor plate is not only continuous, but also contains more than 60% of the original floor area. This step of the workflow is crucial in both reducing the invalid generations, but also significantly cutting down the analysis time. If the floor plate is deemed valid, daylight analysis is performed on the resulting floor plate. Previously generated floor plates above, the mechanical core and the context are included in this analysis. The daylight value from the simulation is then used for optimization. Finally, Octopus multi-objective optimization is able to chart out and compile all of the valid iterations that were examined. The Boolean validity value is crucial in reducing the population of invalid iterations, as when the node comes across a falsely valued among the potential options. This is a summary of the workflow. You can read more about this in our paper. This study initially considered several major daylight metrics. However, we ended up using a relatively new residential daylight metric, direct lighting access, or DLA, developed by Dogen and Park. DLA was selected because of its it was specifically designed for residential program types and focuses on daylight availability. 
In the selection process for this study, the most optimized solution was deemed to be the one with the lowest slope or the least discrepancy between the average DLA value for the floor plate and the gross floor area, while still having the highest possible values. This solution, despite not having highest values on either spectrum, provided the most balanced generation, therefore proving to be most optimal. We tested several case studies, including this one located in Toronto, Canada. The existing building has undulating balconies that shade parts of the largely glazed facade. Its building envelope was used in this study to generate the optimized variation of the building that can be seen on the right. Although the perimeter analysis tiles on the original design were able to reach very high DLA values, the interior tiles did not perform as well. The optimized forms generated using the multi-objective optimization workflow considered similar dimensions to the original building and retained the functional core, but did not maintain the same usable area on each floor plate causing optimal, optimized options to be significantly smaller, reducing the number of possible units. You can read more about this in our paper. By generating new floor plates that provide better daylighting, the building was able to achieve higher DLA values. The resulting optimized form proved to be sensitive to orientation, and interestingly, the floor plates near the top of the building created light wells into the center without creating any holes or unusable spaces within the floor plates. In this study, we tested a new workflow using multi-objective optimization. Our results showed that it is possible to generate options with higher levels of daylight and optimized variations. However, one significant drawback was its reduced area, as only approximately 60% of the building's initial footprint was retained. While this workflow omits many critical considerations for the construction of a successful MERB, and does not claim to provide a viable form for building construction, we instead propose that this workflow should serve as a conceptual exploration of how MERB building forms could differ if lighting were placed at the forefront of residential design. Future work will include incorporation of other elements such as energy use and thermal comfort and the examination of forms beyond the point tower with repeated floor plates. Thank you very much for attending my presentation. Thank you, Tatiana. That was great. Um, so our next presentation is is um, <clears throat> going to be from uh, Afshan Rehman on multi-objective optimization of Indian Jali fenestration systems, looking at visual, thermal, and perceptual performance. Uh, so yeah, uh, take it away. You guys have four minutes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Me and uh, my uh, peer, Amulya, a second year Master of Sustainable Design students from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, for our research in the Shaping Daylight course by uh, Professor Aste Sawyer, we chose to study an Indian vernacular design element called the Jali. It is used as a partition wall that reduces glare, solar insulation, and provides unobstructed views and cool breeze. It is mostly made out of sandstone, marble, and clay, and the modules are symmetric in nature and can be repeated multiple times over a grid that creates an illusion of continuity. For this reason, we did a perceptual study as these intricate patterns have a psychological effect. A lot of research has been done with Jalis. The effect of these modules have been studied on visual and thermal perform uh, comfort separately. Our hypothesis was that visual and thermal comfort are correlated with the amount of sunlight received, and hence, we wanted to multi-objectively optimize the Jali patterns for perceptual, visual, and thermal comfort. We chose a 28 meter by 15 meter space in a library building in Delhi as a test case. We chose Delhi as test case location for two reasons. Uh, one being Jalis have been extensively used for uh, hundreds of years in Delhi. And second being Delhi has hot and dry climate, which makes Jali a suitable facade screen. To choose Jali patterns for our qualitative survey, we referenced the geometrical pattern study by Abdullahi and we chose six patterns that are native to the Indian subcontinent. The climate of Delhi is extremely hot and dry, hence it is important to cut down this direct solar radiation entering the spaces. The first step in the study was to study uh, the qualitative effects of Jali patterns and the shadows it creates. We conducted a survey with 30 students from the School of Architecture at CMU, where they were asked to choose their most preferred Jali pattern for a library space. It was a two-part survey where one question had renders of the exterior elevation and one question had interior views of the library. 
the results showed that the participants preferred simple jali patterns and the most preferred pattern was the eight point jali the pattern selected from the results of the survey were optimized in two ways for daylight first the solid to void ratio was changed and sda and ac was calculated it was observed uh, that the solid to void ratio when it reduces the percentage of sda and ac received increases module of solid to void ratio of 70 is to 30 was selected as it was the only module that received lead credits this panel was then optimized by changing the depth or the thickness when the cross section of the jali was made more than 100 mm the spatial daylight was reduced drastically since only the solid to void ratio of 70 to 30 works well for daylight study we took that ratio as constant and varied the depth of screen to find the optimum depth The annual solar radiation is significantly decreasing as the depth of the screen increases. However, from the previous daylight study, only 50 mm, 75 mm, and 100 mm depth screens were giving the desired lighting levels inside the space. Hence, to find the optimum jali screen, we plotted the lead daylighting credits and annual solar energy density along the depths of the screens. Based on the quantitative and qualitative optimization studies. We arrived at an optimized eight-point jali pattern with solid-to-void ratio of seventy is to eighty. Sorry, seventy is to thirty, and a depth of hundred mm for the test case library in Delhi. To summarize the paper, uh, the paper basically highlights an important research methodology to generate an optimized jali pattern that can be used by architects or engineers to develop building screens that improve perceptual daylighting and uh, thermal performance of indoors. In this study, we explored the perceptual daylighting and thermal performance of jali screens, but future studies could also explore wind as another objective for optimizing the screen. Uh, and that concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you all for listening. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so we have one uh, final presentation in this session. Last but not not least. Uh, Jarong Shea uh, will speak to us about machine learning based methods for controlling automated shading systems. So uh, take it away, Jarong. Uh, thank you, Elston. Let me. Okay. Oh, hi, everyone. This is Jarong Shea from Carnegie Mellon University. I am a third year PhD student uh, from School of Architecture. And this work is part of my PhD dissertation with the guidance of my advisor, Azad Sawyer. This is an overview of this presentation. So first, let's go to the research background. As is well known that automated shading systems are Um, are important to balance the benefits and drawbacks of daylight ingress. Uh, they are expected to uh, improve occupants' health well and well-being, reduce lighting and heating energy use without causing glare, thermal discomfort, and, dis and increase cooling energy use. It is widely accepted among researchers that glare prevention should take priority over other considerations. When designing a dynamic shading system, this table summarizes the uh, the control algorithms used in commercial systems. As we can see, most of them are pretty simple and preliminary, um, meaning that they might be not satisfy the occupants. Actually, there have been studies reporting that. These systems are overridden by occupants in practice from time to time, indicating that they are not doing a good job to satisfy the occupants' requirements. So, in the literature, there have um, researchers have proposed some advanced methods. For instance, uh, controlling the shading devices according to occupants' behavior, or driving a data-driven model um, from the measured data. However, each of these methods has their own limitations. For instance, the HDR image-based method relies on the use of image sensors, which might cause privacy concerns, especially in open plan offices. And the model predictive control with a real-time daylight simulation can be computationally intensive. 
leading to a slow response of the control system. To summarize, now this method is really suitable for industrial applications. To address the research gap, this study proposed a sim simplified shading control method. It is glare-based, however, it, doesn't, it, it does eliminate the use of multiple sensors. It doesn't rely on the use of image sensors or real-time daylight simulation. Instead, it makes use of one pyranometer with machine learning predictive models. The workflow consists of three phases. In the first phase, daylight simulation will be conducted and the annual glare profile will be obtained. And the second phase, machine learning predictive models will, will be developed using the data obtained in phase one. And phase three is the control stage with the model developed in phase two plus the real-time measurements of solar irradiance the algorithm predicts the real-time glare, glare condition and controls the shading devices accordingly. This method was verified using climate-based daylight simulations. It was used to open or close the plans in an open plan office. As displayed in this floor plan, two workstations were selected for the demonstration, one located in the east and the other in the west. So this is the detailed workflow that is used in the case study. In the first step, um, point-in-time glare simulation was conducted using TMY weather, and the data was then used to, to develop the machine learning predictive models. Specifically, three classification algorithms were used, including SVM, KNN, and RF. And the final, uh, the final step is to verify the performance of the proposed method using climate-based daylight simulation. Specifically, a historical year's weather was used uh, for the simulation. Uh, in this paper, we define the term unsteady heat to indicate the percent of time when the glare was captured and prevented. And we also estimated the, uh, the potential in lighting energy saving if the control of the lighting and the shading are integrated. This figure shows the result for the East workstation. Uh, we can see that the method successfully prevented 92 to 99% of annual glare, and it, potentially, it can potentially reduce lighting energy use by 60 to 63%, regardless of the algorithms used. We also compare the performance of the method uh, with different climates. Specifically, we compared the result with a cloudy climate and a sunny climate. As shown in this figure, uh, it, can be, it can be seen that this method performed better with a location, uh, for, for a location with a sunny climate in glare prevention. Uh, we also compared the results at the two workstations. It is found that the method performed better in glare prevention for the east workstation. We suppose that it is due to, I mean, it is because the major reason, the major cause of the glare at the two workstations is different, um, meaning that whether um, the thing is too bright or the contrast ratio is too large. Uh, however, future studies are certainly required to verify this assumption. To summarize, uh, this study indicates that machine learning models developed from pre-simulation can be used for real-time shading control. And uh, the case study indicates that it was successful in glare prevention and uh, it had a great potential in reducing lighting energy use if we integrate the control of the shading and the lighting. And also we found that the, the method performed better in glare prevention with a sunny climate. Despite all these strengths, there are several limitations that need to be addressed in future studies. Uh, first of all, physical validation is certainly required and the more complex control strategies can be tested uh, in future work. 
also um, um, questions, these questions need to be answered, like how to minimize data set for model development and how to include occupants in the control loop and, adapt, and make the control strategy adapt to their preferences. So more details can be found in the conference paper. Also, the relevant uh, research is published in Building an Environment. The audience can access this paper using the following link. So that's it. Thank you all for your attention and any questions are welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, and and uh, thank you to all of the all of the authors and and speakers. If if you all would like to you know turn your video and and microphones on, that would, I guess would be a good time. Um, and I'd like to invite the audience. We have about fifteen to twenty minutes for questions, so please uh, let us know what you'd like to what you'd like to discuss. Um, there's uh, you know a little bit of a discussion going on um, <clears throat> in the in the chat already, so maybe I can just uh, relay this, uh, especially for those on YouTube who aren't able to see the chat. Um, although I'm not, how to I'm not sure how to interpret this question, um, but nonetheless, I'll I'll start I'll start us off with the question. So this is uh, sim simply because you went last. This is for you, John. Um, and I think also because there's a lot of questions about about accuracy um, in like at least three of the papers uh, from this session. Um, so when you evaluated your uh, your accuracy metric, you actually did not include false positives. So um, how does how does that look when you when you include uh, false positive indicators of glare? Are there any? Um, does that change the way you might interpret or? evaluate your, your measure of success? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, in this study, we use, actually we use the uh, record score, which uh, I mean, mainly focuses on the uh, false negative because in glare prevention, we really want to focus on the cases that there is glare and we uh, capture this glare, I mean, we capture the glare and we, we don't want to miss any glare cases. That's why we selected a uh, record score as the metric. If you, um, when you, uh, the false negative, yeah, the, the audience asked for the false, the false, the false positive or false negative, sorry. Um, false. Positive. False positive, False positive. Where you identify right, glare right. when there is none. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. So yeah, in this study, we only use the record score because we want to focus on the false negative. Uh, false negative means there, there is glare, but your algorithm predicts there is no glare. So you, you miss the glare, which can cause glare problem when you apply the shading, uh, shading algorithm. Um, yeah, it's for a more sy systematic uh, evaluation of the strategy, I would say adding the false positive would be great. Um, so with this case, you can, um, yeah, yeah, I would say like uh, for the purpose of this study is, is not our focus, but if you can, we can add the false positive, meaning you can use other um, metrics like the precision or the accuracy that would give uh, us a more systematic evaluation of the strategy. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we still don't have any any questions from the audience. So I'm I'm just going to uh, take over with what I'm interested in about the paper. Oh, I know there is a question now. Uh, so uh, Todor says, I wonder how automatic shades are perceived by users. We hated them in our office because we we couldn't control them. They had some serious bugs, so we used we used curtains instead. Uh, I don't know if this has to be specifically answered uh, by you, Jarong, and maybe it's it's a kind of open question to all of the lighting experts yeah. uh, in the panel, uh, um, since you didn't do any user acceptance studies. Yeah, I didn't do it. Yeah, that's one of the limitations I mentioned in my study. Yeah, I uh, yeah in the introduction part, uh, I yeah I I've um. I've mentioned that studies have reported that 
these systems are overridden by occupants from time to time because occupants want to have control over these shading devices. Uh, I think, I mean, in future, in the future work, we really need to include the occupants in the control loop, meaning give control back to them. Um, and uh, the an intelligent system would uh, learn, I would say learn from their, their, their interactions with the shading devices and adapt to their preferences so they don't have to I mean, override the system frequently. That's so what machine learning would be, would be good at that task, I suppose. Yeah, that would be. Yeah. So I, I, I want to jump to another kind of question of accuracy all the way back to the to the very beginning, I suppose, with Abel's paper. Um, and uh, you you noted, um, I, I think, t one really interesting weakness that you uh, Abel that you had this um, gonio photometer measured um, BSDF, and it seemed to introduce a lot more error into your simulation than we would uh, expect. Do you think that was just a measurement error, or uh, what was what was going on there? Um, um, because I, I I think a lot of practitioners would see that as the um, you know the the be all of you you know what the lighting properties are, but somehow there was a disconnect there, right? Yeah, uh, I think there are um, there could be due to the two reasons probably. One of them is the level of um, um, modeling accuracy of the optical properties itself of the shading, um, also the um, as we may, um, as we saw the influence of the exterior scene to the to the to the DGP error. So I think it could be a combination of both, or obviously the typical, you know, uh, error itself of the analysis. But it, there has to be some of these three, or combination of these three reasons, I would say. But uh, I will, I will, I will uh, trust on the on the modeling of the shading with the claims and peak extraction because we, in a further investigation, we we use this model. And it seems pretty pretty fine with with the for the DGP calculations because we compare it with another resolution like there's a tensor three and so on. So I think could be like a, it's a really interesting point to go further, actually. That, that, that would be interesting. Uh, for the audience, they they used a peak extraction BSDF, which should have a should allow a lot of the specular components through, but uh, it would be interesting to compare to a tensor tree in terms of material accuracy required. Um, maybe I don't want to guide the whole Q and A if I can avoid it. Um, I would like to actually ask maybe the panelists if any one panelist has a question for another by chance. Otherwise, I can keep going, of course. I have questions for everyone. Well, I have a, I have a question. Um, not really the panelists, but <laughs> I'll ask it. Um, for Stefan, the, the ray traverse is super interesting. I was wondering if you could kind of elaborate on where you see this outside of the simulation that you were concerned on or, or lighting of, because it seems to be applicable in, in quite a few research areas, the ability to do this kind of, uh, you know, subsampling, of a uh, light simulation. So are, are you asking outside of lighting simulation or outside of? Maybe outside of architecture and design version of, of what we care about lighting simulation. I'm thinking maybe animation or, or graphics in, in that sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I, definitely within the realm of lighting simulation, I think it could apply in a, in a lot of ways. Um, there are some computer graphics papers that have taken wavelet-based approaches to sampling. Um, but that hasn't made it into, um, into our field specifically of, of performance metrics. Um, most of what I'm focused on is sampling as little as possible, um, sort of at the expense of visual fidelity. So it's how do you maintain photometric accuracy with, uh, while minimizing the, um, uh, the simulation time required, which is a, a little bit different than the, 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 um, balance of 
priorities for computer graphics or uh, animation where you're prioritizing visual fidelity um, over at the expense of accuracy because you don't really care because what you're ultimately interested in is a tone mapped image. Um, and so you're just using the physically based um, rendering techniques to arrive at something that looks realistic. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's uh, this field of, uh, it's not really compressive sampling, but it's, it's in the same realm of looking at how to sample less and how to get more directly to the data that you're interested in, I think has very wide reaching applications for sure. Yeah, I, I guess I was thinking that, that area with um, NVIDIA is now working on the deep learning you know, subsampling. Um, and we're talking a lot about Zoom and these video conferences, like if we can recreate physically accurate uh, lighting to some point, knowing that it's correct and then being able to reconstruct some of it later, it seems like your area is on that first step. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I, I've, I've been realizing I'm using a lot of techniques that people who do machine learning use to prepare the data, except then I'm uh, just using what we know about physics and our own knowledge of daylight consulting and what people like or not to, to just use our knowledge and human knowledge. Um, but yeah, I, you know, thinking about that image I showed with just the seven rays that we are looking at compressing some of the data even farther to prepare it for that type of clustering and optimization that could could really be applied to, to all sorts of problems. Yeah, super interesting, thank you. Yeah, but it's absolutely not compatible with GPUs whatsoever because it relies on all sorts of information that you would never be able to load into a GPU processor. So no luck for NVIDIA. We might take that as a challenge. <laughs> But um, yeah, so uh, I have a I have a question uh, for <clears throat> uh, for Tatiana actually, uh, which which is uh, your your optimization metric besides area was uh, DLA uh, uh, direct light access right and um, so I wanted to to give you a chance uh, to maybe answer what that really means for uh, an apartment unit and what the ranges of DLA mean. I think one, on one hand, it's not a metric that a lot of people are familiar with. And even I was a little confused going back to the kind of source paper for DLA and, and what a value between zero to 100 means for, um, for DLA and the way you, you, you optimize it in your paper. So DLA is uh, structures it around how much time a particular tile gets light over the course of the year, um, specifically direct light, um, because of the way that it's um, geared towards residential um, technologies. So um, the more, the higher a value, that means the more time of the year a tile gets direct light, um, which is, preferable in residential um, environments because you want to have lighting and you want to have uh, daylighting specifically in order to reduce energy use, but also to help with health and mental wellness. Um, so the higher a value, for, so for instance, on the exterior of a building, you would have very high values. Um, as you go in, um, towards the interior, they would reduce significantly. Um, and what we were trying to do was try to balance it so that there's light coming into areas that are more uh, closer to the cores or the interior and see what buildings would look like if um, this daylight access was valued over other elements such as um, repetitive forms and so on. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think we could probably even have a more extended discussion about this, but um, luckily we're in the same city, although we can't really meet, we can't meet in person these days. Um, finally, uh, I'm just check to make sure there's no other questions. Nope. Um, finally, uh, for, for Afshan and Amulia, um, I wanted to to bring a question to your kind of. I think both both you, your optimization strategy and Tatiana's have something uh, in common, and that you have this kind of procedural strategy about how you proceed with the optimizations. Uh, but for you guys specifically, I wanted to ask 
um, uh, you, you optimized first for the kind of solid void percentage and then separately from that you optimized uh, with regards to depth. And what that allowed you to do was to say, okay, well, this is the one Jolly pattern. But do you do you think, uh, or what do you think? Um, could you have provided more, you know, design options if you looked at depth and uh, opacity, like projected opacity, uh, separately? Because of course, you know, more depth with with more vertical open area could give you the same shading coefficient as, uh, you know, a different combination. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what you said, because we, we, we tried with depth first, and then we tried to change the aperture. Uh, but but when we did like what we did now, we, we were able to fix one, uh, one element first. So the solid to void ratio, we were able to pick that first. And then we, we were able to change the depth for daylight and solar. So it, it was ju just done to be made easy, but now for my capstone project, uh, I am working further on this research. So I am doing a, a sorry, uh, yeah, I am doing a, a algorithmic workflow for. I'm looking at depth. I'm looking at uh, the uh, solid to void ratio too, which is uh, why. Uh, like like you said, I'm definitely getting the variability. I, I'm I'm getting a lot of options. It's not as constrained as it is now. Okay, that's great to hear. And um, so we've at least gone through the loop of all the speakers. Um, without any other questions, uh, we can respond to to Todor's question and give a four minute break before the next session. Um, so again, I want to thank all of the presenters and authors. It was great reading your papers and seeing your presentations. And I'm, I'm sure the attendees uh, feel the same way. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alston, thank you. Sorry for the piano in the background. <laughs> thank you, Alston. Thank you. I did it. Hi, Sandra. Sorry, I was like scrambling for my mute button. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. I just lose my voice, but... <laughs> well, make all the presenters do all the work for you. Right. <laughs> so how are you? How are you holding I'm good. up? Yeah. I haven't I haven't actually I think seen you in, in a very long time. I'm happy to see you virtually. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the last time we saw each other was um uh, uh in Shanghai, right? Yeah, because I uh I I screwed up on our Paris appointment if you remember. I still feel bad about oh, that. No, no, no. No worries at all. We had a delightful lunch near your apartment and your apartment is amazing. <laughs> Well, technically it wasn't mine. It was uh, a guy named Stuart Russells, who was a very mm -hmm. famous AI computer scientist <laughs> at Berkeley. Uh, and I was lucky to live at his house. Anyways, um, this is all being recorded. Hello, everybody. Uh, Sandra, I'm gonna go on mute and, and off camera for a minute. Sure. I have a lot of noise at my house at the moment. It's good to see you. Hi, Sandra. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank <laughs> you for for joining us today. Oh, absolutely, my pleasure. I'm going to ask uh, the next presenters to raise their hand so I can promote them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm getting sure. that. I'm moving them from the attendees to panelists, so.
I'm kind of frozen. Yeah, your your video is frozen. Hmm. I'm not sure what I can do about it. Um, if you maybe turn it off and back on. I tried already. Yeah. Well, I tried to leave and then uh, try to come back, okay? Okay, sounds good. Hello. Hi, Alicia. Hi, nice to meet you. You too. Finally. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Alicia. Hey. Two days in a row. Yeah, going to be around. Good to see you. Hey everyone, this is Fatima. Hi Fatima, thank you for joining us. Sure, sure. Nice to meet you. In person, you too. Virtually. <laughs> Are we missing anybody? We're missing a few authors, right? Looking for Agreed and Hoda. Okay, if I see them in the attendees, I'll promote them. But I don't see them right now. Attendees, if you're presenting, okay, I see one. Tagreed, I just moved you. Um, Hoda, if you're here, please raise your hand so we can move you over. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was muted. Hi, I'm here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so should I start my presentation or wait for others? Hi. Hello? Um, maybe, maybe you should start. Sandra, do you, is that a good idea? The first one on, on the list is Alicia. Um, and I would say that um, just in in uh, trying to protect time and stay on time, if Alicia is ready, um, um, we should just let her get going. Shall, shall I just well, share the presentation? Or? Hello. <laughs> Probably ah, I should you. introduce. Ah, there she is. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Sandra Manninger, and I'm here to represent Erliat, the Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, a collaboration between Taubman College, Michigan Robotics, and Computer Science at Michigan University. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the first presenter today, Alicia Nama, uh, Namad Vasquez. Uh, with her paper, Utilizing Unit-Shaped Networks as Simulation Tools in Form-Finding Processes for Fabric. Alicia. Oh, Please thank start. you. Yeah, thank you. Very happy to be here. Let me share the screen. Um, right. Is that, is that okay? Um, hello. I'm uh, very happy to be here today um, to present this paper, uh, Utilizing Unit Shape Networks, a simulation tools in form finding processes for fabric. Oh, sorry. Uh, the aim of, the, of this research is to use machine learning to predict the behavior of nonlinear materials such as fabric when, def when deformed due to gravity and also to targeted manipulation. The robot arm flexibility, accuracy, precision, and repeatability makes it a suitable tool to manipulate the fabric. The robot coordinates at the point of material manipulation are used as parameters that inform the machine learning model how the cloth is being affected and test the predicted deformations after manipulation. As mentioned before um, in this conference, fabric can be simulated using physics solvers such as a kangaroo, maya, and cloth. However, finding the correct parameters to match the digital simulation with the physical materials require from intensive fine tuning and a lengthy trial and error process. Tuning is complex and it's a computationally intensive process. The concrete infused cloth material used to train the model has a dual characteristic of a soft fabric on its dry state when it is easy to manipulate and acquires the strong characteristics of concrete 
once fully hydrated after 24 hours of settling. The initial three hours after hydration and before it starts to settle, the material is flexible and can be freely deformed without affecting its integrity. This is the period used to capture the data set. Patterns of cotton joints applied to the concrete influence the final shape after the formation and the degree of influence of the robotic deformations. Different patterns and their outputs are tested before collecting the data set. A setup for data capture was designed. It consists of a rectangular frame where the fabric is clamped and underneath and at the center is an Intel sense camera that takes point clouds of the cloth before, during, and finally the and final status after the deformation. The camera fixed position ensures accurate mapping between the deforming object and the deformed cloth on the compiling, on, on the compiling of the data set. The robot had a dual end effector with a cutting tool on one side and a plunging sphere on the other. It cuts the pattern before starting the deformation process. After the cutting is done, the first initial condition scan is taken. Then the robot starts plunging, massaging, and hydrating the cloth. The resultant condition after each plunge is used as the initial condition for the next, for the next one in the data set. The physical data of the nature means that the, that the robot spent three weeks deforming 10 pieces of cloth using 300 random positions on each to capture a total of 6,000 point clouds of previous and final positions, which become our data set. Once all the point clouds from the condition before and after each plunge were captured, the plunging coordinates of the sphere and its radius are superimposed into the input image to ensure accurate mapping of the plunging location and the resultant shape. This technique is commonly used to generate machine learning data sets for bridge loads, superimposing the position of the loads into a final composite image. Point clouds are converted into depth images of 512 by 112 pixels. A blur of 20 is, apl is applied to the set of overlap image to reduce noise. A unit architecture was chosen as they have been developed to deal with biomedical images where the target is not only to classify whether there is an infection or not, but also to identify the area of the infection. Developed by Rosenberg et al., UNET have skip connections, which allow them to train with less data than regular combinational neural networks. The layers are assembled one at a time, connecting them in a UNET style. A special care needs to be taken with the skip connections that skip over the max pooling layers and go directly to the concatenate to combine the higher resolution information with the lower resolution feature space. The model was set using 40 feature layers in TensorFlow. Validation is performed both through the validation data set of 300 pairs of initial and resultant conditions, and by cutting new pieces of fabric, we complete unknown patterns to the network and deform with 120 random plunging positions. The network prediction from an input of a deformed cloth and plunging position were within 5 millimeter range of real deformations. This research demonstrates of a feasible route to capture tacit material knowledge and accurately predict its behavior when forces are applied to deform. It promotes a predictive understanding of physical material behavior. Future steps include what can be called reverse form finding, in which a final deformation is given and the trained model can find the parameters that led to that result from an initial condition. So using the trained model to define simulation parameters, reducing a time intensive and computationally intensive process. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, next is, uh, who, uh, I would like to invite Huda Khalil to present a paper and automation tool for cell depth CO2 diffusion models written by Huda Khalil and Gabriel Weiner. What, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. Okay. Hello everyone. I will start my presentation right away. So good day, everyone. I'm presenting for you today CD Square, an automation tool for cell depth CO2 diffusion models, co-authored by Professor Gabriel Weiner and myself, Dr. Roda Khalil. In the presentation, I will briefly explain why we got motivated to create the tool, what is the tool, and a demo of how it works. The why or the motivation that inspired us to create this tool First of all, uh, measuring CO2 concentration levels indoor is essential for maintaining healthy indoors air quality. An important application that has also been addressed lately is the use of CO2 diffusion models as a way of determining the risk of virtual infection in a closed space. Also, CO2 concentration levels are used to detect occupants in closed spaces. 
this information is useful for uh, demand control of lighting, ventilation, and to ensure energy efficient efficiency um, in consumption. The problem is that understanding how CO2 diffuses in an indoor space and how the parameters of an indoor space affect it is difficult to achieve uh, by physical experimentation. Therefore, modeling, the simulation, modeling and simulation is the solution to achieve these goals. In previous studies, we have created and verified cellular discrete event specification, cell devs models, to study the diffusion of CO2 indoors. An example of this is, uh, of the application of these models is understanding the effect of different parameters like the dimensions and the location of windows. The two videos shown here are of two spaces with different configuration and the CO2 concentration changes based on these configurations. Now handling the steps of creating and reconfiguring the model manually required the use of many tools and connecting those tools to one another. This process was time consuming, error prone and unintuitive. Now for the what, the model and the tool that we use, uh, the model we are using takes into consideration several parameters, uh, the dimensions of the indoor space, CO2 sinks, and those are the windows and ventilation ports, and also the occupants, CO2 sources that occupy the space and breathe to produce CO2 constantly. Now, CD Square, our tool that we are presenting today, facilitates creating, changing, and simulating CO2 dispersion indoors. So through a web interface, the user can implement a cycle of features. This starts by converting a simple floor plan into a cell devs model. Second, the user specifies some settings. For instance, uh, the status of the windows, whether they are closed or open, also, the user can specify the number of occupants, occupants in the space, and those can be generated randomly in different empty locations as uh, cells of type CO2 sources. And then at this point, CD Square updates the model with configuration uh, entered by the users and prepares this package to be sent to the next step. And the next step is RISE. CD Square uses a CD++ engine running on RISE, oh, sorry. running on RISE, which is an interoperability simulation environment middleware. So CD Square establishes communication with RISE and calls the appropriate APIs to submit the model files to the RISE web services to simulate the model. Finally, when RISE finishes simulation, it stores the simulation results on RISE server and then CD Square downloads the results for uh, the user to, to visualize them. Now here is a case study showing how CD Square is useful to predict the effect of different parameters on indoor air quality. On the left side, we have a scenario of an apartment with five occupants, open windows, while the same space is represented on the right with 10 occupants only and closed windows sorry, 15 occupants in closed windows. And each scenario shows the uh, same floor plan on the right side. The first scenario uh, on the left shows that open windows introduce fresh air with lower CO2 concentration, while the scenario with closed windows and more occupants shows higher CO2 concentration due to the consistent production of CO2. Thank you for listening and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Huda. Uh, next presentation is by Fatami Sashavari and Sore Shagashian. Uh, the, the, they will present a paper application of classification and feature selection in building energy simulations. Fatami, if you want to share your screen. Thank you, Sandra. I'm going to share my screen. Um... Can you see my screen now? We can. Awesome. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Fatima. I'm a PhD student in architecture at Texas a and University. I'm going to present our paper with Zohre today about the application of classification and feature selection 
in building energy simulations. In this research, a simple machine learning classification method known as the linear discriminant analysis or LDA was used to classify buildings energy consumption into three levels of low, medium, and high. Two feature selection methods, uh, including the principal component analysis or PCA and the exhaustive feature selection or EFS uh, were applied to reduce data dimensionality and uh, find the key features to improve uh, the building energy performance. A hypothetical design scenario was developed in this study with six material alternatives for an office building in Los Angeles, California. The best design alternative uh, was selected based on the LDA results. And then the key input parameters uh, are uh, determined based on the PCA and EFS uh, methods. This study specifically focuses on the building envelope materials um, to identify the important features that crit um, have critical impact uh, on building energy performance. A parametric model of the building is developed in uh, Rhino and Foxhopper, and the energy simulation out outputs are recorded and used to classify each building design uh, alternative as a high, uh, medium, or low alternative. The data set uh, in this study contains seven features of building envelope materials uh, properties. Uh, and, the, and those seven properties include uh, thickness, thermal conductivity, density, specific heat capacity, solar absorptance, visual absorptance, and thermal absorptance. And I should say that the mean and standard deviation values for each feature uh, was obtained from the literature. The input samples for each building material are generated and uh, the simulations are run for 600 times in total with Energy Plus simulation tool available in your debug uh, in Grasshopper. Um, the figure on the left uh, shows the distribution of the building thermal loads uh, and uh, resulting from each uh, type of the uh, building envelope material. And um, the data uh, were split to the training and test samples with a ratio of 35 and 65%. Uh, also, the data were normalized due to having uh, different scales of the features. The LDA classification method combined with the PCA feature selection was conducted uh, in the first step on the training data. And the screen plots on the uh, right in this slide showed a uh, percentage of variance corresponding to each principal component of PC. And as you can see here, PC1 can explain 30% of the data variance and can perform a fair job in discriminating the samples with low, medium, and high thermal loads. The feature selection using a PCA method resulted in the loading matrix shown in this table. The absolute values for each feature is shown here, and the PCA results confirm that among all the properties of materials that we uh, considered in this study, the four parameters, including density, thermal conductivity, specific heat capacity, and thickness, are the most critical features in terms of building thermal behavior and uh, thermal energy consumption. This result uh, actually matches quite well with the assumptions of most of the building energy simulation tools. In the plots shown on the right, the samples are divided. Say the first and last name of the person or the name of the department. Uh, in the plots on the right, the samples are divided into three groups based on their corresponding simulation outputs. The simulation output points are categorized with high labels. Uh, shown with the red color, if the energy consumption result is equal or more than 90 kilowatt hour per uh, meter square, and low label if the energy result is equal or less than 75, and the data is labeled with medium or green if uh, it's between 75 and 90. And uh, in the second step, uh, we use the, uh, the second method of feature selection. Uh, which was exhaustive feature selection, EFS. And this figure shows the accuracy of the LDA classifier 
uh, undertake a, a training deficit using this uh, method. As this figure shows, if selecting only one parameter, the key input parameter would be specific key capacity um, here with the highest accuracy. And then for the combinations of two features, uh, it would be conducted with the specific key capacity. For the combination of three features, it would be conducted with the specific key capacity and density. And for the four combina uh, combination of four uh, parameters, it would be conducted with the specific key capacity, density, and thermal absorbance. Uh, well, we tested uh, on the test data as well, and the test result confirmed that the four selected features by the PCA method it has a better model accuracy on the training and the test data compared to the uh, exhaustive feature selection method. And uh, we think that feature research is recommended to study other machine learning classification and feature selection methods in this field um, and uh, to, to uh, identify the differences and benefits of each method. Also, since other design input variables, including the climate and mechanical systems, are known as key parameters affecting the building performance. Further research is also recommended to study the applications of machine learning methods in different climatic zones, considering different HVAC systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very, <coughs> very much, Fatimi. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having problems with my voice today. <laughs> uh, uh, next, I would like to introduce um, uh, Tagrit uh, Al Tamimi. Uh, to present the paper cell deaths models with beam integration for airborne transmissions of COVID-19 indoors, uh, written by Tagrid uh, Altamimi, Hoda Khalil, Vinu Rashus, Ryan Carrier, and Gabriel Weiner. We can see your screen. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tagreed, and today I'm going to present CELDEVS models uh, with, PIM, uh, with BIM integration. Um, sorry. Yeah, with BIM integration for airborne transmission COVID-19 indoors. So let's start with uh, discussing the motivation of this paper. And the first one is uh, airborne transmission in indoor places it plays a role in infection spread and it's still an open problem. In fact, it has been shown that one of the main sources of the disease is uh, airborne transmission. It plays a crucial role in the spreading of COVID-19, particularly in poorly ventilated spaces. The next motivation, modeling and simulation uh, provide um, a feasible way uh, for studying infection spread in variable indoor configurations in a risk-free uh, environment. And um, modeling and simulation is a good alternative to actual physical experimentation since they are not feasible due to the lack of information on nature of COVID-19, as well as the risks and ethical issues related to studying the biological aspects of the disease in uh, real settings. Uh, the objectives of uh, this paper, the first one is to understand airborne transmission behavior in indoor places to uh, estimate infection uh, risk. And in order to do that, we consider different parameters such as respiratory activity, the number of emitted particles, ventilation and indoor uh, place dimension. The um, uh, second objective is simulating and visualizing airborne transmission to help decision makers uh, and designers prevent infection by improving the indoor uh, environment's uh, equality. So in this paper, uh, we uh, present the prototyping applications using integration of cellular uh, discrete event specifications uh, formal models and building information uh, modeling. Uh, we also present indoor models that provide a practical representation of different indoor uh, conditions and consider different configuration parameters to facilitate 
studying and understanding airborne transmission in indoor environment. The first indoor model we present is uh, the viral particle model, which predicts the infection in indoor place based on different parameters. The second one is CO2 model, which uses CO2 concentration as a proxy of infection in indoor place. We also show the application of the VB model in outbreak scenario of uh, uh, the effects of air conditioning in a uh, restaurant in, a restaurant in uh, China. So uh, this slide uh, describes a workflow for extracting BIM data and visualizing the simulation results under a common uh, platform. As we see in the figure, the workflow using uh, Autodesk uh, uh, Forge, a web service API that allows access to BIM 360, a repository of BIM models. The workflow shows how to integrate the different tools allowing designers to explore models for different buildings. The Revit models are accessed from uh, BIM uh, 360. When the user selects the simulation uh, model type to run, like CO2 diffusion or viral particles spread, the BIM data integrated with the div scenario is extracted to a JSON file and it's automatically downloaded from uh, the Forge viewer. The Cadmium uh, simulator is run using the JSON file as an input, and the uh, simulation results uh, are integrated back into the BIM for data uh, visualization. Um, in this slide, we present the simulation results for CO2 diffusion model. Um, in both scenarios, the concentration of CO2 was uh, 700 ppm. The exposure time was 50 minutes. Occupants arrive at different rates. Occupants, the number of occupants uh, are 25 uh, persons. Uh, in the first scenario uh, here, uh, the airflow direction is from uh, south uh, to north. The simulation results uh, show seven occupants at a higher risk of getting infected. All those occupants are clustered and um, on the upper third portion, north of the floor plan of the room. Uh, in the second scenario, CO2 concentration is diffused uh, equally among all neighboring cell, uh, cells to mimic a uniform, uh, distribu uh, a uniform air distribution uh, room. And uh, as we see here uh, in this slide, the VP model uh, represents a closed indoor area with one uh, in, uh, asymptomatic infected uh, person shown in uh, red color. Uh, in the beginning, the area has zero infectious particles. Then uh, the infected person starts breathing and emits uh, particles. Uh, the figures here uh, show the restaurant floor plan. Uh, in the left, uh, in this scenario, in the left side, uh, the vent uh, located in the south is turned on, uh, prompting 80% of, uh, of the particles to, um, to follow the AC airflow. As a result, three susceptible, uh, three susceptible uh, persons who shared the index case, the same table became infected. The table is located in the airflow uh, zone. In this scenario, uh, uh, the particles are distributed evenly between the total number of neighboring cells in all direction, and there is a uniform uh, airflow. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so as we see in this video, we designed uh, BIM model of the restaurant using Autodesk Revit uh, based on the dimension and interior details provided in the floor, in the floor plan of the restaurant. Uh, the simulation results presented in the previous slides are generated based on uh, different uh, model variation to study the effect of airflow on viral particles spread, which cause the infection. Uh, the simulation results are read in the BIM model and visualize the data in the Autodesk uh, Forge API. As um, we see in the video, the red color uh, gradients represent the viral 
erosal particle concentration. The model represents uh, three conditions, infected in red color, uh, exposed in brown color, and susceptible individual uh, in uh, a cream color. And the last slides um, uh, conclude the paper and show a direction for future work. So in the future, we consider to reproduce the model in 3D version, consider uh, other airflow properties and other uh, factors. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, next, I, I invite uh, Fatami Sasavari uh, to present the paper, a probability-based model for building energy performance analysis, a Monte Carlo approach, uh, written by Fatami Sajavari and Rasul Kusha. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, well, in this paper, uh, we proposed a framework to implement a uh, probabilistic method in uh, the field of building thermal energy consumption analysis, considering maximum deviation from comfort temperature as a design constraint. Uh, this framework integrates a building design process with Monte Carlo uncertainty analysis and variance-based sensitivity analysis. The probabilistic results are compared at the end with the deterministic results obtained from a conventional method of uh, design. The proposed, excuse me, the proposed framework is divided into three main uh, phases of input collection, simulation, and output analysis shown in the figure on the left. The probabilistic energy analysis process begins with collecting the mean and standard deviation values for each input parameter, then a random set of values from the normal distributions corresponding to each input parameter is selected to run the energy simulations. The simulation outputs are collected and presented uh, with histograms and frequency curves as the uncertainty analysis result. And next, the sensitivity analysis process is done to identify uh, the significance of each input parameter. Uh, and in this study, the sources of uncertainty uh, were divided into four groups of physical parameters, mechanical parameters, scenario parameters, and uh, external factors or weather changes. This analysis tool um, used Excel visual interface because it is a simple and well-known environment. It does not require extensive training and because of the access to various, uh, various uh, post-processing tools. We also use the Fortran-based calculation engine for the calculation part because it is fast and capable of heavy computations. It's suitable for Monte Carlo analysis and link, links to Excel uh, GUI um, on the background for the research. This research studies uh, the effect of weather data heat exchange through building envelope, internal heat gain sources, and specifications of a GVC system. The analysis performs an RC model to derive a multi-input and multi-output model for a building in a state space form. This architectural model for the test case of our paper was a five-room building in College Station, Texas, with a total area of nearly two meters square. The simulation output of this model uh, was building annual thermal energy consumption. Um, and the properties of building materials were the only design variables with uncertainties in our study. Other design variables, including the raising the value, internal heat gains, ventilation and infiltration rates, and building operation schedules uh, were assumed to be fixed. This figure uh, shows the frequency distribution histogram and normal uh, probability plot of the predicted building thermal energy consumption. The predicted uh, result shows an extensive range of variations with a minimum of 10 kilowatt hour per meter square and a maximum of 43. The mean value of the result is 22.8 and the 
first standard deviation was 4.1. Uh, a deterministic simulation uh, of the building energy consumption uh, using only mean values for input variables showed a deterministic output uh, of 20.4 kilowatt hour per square meter. This figure shows uh, frequency histograms and normal probability plot for the predicted maximum deviation from comfort temperature, uh, which is an important factor in building thermal comfort analysis. And uh, the comfort temperature was set to 21 um, degrees centigrade in this study, and negative or positive uh, value in this graph shows that indoor air temperature is below or above the comfort temperature. Uh, the predicted um, deviation from comfort temperature shows a range from minus 8 to 2 degrees centigrade with a mean value of minus 2.4, and the uh, first uh, standard deviation of 1.8. And the deterministic result uh, showed us the maximum deviation from comfort temperature of minus 2.1. The sensitivity analysis result uh, shows that uncertainties of mechanical parameters have the highest influence on building energy consumption, followed by the weather data, physical parameters, and scenario parameters. For the maximum deviation from comfort temperature, Mechanical parameters are by far the most effective variable uh, to keep the indoor air temperature fixed at the set point. And then physical parameters are the next important parameter, weather changes and scenario parameters have the least contributions uh, over the changes of deviation from comfort temperature. The figure on the right uh, makes a more detailed comparison of the input parameters except for the weather data affecting uh, both the thermal energy consumption and the maximum deviation of temperature. Well, this research developed a new framework for a probabilistic analysis of building thermal energy consumption while considering maximum deviation from comfort temperature as a design constraint. The uncertainty analysis result uh, showed that the mean probabilistic results are different from the deterministic results in both cases. Uh, this may be the result of including the uncertainties and the effect of nonlinear nature of equations in the building energy calculations. This study shows that probabilistic methods versus deterministic methods can provide designers with important information about building input parameters and predictive performance of the building. Future research uh, is recommended to expand this framework to other aspects of building performance analysis, including daylight availability, cooler air control, indoor air quality, and etc. For um, also the application of uh, probabilistic methods in design optimization and decision making um, requires uh, further research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fatemi. Uh, and next, I would like to invite uh, Matthew Schwartz uh, to present a paper, Adding Visibility to Visibility Graphs, Weighting Visibility Analysis with Attenuation Coefficients. Hey, uh, thank written you. Written by Matthew Schwartz, Margarita Vinikov, and John Federici. Yes, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about adding visibility to the visibility graph. Uh, I'm Matthew Schwartz, an assistant professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, sorry. So this group or uh, this paper is written by this group of myself, uh, Dr. Vinikov and Dr. Federici. Uh, Margarita Vinikov is from informatics. I'm from the design school and John Federici is from the uh, physics department. It was a really interesting uh, collaboration here where uh, Dr. Federici was working on physics and lasers and understanding um, how attenuation works in different types of uh, weather conditions. And Dr. Vinikov works a lot in um, computation, simulating of environments, and um, how we can understand human perception. So it's a quite good um, paper that we worked on for this conference about Humans Plus. And with that, I'll give a little bit of background in what we're trying to do and why this small study fits into this larger goal. So since two, uh, 2018, this was Simod paper that we worked on for reachability analysis and fall analysis. Um, and Matt, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your, your screen is not sharing with us. 
Well, that's a good thing. Thanks for letting me know. How's that? Yeah, it's starting to share. Thank you. All right, thanks. Looks good. All right. You would think I could figure this out, right? So this is the three of us, um, Vinikov, Schwartz, and Federici, talking about informatics, design, and physics. Um, so the introduction and prior work, this was the reachability analysis that we did in 2018 and the fall score analysis um, in that same paper. And the aim here is to be able to use an intersection of graph analytics where we can look at accessibility and then from these graph points, also analyze things like visibility, uh, accessibility, falling, reachability, uh, et cetera. So last year, we also were looking at accessibility in terms of jogging and evaluating the comfort level for people in different urban environments. That included things like glare metrics and shade metrics along jogging paths. What we found was things like the road and the sidewalk had a quite significant impact on whether the metrics said it was comfortable or uncomfortable. So to expand on this, we thought, well, the sun is in your eyes, you're in the shade, et cetera, but what is another way we can use the graph instead of just the node? And almost the most common way or the most uh, uh, prevalent way is space syntax and this idea of a visibility graph or networking or connectivity. So when we looked more into visibility graph, we questioned what is visibility? And this is a screenshot from like weather.com. So if you've ever seen that something says there's 0 0.25 miles of visibility, we're wondering where does this number come from? How can we use this in terms of urban design, urban analysis to define something as uh, visible or not? So as a little bit of a background, that term is basically telling you whether a black object on a white background at 2% contrast ratio is visible or not. So we have a black object that the contrast is reduced down to 2% of the background. Now we say it's not visible. So this red line says everything on the left side is not visible. Everything on the right side is visible. Um, maybe on the internet, it's even harder to see with uh, video compression, but there are little boxes inside of other boxes there. Um, and at some point they move this to 5%. They said, well, okay, everything that is 5% uh, or more is visible and 5% or less is not visible. With this, we'll talk a little bit about human vision. Um, to give you the context, what this visibility is talking about is basically a contrast sensitivity of human vision. So we've mostly been accustomed to the chart on the left, which is visual acuity, this ability to see the fine details or the refinement of an object. And on the right, we have this contrast sensitivity. So as we reduce or increase contrast, we define it as the ability to see the object or not. Um, in terms of humans, this is important. It changes throughout our uh, life time. So as we're uh, younger or older, our ability to recognize spatial frequency and the contrast diminishes. If you aren't familiar with the visibility graph concept, uh, very quickly, it's basically this uh, idea that you have a bunch of nodes in the environment. And if you connect all of these nodes or locations, that's the graph aspect of it. So all of these green lines are directly visible. This black bar in the center says that it's an obstacle. It, it blocks the visibility, so it's not visible. So this is the context of saying, well, it's not really a visibility graph in terms of human perce perception, it's just whether there's a line of sight. Um, conceptually, this is kind of like if you had an overcast day and you were standing on the building and you look up at the sky, you basically just see white, right? There's nothing there. And if you had a really foggy environment or uh, low visibility on the right side, we see someone looking across the street would basically see a white wall. So this is essentially the same thing, whether you're looking at the sky or looking at the wall. So if you're going to do a urban analysis metric, we have to question whether or not the visibility graph is really a good uh, measure of being able to uh, communicate or relay that in data. So the point here would be that on the left side is a full connected visibility graph on the right side the green line going up vertically and the green line going all the way to the right, these basically have the same score. It's an edge connection of one unit. So if we were to just give that 2% or 5% number, we would end up cutting out certain nodes and leaving all of the other nodes um, connected. So that would be on the left. Our proposal was, what if we could score the edges 
of these connections in some other way, in a way that, that made more sense. So to go back on the top left, this is this idea of what visibility is. That comes from this 3.912 over uh, sigma. This is the attenuation coefficient. So this is saying we know that it's 2% contrast ratio. And because of that, any distance that you have, you divide it by the 3.912, um, this is going to be the visible distance. Um, instead, on the right side, we have CR, this contrast ratio, which is, which is an exponential function of um, the attenuation coefficient and the distance that you're at. So our point here is you take in this model, you can calculate the visibility graph, which is uh, commonly and already done, but we do one more processing step, which is to now add a um, weather function that ca calculates the attenuation coefficient for that weather condition in the urban environment and reweight the edge. And that's when we get this um, kind of uh, distance-based graph. So as a kind of easy overview on the top row, we have what would be considered a clear environment. And we're doing a visibility graph from the bottom left node or, or connection. So everything is this yellow, yellow color. It's because it's basically just summing up or adding the edges of the number of connections that we have. And if we apply a, a rain uh, coefficient or a heavy fog coefficient, we can see that it um, very obviously has an impact on the visibility. And I think as a note, these are 50 by 50 meter uh, grids. So just as a quick study or whether this mattered at all, um, we looked at a generated city and city engine. It's just a, a fake city. It's not um, from GIS data. It's based on this uh, hexagonal grid. We then explored a bunch of different areas. So there's these different intersections of this visibility graph that are saying how visible are different locations. And we can consider this for wayfinding. Um, we can consider it for signage placement, for um, other types of aspects that people are, are curious. Do we know if we can identify a building or a person or safety? Um, so we're gonna zoom in on just one corner of this, P1, P2, and P3. Um, and this is basically P1, P2, P3, where these red dots are, is this location that we set from this location, what's the uh, visibility to all of the other nodes. Uh, the numbers below them on the left side, the 3642, uh, is basically saying that this is the sum of edges that it was able to see from that location. And then when we add a, um, I think this was fog, when we add a fog location, we get 709, right? And this is just a edge connection weight of 709, the numbers are, are a little bit independent. What's important is the relevance or the relationship between the numbers. So if you see up P1 was three, uh, 3642 is the lowest score. Uh, P3 was originally the highest score, meaning it was the most visible location in the environment. But when you added the issue of uh, distance and whether um, as an attenuation coefficient, it actually became lower in the score. P3 was lower scored than P1. Um, so the idea here was that just because something um, through a visibility graph was visible to all of these other locations, it doesn't necessarily mean that it actually is visible in a weather um, or extreme weather, or adverse weather condition like fog, rain, or snow. Uh, so some of the future work and you know the biggest problems with our work now is that it actually just works on uh, attenuation coefficients. So we do the physics simulation of what that weather should be, but we don't include lighting. Um, so we would want to include lighting into the future of this work. And we would like to understand um, how these measures in other space syntax uh, methods work. So whether we do like a gravity or integration or other types of calculations that aren't um, the, simply the summation of the edge count, um, what this means. And in general, we just uh, yeah, thank our uh, funding sponsors and uh, thanks to some of the students and uh, uh, research associates that have helped with this project. Uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Matthew. Um, I'm, uh, we're having like five minutes left, so I probably cannot ask each our participant a specific question. But when I went through the papers, I think a common ground was uh, finding uh, the best features to represent the data and then uh, finding also uh, the or creating the necessity to create enough data 
for uh, for the individual research. So probably some of you might answer this question. Probably um, may I ask Fatami about how, how you are were uh, finding the per most pertinent features for your research on uh, uh, the building and energy analysis. If you unmute yourself. Yes, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I was lost in uh, multiple screens here. Uh, well, um, first of all, let me ask you, are you, uh, is this question related to the second paper, the probability? Uh, I, I was referring to the first presentation of yours, the uh, uh, classification of feature selection in building energy simulation. Gotcha. Well, we just uh, used the two very simple methods and we tried to make a case uh, to compare these methods of feature selection to see which one is uh, giving us more uh, accurate results with, with higher accuracy number also. We wanted to, to test it with a very uh, obvious case with like uh, which features are more important in uh, thermal energy consumption. We already know the, the answer for that, but we wanted to see how the results are matching uh, with our assumptions. And uh, that was uh, that was the main reason that we chose uh, this kind of uh, test case. And then uh, we um, ran the simulations and we calculated the um, accuracy levels using each method. And then the higher accuracy level, uh, we concluded that uh, is giving us a better result. All right. Thank you. Uh, and for um... Probably I can uh, open this question to all participants, uh, data generation uh, versus existing databases. Uh, so is there uh, some, some of the problems you had to overcome individually? And is there uh, probably, uh, uh, I think it was also in the talk about uh, the, the key, uh, key talk about uh, from Apalinanda was about collaboration and uh, I think, there are so many institutions now generating three-dimensional data, architects generating data all the time. But for every uh, for every paper that I read, almost all had to uh, generate their own data sets and databases. So do you see any of these, uh, how, how we could solve any of these problems or overcome some of those problems? Probably Professor Weiner. Gabriel, are you there? Okay. <laughs> so uh, yes, my internet connection is pretty bad now. Uh, <laughs> so can you can you go again, please? Yeah, the question was. Let me see uh, if I move somewhere else. The question was that a lot yeah. of uh, machine learning uh, models need uh, a huge data sets. So uh, the question is uh, uh, that, that the problem is for all these research is that it takes quite a long time to come to results because you have to create your own data sets, label them. And if it's not, if it's not unsupervised learning, then you have to label the data. And uh, so, uh, and that takes a long time for researchers. So the question is, is are there any ambitions to, to uh, connect and collect uh, data and, and start to have databases where we all have access towards? Hmm. Um, so yeah, this, um, so this has a very little relation to what we do, right? Uh, but uh, in the in in the paper that Hoda presented, for instance, uh, we counted with uh, some information given by the university physical plant for the rooms 
where Hoda was conducting the, the tests. Um, and we use those for validation. Uh, there is some data coll collection that's, that the university uh, can provide us. Uh, data is pretty scarce. We don't do machine learning. Um, and I don't think we will in the near future. We do modeling and simulation. So um, um, yes, um, machine learning is fashionable. We want to have control of what we put in the models. Um, so in terms of data sets, yes, it's extremely complicated to get data sets in any fields. Uh, we have a big project with Ericsson um, in, in a non-related field that we use to, to bridge with, with architecture. Uh, we, we, um, we were trying to use uh, information on the uh, data transmitted by mobile phones to the base stations, uh, in particular, now that we have Pico cells installed in buildings, um, to try to improve the quality of detection of individuals in buildings to better compute occupancy, right? Um, so on one side, we uh, uh, built these models. I think we presented those in, in CMOD last year. Uh, and, uh, and that seems to be working pretty well, but again, there is no uh, detailed data. Not even Ericsson can give us the data that they have, uh, sometimes it's proprietary. So, um, so one of the major problems with any machine learning solution is that you're going to be building machine learning models and they don't match reality because you don't have the, uh, uh, the right data. So yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a major problem. Mm -hmm. So in brief, we don't do machine learning. We're not planning to do much about it soon. Uh, we have some data, we use that for validation. And uh, yes, uh, but but it's seasonal and you have to clean it up. Um, anyways, I hope that that answered your question. Thank you. All right, David. Uh, uh, do we have- uh, I was gonna relinquish uh, to, to Azam because I suspect he's gonna follow on from Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Um. Not directly. I had a question for Matt about uh, <laughs> the lighting. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and and uh, a question about um, how difficult is that? How, especially compared to, to what you've done already with the weather? Yeah, it's definitely um, more difficult, right? Uh, so currently there's this like free space optics aspect that the physics um, area or collaborators work on, which is like, you wanna send something to space and you wanna have a link so you can go through the um, atmosphere. And it's a little bit different in terms of a city where you have tons of lights on buildings and they're all coming from different directions because we're talking about um, scattering and absorption through a medium and not necessarily other impacts that happen. So it's a little bit easier to calculate um, based off of distance and the weather condition, like currently we are integrating over the different uh, fog size particles so we can uh, replicate it and we're using the models that, that they've uh, built out. Um, if we were to start putting light posts inside of the environment, um, I guess we can, there might be a way to do it, but it, it does significantly make it more complicated, at least for a human perception uh, side. And a lot of the other work is, is a lot more based on um, lasers and um, basically the point of lasers like frequencies that are not really what we're looking at. Um, in, in our study is specific at like 550 nanometers because that's kind of the middle of our, our range as opposed to like, uh, yeah, infrared, far infrared stuff, yeah. Right, right, okay, thank you. I, I had a follow on question for for Matt as well, Sandra, if that's okay. Of course, please. So, so Matt, um, my question's uh, less technical, I think, but given the uh, improvement that you're providing, I mean, other than signage and wayfinding, um, like what are the what are the uh, the assumptions about how that will change the way people are designing uh, urban environments? 
I mean, if it's it's not just the wayfinding, it's like any object, right? So if we're talking about having access to green space um, and you can't see the green space, then what's the point of it? Uh, so for me, it's a little bit more of um, considering that there are maybe dust storms or uh, frequent heavy snowing or fogging um, that happen, and they're not the most common, right? But I would I would argue we don't make buildings fire retardant uh, just because it's you know what happens when there is a extreme case, and so uh, there are locations where the heavy fog can cause a problem, and you don't want people to um, be in the worst when they're also the most vulnerable. Um, but yeah, I would say there's it that. There's a lot also of sense. design of the building. If you want your building to be seen and you can't see, if you're in New York, right, you have these skyscrapers and there's usually fog, you can't see the top of it. Um, what's the point of designing the top if you can't see it? I don't know. Thanks, man. It's probably a better answer than that, but yeah. All right. Uh, I think we are, uh, we are precisely at 4 p.m. Uh, I would like to uh, conclude the uh, Sandra, we have a little bit of float, and there is a, another question from uh, Philip. Ah, all right. Okay, Philip, uh, can you unmute oh. yourself? Yeah, hi there. Sorry, I'm just uh, in the next session. I was just uh, raising my hand to get in queue. Uh, okay. But very interesting. All right. <laughs> Sandra, back to you. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> so uh, we have a, a bit more time then uh, probably I would like to ask Alicia Namat Vasquez uh, about um, simulation versus uh, production. Uh, your, uh, your, your, uh, your paper is called uh, Unit Shaped Web Networks as Simulation Tools in Form Finding Processes. Uh, is there something, uh, so you, now you have trained the algorithm. Are there also some examples where you have some uh, how he I would use those examples now as uh, to to project new deformations. Oh, hi, Sandra. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, so so we are now like what we're trying to use it now is to kind of because we know that the simulation is like a very time intensive uh, and computationally kind of expensive process to really kind of find the correct parameters. So what we are trying to do is try to see if we can somehow, uh, if we can use a trained model to kind of find the parameters that, to, to, that could produce that simulation. So in a way you could then be able to kind of have this, uh, like you could use the, the model to, to know how to simulate it rather than having to find how to simulate it to, to, to approximate the fabric. Um, yeah, we have seen some like kind of examples of, of work trying to do, to do that. So, so yeah, so, so that was uh, so that one of the aim of the projects. Like uh, for right now, uh, for now, the model has been kind of successful in predicting predicting the formations, even uh, with new patterns that are kind of unseen to the model, or that are that are just new codes and we just are doing from scratch. So, um, so, so, I, so I mean, so I think it could be like an interesting tool of, of of saving time for designers on our when we are trying to find out how, especially like even for like smoke signals, for example, or these kind of simulations that uh, you maybe you want the pattern that you want to do, but you don't know how to make the pattern. So like kind of uh, have this uh, ability of reverse that uh, through the trained model. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and um, for the uh, airborne transmission of COVID-19 indoors presentation, uh, Tagfried, uh, just a personal interest, did you compare this to any airplanes actually? Uh, the transmission, did you? Uh, sorry, can you repeat this? Yes, agreed. Um, uh, just for a personal, a very personal interest, did you, uh, did you also test it uh, or have you uh, tried to test this uh, system, uh, the model of yours for airplanes? Oh no. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, we, we didn't uh, test it in it for airplane. I know that there are uh, some studies uh, testing uh, airplane and uh, other indoor uh, models. And I think in the future, maybe we can consider that. I, I would be very interested how uh, precise or uh, uh, your models are compared to those studies that have been done already. So that would be probably a good uh, value for you to a threshold. 
yes, we have tested our model in uh, based on uh, uh, like uh, on, on different um, indoor models. I mean, different. Mm -hmm. uh, we consider di different parameters and different uh, configurations, and uh, we applied the model in a real uh, like um, a scenario, which is uh, and the like um, which is the restaurant in uh, China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that was very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. And and to Matthew, Sandra, probably, Sandra, I think yes. we should wrap this one up. Thank All you right. so much. I All appreciate right. your questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Excellent for job. Me. Thank this you so much pleasure. to our authors and our session chair. Absolutely. Uh, go blue. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>
the exposure uh, quantifies the severity of extreme heat and air pollution. S uh, sensitivity reflects demographics and pre-existing health condition. And uh, uh, so, so uh, these could increase the risk of developing uh, worse outcomes under uh, similar heat exposure. And the adaptation uh, indicates the factors that mitigates the heat exposure or sensitivity. Um, this is uh, our uh, web map. So the current map is developed for the city of Fresno in central California at the census tract level. Uh, and we created a view for the three sub indices, uh, the exposure sensitivity and adaptation and an overall heat vulnerability index. And the current view shows the environmental exposure sub-index uh, on the left. And on the right, there's the individual uh, inputs of the exposure category. The map on the left is produced by a weighted average of the input on the right. And the users can adjust the input weights using the text boxes below each individual input maps. And we have a couple of findings. The first one is we found uh, there's a high uh, heat vulnerability in the central and south of Fresno uh, with high environmental uh, exposure sensitivity and low adaptation capacity. This could highlight the importance of addressing the urban heat island effect and also the social inequality in the mitigation of the damages from elevated temperature. Another finding is uh, also, so first of all, this figure is a pairwise uh, correlation uh, uh, table between the input variables. And the darker color shows higher or stronger correlation. And we found that there's a relatively strong correlation between air pollution and social disadvantages, such as uh, low education or worse pre-existing health conditions. We also found some sizable correlations among uh, social disadvantage variables like poverty, uh, low education, uh, and poor pre-existing health condition. Uh, and to quantify the indoor heat exposure, we added a building heat resistance indicator map as an input to the environmental exposure map. Uh, the building heat resistance indicator is quantified uh, by how long it takes a building to reach 30 degrees C after turning off AC in a typical summer day. Due to a large number of buildings in the cities, uh, only a subset of around uh, 4,300 buildings were simulated. And then our regression model is built to uh, extrapolate the simulation results to other buildings in the Fresno uh, city. And the buildings in the center uh, of the city uh, seems also uh, the least res resistant to heat, which means they take shorter time to reach a higher temperature after uh, AC is turned off. Uh, that's pretty much what I have to say. Um, welcome to questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Thank we're you. taking questions in, in the end. Uh, oh, this was okay. Heat Vulnerability Index Development and Mapping with Eugene Shu. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we will do uh, a, a collective Q&A in the end, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, uh, okay. that's uh, order of thing. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, let's hear the next uh, presenter, Erin. Erin. Uh, Heidelberg, uh, Heidelberger, sorry, uh, I, I chopped off uh, part of your name, I'm, I'm apologies for that. Uh, no Underrepresentation <laughs> under representation challenges in urban building energy modeling and overview and case study. Uh, thank you, and uh, all yours. Can you see my screen? We can see very clearly. Perfect, so then I'll go ahead and get started. Hello everybody, my name is Erin Heidelberger and today I'll be presenting work titled Underrepresentation Challenges in Urban Building Energy Modeling that I completed with Dr. Tara Graca as part of my master's work in the High Performance Building Web at Georgia Tech. I'm gonna start out with some of the background information that motivated this work. Urban building energy modeling is a critical tool to help reduce our energy use across urban areas. It's the practice of simulating the energy use patterns and needs of a grouping of buildings. 
This can be small, so just tens of buildings, all the way up to tens of thousands of buildings encompassing a whole city. And while there are many different types of UBEM models, this research is only looking at bottom-up models. Previous examples of UBEM have shown to be useful in neighborhoods like these pictured here. But what about neighborhoods like these? Are the same models relevant in these contexts? This research uses a case study in the Grove Park neighborhood of Atlanta, Georgia, to demonstrate how socioeconomic and demographic data can influence the results of the study and why it's critical that we consider such factors in our models. It identifies key parameters and urban inequalities that are more sensitive in the context of racial income and resource inequalities. It highlights the needs of addressing demographic and socioeconomic factors in UBEM studies and uses a case study to demonstrate why the lack of representation in UBEM is problematic and must be addressed. With this in mind, we moved into the literature review process. We noticed several common challenges across UBEM studies, one being data availability. Lots of information is required to complete an UBEM, including data on building geometries, constructions, uses, and climate. Some sources of this data include metered data from utility companies, government databases, GIS data, community engagement, and field measurements, but it's still diff difficult to get complete data for an area. And it's particularly difficult to access data in low resource areas. They're less likely to have the information available or to have the resources required to generate and maintain the necessary data. And data collection can be really challenging in these settings. Another big challenge across UBEM is defining accurate archetypes. Archetypes are used to categorize and characterize the buildings within an area of study. Each one represents a grouping of buildings and has information about, and information about the building's usage, constructions, systems, and specific elements of the building form. Archetypes are especially hard to define in the context of low resource neighborhoods because socioeconomic factors can influence occupancy patterns and behaviors, energy use patterns, building constructions, and building systems, meaning the default values that are typically sourced from literature and used as inputs are not relevant in these areas. Now that we have identified the problem, I'm gonna walk through the research methods. The research was conducted in three main phases. It started with defining the area of study, then gathering the data, and finally running the simulations. When defining an area of study, it's important to pay attention to key population demographics, including race, income level, education level, and occupation. It's also important to consider information on the built environment within the area, including building typology, age, construction, and ownership model. The next step was to gather the requisite data for the study. Climate files and building geometry information are relatively less challenging to source than information on the building use and properties. This work compares default assumptions of building properties to assumptions tailored to the neighborhood, which consider the community demographics. And then finally, all of this information was translated into files that feed the selected simulation tool. In this research, the urban modeling interface was used. UMI is a plugin for Rhinoceros 3D that relies on Energy Plus. As mentioned, the Grove Park neighborhood was chosen for the case study. 96% of the neighborhood population is black compared to just 52% across the greater Metro Atlanta area. Over half of the households in this neighborhood have an average income under $25,000 a year, and only 20% of the population holds any form of a college degree. Looking at the built environment, more housing units are rented than owner occupied, and there's a high vacancy rate. More than half of housing units are classified as non-family, Single family detached is the most common housing type and what we focused on in this study. And the majority of these homes were built before 1970, so it's an older building stock. Uh, this map shows the specific study area within Grove Park that was chosen, comprised of 110 single family homes. This specific area was selected because it has buildings in varying conditions. All of the houses were classified to be in either good, fair, or poor condition. These three archetypes, as well as the criteria for inclusion in each of them, were developed based off of the classifications applied to residential parcels in the 2012 Strategic Community Investment Report in Atlanta. Buildings in good condition are well-maintained with no visible defects. Buildings in fair condition have signs of deterioration, but the structural integrity is not compromised. And buildings in poor condition are not well-maintained and show significant signs of deterioration, including cracks in the windows. After classifying the buildings into these three categories, the archetypes were defined specific to this study and then compared against a default residential archetype that comes pre-downloaded with UMI. 
The inputs for these archetypes were primarily based off of assumptions in the literature, but with the community demographics in mind. And while these are typically more inaccurate and underrepresented neighborhoods, they were the most readily available at the time of the research. Um, also at the time of the study, no metered data was available. So all of the results here are representational only. Uh, overall, the default archetype has a neighborhood EUI of 95.9 kilowatt hours per meter squared, as compared to a neighborhood EUI of 143.2 kilowatt hours per meter squared using the adjusted archetypes. There was an increase across all major end uses except for heating, which showed a slight decrease in energy use. And then looking at a comparison of the simulation results using current weather data to predicted future weather data for the year 2080, using the adjusted archetypes, we can see an increase in the neighborhood EUI from 143.2 kilowatt hours per meter squared to 151.4 kilowatt hours per meter squared. And this is primarily occurring in the cooling end use. Uh, this increase is concerning because of the risk of overheating, which is already an increased risk in low income areas which experience increased frequency of heat stress events. UVM studies can be a really powerful tool to plan for equitable and inclusive climate mitigation strategies, but this is only if we're basing them off of accurate models to begin with. So this initial review and case study draws attention to the need to address socioeconomic data when completing UVM studies, but it's still limited. Without metered data, the models cannot be calibrated and the results cannot be validated, like I mentioned earlier. Furthermore, the default archetype that we use as a point of comparison in this study was designed for Boston, not Atlanta, since this was the only readily available archetype at this time of the study. The work would definitely benefit from an archetype tailored to the climate zone. Moving forward, the work will continue to be developed by looking at probabilistic archetype inputs or a range of values rather than one fixed value to more accurately reflect the diversity of the built environment. It's also very important to get access to data specific to the neighborhood to increase the accuracy of the model. But overall, this is a very important topic that we need to continue to address as we develop more sophisticated UBET models. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... Great presentation. Um, so we go directly to the next one. Questions will come in the end, so prepare them. I have some already in the chat. So next presenter should be Kaivin Chen. Uh, hello. And you're presenting us the CV-based registration of UAV-captured facade inspection images to 3D, 3D building point cloud models, right? Yes. So it's yours. Okay. Save the good questions for the end. I see Tarek here as well. Hi, Tarek. Hello. Can you see my screen? You can see clearly your screen. Uh, okay. Now we see your background. Okay. That's so I'm sharing two. it. Now. Yes. All right. Okay, perfect. Now it's, it's all there. Okay. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Kai Wen Chin. I'm a postdoc uh, from High Performance Building Lab at Georgia Tech. And this paper is uh, collaborated with uh, Dr. Tara Kraka. And it is about uh, using computer vision based registration of uh, UAV captured facade inspection images to 3D building point cloud models. Um, so we all know that buildings require periodic inspection and maintenance. And this is because buildings, especially their facade or embedded systems deteriorate all the time. And it can cause uh, fallen debris, uh, which threaten public safety. And it can also have severe cracks or corrosion uh, anomalies or defects, which may threaten the structure's stability. And it can also uh, create uh, some moisture issues or some other thermal related anomalies causing additional heat loss and energy consumptions and costs for paying this additional uh, heat, lo heat load. So uh, we all know that uh, buildings will require uh, 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 theoretical inspections. So in traditional ways, uh, people generally hire some experts or maintainers to uh, get close up access to the building facade systems, uh, either through man lifts, aerial platforms, uh, scaffolding, or even a rope. And this is quite 
time consuming and labor intensive, and it can also bring us a lot of safety concerns. And luckily nowadays we have uh, introduced the application of drone technologies. And there is a growing trend of deploying a small payload drone and camera equipped drone system, uh, equipped system to capture large amounts of uh, close up images uh, as a substitution of the close up manual inspection process. So this is an experiment that we are doing to collect images for a two story high uh, building uh, to uh, get the imagery data for inspection purposes. Um, we know that uh, with the application of drones, we could collect large amounts of images and reports have uh, uh, indicated that more than 500 still high resolution images can, can be collect collected within a short hour. And typically for a inspection of a single building, uh, around a thousand of images can be uh, need to be uh, cap captured for inspection purposes. Um, this brings us a question that we can detect use these high resolution images to detect lots of uh, anomalies like defects, like cracks and corrosions. Um, but however, using the 2D imagery data info, uh, information alone cannot uh, give us, provide us all the necessary information. For example, we don't know where these 2D defects locate on the building, and we don't know the exact size of this 2D anomalies. So there is a need to figure out how to register or map these 2D anomalies into the 3D building model um, to uh, give us uh, to allow us to do the measurement and localization of the anomalies and do some evaluation of the facade conditions and even about the uh, documentation of all those, all this inf inspection information. So here in our uh, paper, we have developed a method, computational method using computer vision uh, algorithms to automate the registration of these 2D images. So in the first step, uh, we collect uh, images around a building by flying a drone to, uh, to re reconstruct or generate a 3D building model using photogrammetry techniques. And in the second step, we capture a high resolution uh, facade reference image as the base map for registration uh, for reference only. And in this step, we also uh, got compute or develop the uh, coordinate system transformation between 3D building model and 2D reference image system or coordinate system. And then in the third step, we use a drone to fly in a close uh, distance to the facade surface to capture those close range facade images um, to uh, get this image data and then um, use computer vision image matching and transformation techniques to register these image data into the reference base map uh, in the second step. So uh, we can see that uh, the streamlined workflow of, reg of this registration pr process is to use the close range facade images registered to a uh, facade reference image at the registered in the base map as a best base map, and then uh, register together with the base map into the 3D building model. So, so this is, here comes our result. Um, uh, this, in the left side uh, indicates the transformation between 2D uh, images, close range images and reference image and their registration frame to the 3D building model. And the left side, uh, the right side, sorry, the right side images indicates how an anomaly or these uh, segmentation areas can be registered to the photogrammetry model or point building point clouds. And it, these anomalies can be further registered to a CAT model to have better visualization, more cleaner expression or visualization purposes. So uh, for the contribution of this uh, proposed computational mag uh, algorithms, it can uh, it allows us to automatically locate the 2D uh, 
John captured images or anomalies to a 3D photogrammetry for building model. And it can address the scaling and measurement of anomalies. And it can give, and give us locational information to help us evaluate and document the facade conditions. And the major limitation of this first proposed method is that it can have, um, it cannot work for irregular shape or it might bring us um, some, some type of um, uh, error issues, spatial errors for uh, those uh, uh, irregular shaped uh, buildings like curved facades or including those pr uh, protruding elements. So uh, another limitation is that uh, for those buildings with severe tree obstructions, uh, it can it might not work well for flying a drone to capture those uh, useful data for facade inspection purposes. Um, so for the future work, our uh, man, uh, uh, well, our main direction is to integrate the infrared thermal anomaly registration into this registration workflow. And it will allow us to um, identify the location and the size of the thermal anomalies like thermal bridges and uh, infiltration and exfiltrations. And another direction is to integrate any machine learning based anomaly segmentation or detection algorithms for 2D images. Uh, into the registration for workflow. So that imagine that someday in the future, we set out a set of drone to fly outside and it can automatically detect the cracks or anomalies, other types of anomalies. And then the inspectors or maintainers workers can uh, only sit in front, of the, in front of their desktop and identify the location and uh, sizes of these detected anomalies. Um, this is um, my presentation. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for the presentation. A really interesting, really interesting uh, project, I'd say. Uh, I have a few questions, but I'm, I'm going to wait until the session. So please uh, stop sharing your 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 uh, screen, so we can go to the last. Thank you all for keeping the time. By the way, it's, this is really you know making my job very very easy. Uh, for the next um, the next presentation, I would like to invite uh, Brady uh, Brady Peters. Uh, to is, he, is Brady here? Yes, okay. you're here. Yeah, I, I will be uh, speaking for our team. Uh, I'm Phil Kopp, Brady Peters. Uh, ah, okay. Supervisor. Um, so yeah. Um, so okay. yeah, resonators, uh, modeling and simulation of Helmholtz resonators for broadband sound absorption. I was uh, I was hoping to see Brady. Haven't seen him in, in years, but then uh, say hi for me. <laughs> He's actually here, looking so, for um, yeah. Ah, okay. Hi, Brady. Then. <laughs> And hey, Angelos. as well. Hey, it's been a long time. So we're all here. Sorry, uh, personal note there. All right. So um, hello, everyone. Um, I would like to introduce you to our research on the modeling and simulation of uh, Helmholtz resonators for broadband sound absorption. My name is Philip Kopp. Uh, the members in our team are researcher John Union and our supervisor, Dr. Brady Peters. Um, we are from the University of Toronto at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. So Helmholtz resonators are one of the oldest concepts in architectural acoustics. Um, their acoustic properties have been reported since ancient antiquity. It has been written that the Greeks used them in their theaters and resonating basins were included in the walls of churches in an attempt to improve acoustic performance. More recently, the properties of uh, Helmholtz resonators are being explored in the emerging field of acoustic metamaterials. They have been shown to be beneficial in a variety of contexts, including architectural acoustics. So metamaterials are artificially uh, created materials that gain their acoustic effects from their geometry. So here, uh, resonators are inserted in slotted panels to tune the, re the reflection behavior to imitate the diffuse reflected field of a shorter diffuser. And by tuning the inserted um, resonators, the assembly can also be adjusted to absorb or reflect sound. Schroeder diffusers are widely used in architectural acoustics, therefore including a metamaterial-based, tunable, and more efficient variant would be highly beneficial. So we developed a uh, computational tool to generate Helmholtz resonator geometry for specific resonant frequencies. And then we digitally simulated the acoustic absorption performance using the COMSOL multiphysics simulation engine. The Helmholtz resonator works on the principle of an air spring, where the air in the neck oscillates on the elastic cushion formed by the volume of air within the resonator. 
Together, they form an oscillating system with a specific resonant frequency. In the design of uh, a Helmholtz resonator, the neck length, the neck width, and the volume are the parameters that de determine the resonant frequency. The Helmholtz equation relates all these geometric parameters and estimates the resonant frequency. So in acoustic simulation, there are two approaches. The first one is a ray tracing based simulation where sound is abstracted as a ray, travels in a straight line and is reflected from surfaces and is computed using geometrical methods. The second acoustic simulation technique is wave based simulation. Here the wave equation is solved and approximated numerically. Finite element modeling is one such numerical technique. The finite element modeling software COMSOL Multiphysics version 5.6 was employed to model the acoustic wave interaction with our Helmholtz resonator geometry. So in architectural acoustics practice, the impedance of a material sample is analyzed in the physical impedance tube. Impedance is the resistance to flow of acoustic wave propagation through a medium. Um, an impedance tube consists of a loudspeaker installed on one side of the tube and a material sample is posi positioned on the opposite side of the tube. Multiple microphones record the reflected acoustic, acoustic pressure fields and compare the recordings through the transfer function. The impedance of the sample and thereby the absorption and reflection coefficient can be calculated. So we created a virtual impedance tube within the COMSOL simulation environment to calculate the absorption and reflection coefficient of a 100 millimeter diameter sample. Due to uh, the bilateral symmetry in our resonator models, uh, only a quarter of the sample needed to be modeled and simulated. The setup um, of our resonator cons uh, consisted of the resonators um, inserted on the end of the tube, then follows a region that we simulate with a higher degree of resolution. And then here we uh, simulate a background pressure field to simulate our sound source. And finally, the top portion was simulated as a perfectly matched layer for more accurate results. So this brings us to the results from our simulations. Um, so as air oscillates in the neck of the resonator at, at its resonant frequency, a pressure difference occurs between the inside and the outside of the resonator. The air in the neck of the resonator moves at higher velocities. This results in thermoviscous dampening that occurs near the walls of the neck. Sound energy is dissipated into heat and viscous energy, which results in sound absorption at resonance of the Helmholtz resonator. So the resulting absorption uh, at resonance is captured by the console simulation software and here displayed as the absorption coefficient and it's inverse the reflection coefficient from a scale from zero to one, sort of one being the absolute uh, absorption. So we're designing for an urban environment where noise of different frequencies must be considered, especially low frequency wavelengths are not protected against by conventional sound mitigation. And resonators promise to handle these frequencies better. Also in smaller rooms, long reverberation times in the lower frequency domain become a challenge due to room modes and tuned absorption can also be beneficial in helping with that. So we uh, simulated multiple resonators with the same design frequencies and resonators with different resonance based on varying neck width or varying volume. The geometry was computationally generated within a rhinoceros environment with a grasshopper parametric engine. So as a baseline, we uh, established uh, single frequency resonators um, that confirmed our resonance, resonator geometry designs and simulation methods functioned as predicted. We observed near perfect absorption over narrow, narrow frequency range um, at resonance. So a single Helmholtz resonator has a very narrow absorption peak. Therefore, the practical applications for sound absorption are kind of limited. And a broadband multi-frequency resonator is needed to be useful in real world application. So one, uh, one solution to attain broadband absorption is to add multiple resonator, resonators with, which cover a specific broader frequency range. We tested three different intervals for design frequency offsets to analyze their overall broadband absorption qualities. The results indicate that in order to obtain a continuously high absorption coefficient, narrow design frequency intervals are required. We found that 300 Hertz as well as 100 Hertz intervals do not pr produce high continuous sound absorption as, a, as the um, coefficients drop below 0.5 between absorption peaks. So for the 50 Hertz interval, the simulation results show that the absorption coefficient remains above 0.75 over the design frequency range specified. 
As a resonance frequency of, frequencies of each individual resonator is approached, we can see the pressure difference maximized in the resonator and the corresponding absorption peak in the graph. The 50 hertz frequency interval was successful in both the neck width variant and the volume variant with sufficiently high absorption over the design frequency range. The results indicate that a broadband acoustic absorber consisting of Helmholtz resonators is possible. In order to achieve meaningful broadband absorption, however, um, through resonance, many resonators with close performance resonances must be implemented to achieve effective broadband sound absorption. So we envision a broadband sound absorbing wall that consists of individually tuned Helmholtz resonators as seen here. In future work, we will evaluate the use of resonators in the new emerging field of acoustic metamaterials. Understanding the resonant mechanisms on a larger scale as demonstrated here will allow insight into some of the finer tuned and bulk acoustic resonance behaviors in acoustic metamaterials. We have developed resonator geometry that produces effective sound absorption for design frequencies. We have further demonstrated that broadband absorption is attainable through an array of differently tuned Helmholtz resonators and can be implemented in a broadband sound absorbing wall for architectural acoustic application. Thank you. Hello. Hello. I'm sorry, I, my connection keeps dropping. I hope you can hear me now. We can. So, yeah, thank you. Sorry, um, I had an issue, an issue with my connection. So thank you for the presentation, Philip. Uh, questions in the end, as we, as we said. Last but not least, uh, we have Subashini uh, Vinu, I think, uh, if I am not all, also tricked by a different person, like, yeah, I see you here. Yeah, okay, I see you in the presenters. So please, yeah, uh, try to uh, be concise so that we can uh, have a good, good Q&A session in the end. So yeah, cloud-based workflow for the integration of BIM to devs. Nice to see that. Okay, so um, like I'm Vinu and uh, I'm from Advanced Real-Time Simulation Lab at Carleton University. So I'm just going to explain our paper to you all. Oh, okay. And uh, so uh, due to COVID-19 uh, pandemic, right? Uh, designers perception of building performance and occupant well-being has changed. So designers are coming up with various spatial design options to minimize the spread of virus, but the models are purely design oriented, right? They do not uh, consider any uh, scientific models. But if some scientific models are integrated, then it becomes very powerful uh, evaluation. So, um, so, so uh, these models are very complex. For example, uh, if we have to uh, evaluate the viral spread indoors and we have to consider different parameters like um, uh, parameters related to virus, for example, uh, how much viral uh, aerosol concentration does a um, person uh, has to intake to get infected or what happens, how it spreads if they are coughing or sneezing and uh, the other parameters like the age or health conditions, whether they're wearing a mask on or a mask off. Uh, in addition to this, uh, it, it also needs to consider the ventilation design. So uh, like these are all complex. And then uh, like uh, discrete event uh, specification system uh, does complex model as it's hierarchical and modular. So I'm an architect by background and I need access to these models. So my thought process was like, how can we make it easier for the designers to access these models, right? So I don't wanna focus on the uh, programming or underlying concepts, but I wanna focus on design. And on the other hand, you see the dev simulators, right? Once they have uh, different models, they need BIM models to evaluate it. So there's a difficulty on either side. So to access this, uh, we propose like BIM to devs integration using Autodesk Forge. Autodesk Forge is a web-based uh, workflow and uh, it, ha it gives access to various models. Like I don't, uh, like devs modeler doesn't have to have experience 
uh, in using Revit. Like uh, any st stakeholders can access the BIM model that's uploaded to the uh, cloud interface. On the other hand, if we integrate the devs model to the Forge uh, interface, then uh, the architects can access these models as well. So uh, with this, um, uh, this is a user interface. Uh, of the uh, Forge viewer. So you can see there are uh, different um, uh, BIM models uh, that are uploaded to the BIM 360. And uh, as a um, designer, we can access any models. And then uh, we added a devs model to this uh, user interface. Uh, we currently only integrated uh, two devs model. One is like CO2 diffusion model, which Oda ex, uh, explained in the previous uh, session and uh, viral screen modules, which also Thug Reed uh, explained in the previous model, but we also integrated uh, two other parameters with mask on and mask off. And then when you click on the play button, uh, the simulation results uh, can be seen. So how the system works is uh, whatever BIM model that you want to evaluate, you upload it to the BIM 360, and then you can access it uh, through the Forge viewer. And then you select uh, what devs model you want to uh, simulate for. It can be either CO2 diffusion or the viral spread uh, particles. Once you select the models, uh, then uh, the data is extracted from the BIM model. And then uh, we pass it uh, to a JSON file format. So um, once this is done, uh, the simulation is run and we visualize the data back. There's a visual representation of that. So this is a BIM model. And then we used uh, ray casting methods uh, because it allows uh, data extraction for uh, complex shapes. And uh, this is the uh, JSON file format. Uh, once we extract the data, the parser actually combines a devs model and uh, the BIM data uh, for cadmium simulation. So once the simulation is run, uh, we have different outputs depending on the uh, model that we ran. For example, in this, we have time steps, XY coordinates and CO2 concentration. And then we take this data and we integrate it in the Forge Viewer using uh, point clouds. So uh, we actually present two case studies uh, in our paper. One is like CO2 diffusion model integration and viral particle spread model. Um, the data extraction for these uh, models are similar, but the uh, data visualization integration uh, is different. As you can see uh, for uh, CO2 diffusion, you see CO2 concentration, but for viral particle, you have uh, aerosol construction and uh, human conditions. So uh, because COVID is a happening thing, I'm just going to explain our integration with our COVID models. So as you can see, uh, this is a BIM model uh, that we uh, developed in the Revit. So to run a COVID uh, simulation, you need to have certain data. One is the vent locations, uh, the building room sizes, the furniture, because the furniture uh, designs the uh, occupancies like arrival and departure time. And then you have to introduce the infected person. So for this study, we introduced uh, two infected person and the infected persons are uh, stationary. So you can also add other parameters to the infected person, like if they are wearing a mask or not or whether they are coughing or singing. But for this scenario, we just considered a uh, mask off and uh, they are simply breathing uh, in the room. So once the simulation is run, uh, this is the data that we integrated in the BIM model. So um, you can see how it is integrated uh, in the viewer. So you have four kinds of outputs. One is susceptible, right? Any person inside uh, the room who has been with the infected person is susceptible. And then exposed is if they had inhaled certain amount of viral particles and they are exposed, but potentially infected people are when they reach the threshold uh, for infection. So uh, LO is uh, for uh, less uh, viral aerosols and uh, red is for high aerosols. So uh, here is a uh, simulation. So once we got uh, this integrated, we were wondering like how designers can use this for design evaluation or even occupants. Uh, how do they know uh, if an infected person is present in their room and if they're also there, how it's gonna affect them. So um, to do this, uh, we added one more step by adding uh, gamifications uh, to it. And uh, 
we called it as uh, Don't Catch Me If You Can, uh, because we wanted people to uh, learn it through a play way, but also it is serious on another time. For example, a building uh, manager can see uh, by changing vent uh, speeds or uh, fixing things or adding uh, filters, um, they can evaluate how it is. So I'm just gonna give a demo rather than explaining. Uh, just tell me if you're able to hear the audio. In this demo, we have our game recently. Are you able to hear the audio? Yes, it's all good. Thank you. That button or mask on game mode, mask off game mode and legend to indicate viral aerosol concentration. And then on the right, we'll have a mini map that will let us know where we are as we play the game. And then on the left, we have the game overview panel to tell us our current health, time remaining, and the task to be completed. Uh, first off, we'll start by fixing the vent, make our way down the hallway. We'll have to go through the viral aerosol and give the vent a click to consider the task done. But uh, to avoid losing any more health, we'll take an exit that doesn't have viral aerosols. And um, let's uh, go ahead and watch the conference to complete that task. But you'll see that uh, there's viral aerosol we can't avoid. So we're going to take uh, quite a few hits on our health. And then uh, we'll watch the conference, consider it completed, make our exit. We're going to continue to lose health because there are no alternatives uh, to where we exited from. Now let's go to class and sign ourselves in so we can uh, win this game. Now you'll notice that we finished with our health at 78% and uh, almost four minutes time remaining. So, this demo we have. so that was our uh, first uh, prototype. And then uh, also to have a little bit of variations, we actually uh, integrated two game modes in it as well, like with one with uh, a mask on and mask off. So in this model on the right side is if the infected person are wearing mask, then you can see re uh, less aerosol spread, uh, viral aerosol uh, spread as compared to the uh, one without the mask. So um, one of the complications, uh, I wouldn't say complication, uh, the additional thing that we have to approach with our uh, COVID model was to match the user coordinates um, with the um, viral aerosol coordinates for the game. So uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is from us. If you have any questions, uh, me and Roman from my team and uh, Professor Gabriel is there to address it. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being in time. Uh, so um, let's get back to um, the panel. Um, and uh, can, I, can you ask you to sort of like show a face so we can have like a little like nice uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much. So we have questions from the audience. Like I'm not sure if, if I mean, there's a few on the on the Q&A and on, on the Is uh, Angelus frozen or he's thinking? No, I think it's frozen. I think someone has to step in. Um, I'll ask a question first. Um, I guess for the for the last one, uh, I was wondering, the gamification. Can you explain what the kind of future of this will be? Is this gamifying to uh, building performance so that people reduce the amount of um, paths that they would take, or yeah. uh, what? Hi, uh, yes, um, uh, we are trying to integrate it. So the model which you saw was for a campus model. So um, as like a more future step, we are trying to consider if we are reopening the buildings, uh, then uh, how, uh, how the spread happens, what are the bottlenecks, right? So we are actually trying to build some personas to add along with it and to model, model that. So yeah, it's an idea of we can uh, play, way, play way, learn it as learning tool. Did I answer your question? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Angelos, you're back, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if it's like uh, you were changing my role to, to a host or something, and, but it, I, someone, like, it, it seems like I'm, I keep like getting disconnected and reconnected, I hope it's not gonna happen again. <laughs> uh, maybe my connection is not great. So yeah, uh, more questions. I mean, I have, I have a few, but I'd like to hear from the, the audience probably more than, than me. Any other question? Uh, no. Uh, 
uh, Todor, do you want to perhaps ask the archetypes uh, question uh, or, uh, yeah, Todor was saying in the chat, I'm not sure if, if, if you've read that. Uh, I think this is for you, Aaron. Uh, uh, did you read the, the comment? Do you want to answer it? It says, like, wonderful topological study, but difficult to follow, understand the history of building types. Todo doesn't want to, to answer the question himself, so I'm, I'm going to expose him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can quickly, obviously, there's, there's more information included in the paper about it. In this case, we were just looking at single family residential. So the classification for the archetypes was actually based off of building condition instead of building typology. Um, there's different approaches to, to classifying buildings in the archetypes based off of the area that you're looking at and the intended use of the UVM study, um, but the archetypes are really kind of, they're, they're core to that. And so in this case, we were looking at the, the building conditions and kind of a stand-in for building age there also. Um, and that was based off of work in that uh, strategic, the, the SCI report that I mentioned and that we referenced in the paper um, for some more information about that. I, I have a question for the for the, uh, the third paper. Um, I mean, I have a few, but I'm I'm, I'm going to be very quick, uh, uh, if possible. So the you're you're matching the uh, images to the three D model. So the three D model is con is con reconstructed from the UAV like images, and then you're matching the sort of like cracks and from the images you recognize them from images, and then you match them to the original. Do you do that by matching the images or by matching the location geolocation? Um, I'd like to say both. Um, both. Well, well, uh, actually, for at this stage, only the geolocations of the anomaly. But in the next step, we are also going to consider the pixel information, like the color, like the depth, or well, not the depth for two D images, yeah. maybe just the color, the pixel information yeah. in the next step. And that's where machine learning could perhaps sort of like uh, kick in a little bit. Yeah. So one more question that relates to that, like you're saying, you're using the UAV images. Could you also just use like not like just simple like you know phone images, just to avoid you know locations where you, you, you might not be able to fly the drone. You can just combine them with yes. whatever yes. image. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but let me uh, remind another part because we also use the drone to collect the images to build a 3D building model, right? So yeah. for that part, it cannot be substituted by using the handheld uh, camera. So. Yeah. So but the construction other, happens with the yeah. Yeah, for the inspection purposes, uh, can have killed camera is fine. Yeah, so you have to just somehow like match the texturing uh, or something like that. And then final question, really very quickly, why is irregular shape not working? Uh, because when we are we in our workflow, we have to include a, like a plan facade reference image. So this is kind of like the 2D image registered to 2D image plane. So the facade is um, considered as a plane surface without yes. any curve shape. So that's kind of the yeah, limitation. <laughs> and we're figuring yeah, okay, out I, how to address that. <laughs> there must be, there must be, there must be like unwrapping, uh, unwrapping solution. But anyway, Matt, you have a, you raised your hand. So you just should, I think you can just unmute yourself and speak. Yeah, yes. um, I was wondering for, for Philip, I really like the use of COMSOL multiphysics. Uh, I'm a fan of uh, COMSOL. So it's pretty cool that, that you were using that for the architecture. Towards the end, you, you started showing, you know, what could this end up being in this idea of uh, these kind of tubes on the wall. I was wondering how, how short can you um, make something before you don't get a human usefulness or you know human reduction that is useful to to people because at some point we end up with a uh, large like anechoic chamber triangles on the side of the wall um, and it seems like you did reduce them a bit but there is some variation st still there so I would ask uh, how in your current system how much and then I would ask another similar question um, are there material properties that you can imagine that would reduce this even more um, that it would say if there was a material that could do this, that it would actually let us improve our system. And, and that would be then uh, a challenge to the material scientists uh, in academia to, to say, can, can you make it? Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. To your first question. Um, so definitely we, we need a lot of resonators and these resonators become fairly large for lower frequencies. So that's a concern. Like how, how do we keep these functional? and sort of uh, how, how do we apply these in actual space? Um, so 
that's where sort of our speculation comes in a little bit. We more so wanted to verify the exact range that would be covered by one specific resonators and how the geometrical proportion relate to that. And we're sort of aiming to apply that to more metamaterial based resonators where all these issues are sort of addressed. The resonators are used in these smaller assemblies that can be sort of implemented within the wall actually. And we're using this study to understand these relationships um, to maybe apply them to a more functional uh, approach down the line. And sort of to, to your second question, um, yes, absolutely. So there's uh, studies on um, inserting uh, sort of like fleece material or sort of porous material within the resonator to improve sort of a performance of a single resonator, which we are just sort of relying on the uh, geometrical proportions alone. But there are certain materials that you can incorporate in your resonators to make them more effective. Um, but we did not look at that um, in this study. But that's definitely also something we're interested in looking at. Um, yeah, I hope I helps answer your question. I have a follow up, like to so uh, starting from the exact. I'm not sure if we have more time. I'm, I'm a bit confused. Also, if we we we, we have until half half past, right or not, David? Because uh, I got confusing messages from. Uh, we have a keynote uh, session starting at. Uh, 2.30, so in 31 minutes. So you have a little bit of time. Oh, yeah, super. Because I thought like someone told me that it's like at the hour, but it's not. Okay, perfect. So we have a lot of time to talk, uh, which is great. Break, but there's extra time. We do want to give people a break, but we can also continue the conversation. Oh, it froze. Uh, well, I'll continue my, my question to, to Philip then uh, while Angelos is getting back. So I guess part of it was that I'm asking I work with some material scientists in, in projects where we're doing not too similar things, but I mean, adjacent. And this has come up a couple of times. For example, if you have uh, building uh, facades that can respond to humidity, right? So can we make uh, an embedded intelligent material that as humidity increases, it curls and, and lets air circulation, something like this. Um, from the material scientist side, the materials researchers, they're kind of like waiting, right? As, as a designer, as an architect, you're saying, we want a material that would do this thing so that we would be able to improve the performance of um, our system or our, our components. Because that's what I was asking that, not that have you used the materials or other materials, but if you could give to someone, right? If this is recorded and, and some material scientists end up watching this and you say, yeah, if you could make this, then we would actually be able to improve our product, our system so much so that we would have uh, one centimeter um, thick, you know, panels rather than uh, eight or nine centimeters. Right. Um, yes, I, so I, I hope guess. I have, yeah. Sorry. Um, to hand it off like this, yes, for sure. Uh, because we're looking at the geometrical aspect of it. Like I would maybe encourage, like I would ask him to look at developing a specific porous material that performs exactly how we want it within the resonator. So like, again, looking at specific like lattices or these continuous uh, gradient materials that we might be able to insert within the resonator. Um, so I guess to hand it off to a uh, material scientist, uh, they should develop a geometry based shape that might be inserted in, the, in these Helmholtz resonators to make them smaller. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, maybe before I get disconnected, I might try to answer, ask the question again before. I don't know what's going on. Like I keep getting disconnected and reconnected again. So uh, starting from the exact opposite like uh, angle from, from, from Matt, I, I don't like Comso. That's why I want to ask, you know, when you have something like that's uh, that, complicated uh, to, to run as a simulation. How do you go from that to a design, to, to, to shut up something that, you know, is integrated in a design sort of like uh, process, right? Uh, sorry, asking the the, the city architect question uh, yeah. Yeah. here. No, definitely. I, I agree with you. Like, uh, Comsol was a, a bit of a pain to work with as sort of a designer and coming sort of from CAD software, from Rhino, you know, like easy everything. So definitely agree with that. Um, I think, well, this, this thermoviscous dampening that happens in the resonator is like very difficult to capture. Like you can't capture it with like our traditional like ray-based simulation that is sort of embedded in Rhino already and all that stuff. So 
we kind of had to resort to the software to like model the, the resonance, right? And, and, and actually get our results for absorption. Um, so it was pain, um, but uh, yeah, we're kind of really helpful uh, in getting these results and putting them back into Rhino then, right? We can now go back to our grasshopper model and like tune our geometry parameters. And I guess that's kind of how it relates back to architecture in that sense, because we're trying to like close that loop and bring it back around. Um, yeah. Cool, thanks. Uh, I'm just quickly answering to to uh, uh, to Mojo to to, to other about Mojo. Uh, yeah, Mojo is probably like the reason why I'm, I'm getting disconnected. Uh, well, not not if any one of you doesn't know who Mojo is, you should uh, definitely do because uh, uh, it's, it, Mojo is the reason why we're all here. So, like you know, we just want to go to the bar afterwards and and hang out, uh, which is what we would normally do in a conference. And it's it's also the reason why it's similar is the coolest uh, conference of all. Uh, not biased here, I mean, like, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, keep in mind that there is a bar and Mojo is there waiting for you, probably running a denial, denial of service attack to me right now so that I just stop talking. So uh, maybe we have any more questions for uh, another paper, or I, I, otherwise I can, I can sort of like continue with mine. Uh, David, you wanted to say something or you just appeared I just appeared. That's beautiful, always. Uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> so um, the second paper, how do you propose to integrate these demographic and socioeconomic factors uh, is my question. Because I mean, like, I understand there's the issue there, but like how, you know, how do we go from the issue to the solution? So just to start to understand your question, do you mean how they get integrated? So I guess like the, the area that we're looking at is how those impact the archetype inputs, which then impact the simulation outputs. So, um, you know, kind of default archetypes, if you look at something like the DOE reference buildings or the PNL reference, but like the PNNL reference buildings, um, they make a lot of assumptions about occupancy patterns, energy use, appliance efficiency, set points, all of these things that are impacted by the demographic factors. So we're looking at how, how we can take those demographic factors and adjust those inputs um, to better reflect the actual energy use patterns of these neighborhoods. Okay. Um, yeah, I was, yeah, okay. I was going to sort of like ask if, if there's a way to sort of like include um, any participatory models there in, in, in the way we, we are designing these archetypes, uh, but maybe, yeah, that's a different paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we have any more questions for any others, any other sorts of like uh, papers? We have one down there. No, bar time is not yet. Uh, Todor, please be, co co constrain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we have a little bit more to, to do here. Um, one more question from perhaps the panel here or the audience. I see some people are sleepy because you know you have like European European uh, uh, time being like sort of like 11 to 12 o'clock, but you know, uh, we can make sure we, we all wake up a little bit. No? Okay, then I will go with uh, one more question about the, the from like the first paper. Maybe could you could you sort of like uh, oh do we have do we still have here the presenter? Oh yeah, you you're there, right? I can see yeah. you. You, yeah. you. Okay, um, I'm, I'm not gonna pronounce your name because I'm, I'm gonna be terrible. So do you think there's like a, a do, could you identify what's the cause and effect of of, of sort of like um, you know, what's happening, what's happening there with the, uh, yeah, sort of like um, uh, uh, other developed areas and, and, uh, and uh, sort of like pollution. Is it, could you talk a little bit about that? I, I'm trying to phrase it as sort of like correctly as possible, but yeah, could you reflect yeah. a little bit of yeah, so what's causing I what? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so basically, I guess we're trying to, uh, the goal of the uh, map is to try uh, help people identify like basically which subgroup or which region is more vulnerable to heat. So the vulnerable would uh, mean 
probably you have some high heat exposure, like you just uh, have some high temperature for a long time for some reason. And then another one is for the same exposure, you might be more sensible to the extreme heat. Maybe if you're a kid or a elderly or have some disease like heart, heart disease, then you are going to be maybe more uh, like develop some more serious disease under maybe the same exposure. And another factor would be uh, if you probably if you're rich, you have better AC, you can afford the electricity uh, to uh, use your AC. So then you you'd be able to modify your environment to be a more comfortable uh, level. So, so these are the factors we consider. And then the reason why we find the center city being the most vulnerable is like it's, uh, I guess mm, it has all seems to be uh, bad in all three factors. Uh, it's sort of uh, more, it has a, a more heated exposure generally in like a center or south or uh, south uh, west. Um, and it also has a high pollution level in the center. And the pollution level is sort of correlated with a uh, low income and uh, low education level and uh, also like a maybe non-white population. So, so um, I guess uh, these all may, may be contributed to why the center part is more uh, vulnerable. Oh, and, and I guess uh, from the simulation result, we also saw that the buildings there aren't very good. They're going to, uh, like if the AC is shut down and they're ris uh, rising to 30 degrees C and like pretty quickly. So all of those seem to point that they are like vulnerable in multiple aspects. So, Mm, I guess yeah, this no, might, I th I th yeah. This is a very elaborate answer. I mean, perhaps yeah. I, I, I was trying to allude to like the fact that we're probably creating a vicious cycle there with the with the cause and effect uh -huh. of, you know, yeah, the, um, sort of like disadvantaged areas causing again yeah, more sort of like. Yeah, uh, yeah I guess in the literature where they discuss uh, the, like the, uh, I guess heat vulnerability. So, so you can consider uh, extreme heat as a treatment variable, like if you're doing a causal analysis, right? So that would be a treatment variable. And then your, uh, like, like uh, your uh, demographics, like your, um, it, uh, it's more like the population you're interested in, like uh, your sample or, or your target population. And then your, uh, the, the other factors like uh, maybe income or education level, those might be like, or, or pre-existing health condition, those might modify the uh, temperature effect. So like condition on this uh, type of features, the temperature will have stronger or weaker uh, effect than, uh, on your health, yeah. Understood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay. Do we have any more, like any last question? One last question for probably maybe the last last paper as well. No. I want to say that I really liked the the, the gamification of the last paper. I'm not sure, like, uh, uh, if yeah, we still have you here, right? Yeah, uh, you know. Um, so I really like the gamification aspect. Uh, I, I mean, I understood that with the gamification, you're trying to like sort of like create awareness of like, you know, the, how the uh, the pol pollutants are distributed, but uh, is it also like a, a design tool or can it be like a design tool as well? Yeah, it can be a design tool as well. It, uh, that okay. was the intention. I am a designer by background. Intention. It's always my okay. intention. Yeah. And, and how would someone like go from that like to design tool? No, because um, uh, currently I, I've been taking a look at a design automation uh, that 4G API allows, and maybe that might open up uh, more opportunities. And uh, yeah, it's in a process. Yeah. Sorry, I'm muted. This is the most famous uh, 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 phrase this year. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>
I think since there is a little bit of time, I'm not sure if I'm going to ask uh, for one last question from anyone uh, there or from the uh, audience as well, from the attendees. Uh, anyone who wants to sort of like chip in on the discussion. Otherwise, David, how about we go get a drink? Uh, yeah, I guess I would give everybody a 15-minute break before uh, our yeah. afternoon or evening or late keynote, evening yeah. uh, keynotes. There's actually two. Um, I also wanted to say thank you, Angelos, for moderating. Uh, you did a great job and the papers are amazing. Um, it was a pleasure. So for all of you attendees and panelists, um, please take a little break, get something to eat maybe or a coffee or whatever, and we will reconvene shortly. Yeah. Thanks everyone. The bar. Thank you everyone. Thank you. And uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Amber, do people know where to go? Where uh, the bar is? Should be, should be on I, the program. It's, it's in the program under Mojo's Happy Hour, and you can also get there through the virtual venue if you go straight to the eye that's hiking over the bar. That'll take you to our separate Zoom so that everybody can network and see one another. And I'm going to post it also here on the chat. Thank you. It's going to make it easier. So see you over there. And David, if you want to leave this Zoom up, that way people will know that we're like in a pause between now and the keynote? Uh, I will, I won't touch anything. I <laughs> get, uh, uh, an over-sugared Americano, but no, I don't take sugar. <laughs> I missed <Perfect>. this. <laughs> I missed this. <laughs> oh, there's, there's, a nice whole, there's a whole other uh, line of conversation, which includes our colleagues in Vienna. All right, all right, yeah. Well, <laughs> see, uh, you, see you later. Uh, I'll see you in a few minutes. Sure. David, you see the chat? Uh, yes, um, the link to the happy hour or to Mojo's bar is actually in the chat for all of those who are interested in uh, some socialization. Please go ahead and click on that uh, Zoom and then come back to this one at, well, in 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah, Thanks, I'm, in, man. I'm in my my message in chat, but that's a good point too. Oh, yours. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, yes. Hold on one second.
Amber, I can see you looking at your phone. <laughs> I thought it was like you were taking a selfie of us all on Zoom. David, I'm I'm here, but I'm also in the other um, Zoom as well. I'm in I'm in Mojo and here. So is it just us? We still have to leave. Hello, Bertrand and Dan. Hi, Azida. Hello. Hi. We were all at the happy hour mojo bar. So the all the people are in another Zoom. So I just told them that I'm going to go back because this was a half an hour uh, kind of a networking drinking event. Uh, oh, great. We're, we're taking them away from their happy hour. And they're I'm all going to sure. come back tanked. Yep. I'm having my own. <laughs> this is pure vodka. Just nice. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll I'll bring my drink here to them. Mm. That sounds like cracking open something cool. I like it. <laughs> I'm joining the happy hour. I'm mm. I'm sorry and warn everybody if there's piano in the background. Well, at least we don't have saxophone today. Because saxophone, you know, I mean, the piano is tolerable, but. Funny thing is the saxophone was being practiced for the last hour about five feet from her head. <laughs> <laughs> so I might not even remember what I'm going to say. That's okay. We can just, you know, put on the, put on the gloves and duke it out apparently, you know?
Do you want me to share my screen, David? Or not yet? Um, actually, Burchin and Dan, um, Matt Schwartz, who's um, right here, is the introducer and moderator for your session. Uh, he's one of my co-chairs, um, and he's from NGIT. And so I'll direct all stuff towards him. I have, I have uh, two slides to kind of introduce you with your uh, keynote. So uh, I think we could show those and then you could screen share unless you prefer, you can start with the screen sharing and I'll just introduce you over your own slide. Neither way. You can, you can introduce with your slides and then I will share my screen. Okay, sounds good. Um, is Birchin going first and then Dan? Should I? Okay, I'll spotlight uh, you first. One small thing is, can we close down the bar somehow? Have Gabriel close the bar. I'll message something to you, Gabriel. Sorry, Matt, are we are we live now or yeah. Great, I'll turn my mic. We're live and it's on YouTube. Great. Super. So if you want to see what other people see, then you could go to the, the YouTube link. Um, I'll I'll copy it here too. And how much time do we each have? About 20 minutes? 20 minutes, we have uh, set aside an hour, uh, plus there's a half hour of uh, break in between, but I think we can, I'd be happy if we went into that, if it was okay with you all. <laughs> um, so you could do 20 minutes and then 20, 20 minutes each, then 20 minutes of uh, talk or 25 minutes each. Yeah, I've got, if I can, if I stick to the script, I've got 21 minutes, so. it's perfect. Um, so we can get started if you like. I'm ready. All right. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in this keynote. We actually have, uh, two keynote presenters at the same time. Uh, they're gonna go one after another, but we're gonna have a group conversation afterwards. Um, I think it's gonna be quite an exciting discussion. Uh, first up is Dr. Borchin Federick Gerber, who is a Dean's Professor of Civil Engineering, um, Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Southern California. Her research focuses on interactions between the built environment and its users and aims to understand and predict how and why humans interact with their built environment. She then uses this information to develop novel technologies, interfaces, tools to improve the human experience and to achieve engineering objectives such as energy efficiency, safety, security, health, and well being. In her work, Borchin extensively uses machine learning and data science to improve design, construction, and system intelligence of user-centered built environments. In 2012, MIT's Technology Review named her one of the world's top young innovators under the age of 35. She was selected to take part in the National Academy of Engineering Frontiers of Engineering Education Symposiums. She's a recipient of numerous awards, including the NSF Career Award, uh, FIA Tech Celebration of Engineering and Technology Outstanding Researcher Award, in 2018, she was awarded a Rutherford Visiting Fellowship at the Alan Turing Institute, the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. In 2020, she was selected as a fellow of the National 
leadership development program designed to advance women in faculty in engineering. She's currently serving as the co-director of the Center for Intelligent Environments at USC and as the director of graduate programs at, in the Astani Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Dr. Bord, uh, Bedrick Gerber holds degrees in both civil engineering, uh, civil and environmental engineering and architecture from Istanbul Technical University with a Bachelor of Architecture and an MS in Architecture and an MS in Engineering degree from UC Berkeley. And she earned her Doctorate of Design degree from Harvard University. Uh, the second speaker that we'll have following um, immediately is Dan Sullivan, who's an architect who's enhancing resilience and human potential through the design of the physical environment. Dan believes that in our world, increasing dominated by machines and automation, we are called to be more quintessentially human, to connect more deeply for common purpose. He believes it's necessary to engage creativity and empathy to create the innovations that will elevate all humans. These processes are enabled or stymied through the physical environment and have the potential to make us happier, healthier, and more resilient. Formerly, Dan was a founding member and head of design at the Google R&D Lab for Built Environment. Beginning with Google's first ground up buildings, he advanced a high performance, low cost, future proofed workplace. Dan is currently building on a new venture predicated on elevating human potential and advancing environmental resilience that leverages neuroscience, experimental building processes, systems, and technologies. His ultimate goal is to offer this at low cost to every human. Dan is also an artist and has created some of the largest art on, on fire ever at Burning Man. He believes that the construction process itself is a tool for building social cohesion and enabling catharsis and transformational experience. Dan holds a BA in architecture from the UC Berkeley and a master of architecture from the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. Um, I'm particularly excited for both of these speakers today um, with this human focus uh, approach. So let's get started. All right. Thank you so much, Matt, for that wonderful uh, uh, introduction. So I am going to share my desktop. Um, can you guys? Oops, hold on. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, it's good. Thank you. Great. Uh, let me move my these guys somewhere else. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction as well as the invite. Um, so I bring in the researcher perspective and Dan and I had a conversation last week and uh, we came up with this idea of happiness and how built environments can support happiness. So I tried to theme my presentation around uh, the pursuit of happiness in the built environment. And um, of course, uh, everything I will show is going to be about research. I'm not a practicing architect or engineer. So as you know, the technology is reshaping our everyday experiences from assistive robots to smart home devices to robotic surgery to virtual assistance. Um, this development trend will be no different for our built environments and technology, in my opinion, must have one fundamental purpose to support happiness. But what is happiness? So I started with Googling the definition of happiness um, and here are some definitions. Then the question that I ask to myself is how can built environments support our happiness? Um, in fact, uh, as, as Matt mentioned, I direct the Center for Intelligent Environments and I have a slide for this. Our whole purpose in that center is to, to promote human-centered design, construction, and operation. So we see buildings to be anonymous to space operations. We want buildings to be socially intelligent like the system robots in the previous slide. Uh, we want uh, buildings to be very similar to the machines, where machines collaborate with humans in heterogeneous team environments. So in other words, uh, in my research, I try to see buildings as uh, machines. So um, my, I mentioned sentience. Um, so to support this human-centered initiative to improve built environments, I co-direct sentience. 
as a word play sentience as in, in the word sentience spelled differently the capacity to be aware of feelings and sensations so in this presentation i will try to answer the question of how can built environments support our happiness uh, without trying to be too engineering like <laughs> uh, using some of the research projects in my lab and at sentience and uh, staying very high level. My goal here is to start a conversation uh, after Dan's uh, presentation. So happiness is uh, satisfaction. Happiness is feeling satisfied in your built environment, whatever that built environment is, your home, your work, uh, your school, or your learning environment. So this is a long line of research where we try to extract the condition of mind, uh, try to understand uh, what are people's preferences in terms of indoor environmental quality factors like temperature, lighting, air quality. And we developed uh, an agent uh, that uh, models each user preferences into a virtual agents and resides in his or her smartphone. And as you can see, we started from a participatory approach to these clunky sensors to more embedded clothing to thermal cameras. So several different ways of uh, modeling preferences and satisfaction. So the system uh, that we develop work with all building agents to find in that case, most efficient, uh, energy efficient way of adjusting the settings while making the greatest number of people satisfied in the environment. And we implemented this in a test bed building. But what we have realized very soon is when we try to operate our test bed with occupant preferences, the current systems we realized are do not support personal preferences due to system limitations or designs such as uh, mechanical zoning. So we had to look for more personalized approaches. So this was our, our solution. We developed an Internet of Things, uh, IoT-based intelligent agent that learns individuals occupant comfort preferences and controls the thermal environment using local devices. And then we can relax the requirements on the centralized systems. Um, this is something we tested in three different buildings with multiple occupants, uh, tried different uh, levels of automation because one thing that interests me a lot is the adjustable autonomy, how to share autonomy between things and people. And, uh, and the results were very promising. So these systems that are more personalized, I think uh, the expectation was like improving occupant satisfaction and we demonstrated that. But also the levels of automation are very interesting in terms of increase in satisfaction, as well as the preference of people in the automation side as well. Again, I'm really briefly introducing the projects, just going through different, uh, different ideas here. Of course, you're not going to disagree with me, especially in this uh, last year and a half that, the, or I don't know if it's been half, but year and some months that uh, happiness is also about being healthy so more and more we realize that indoor environments can facilitate the control and the spread of the virus like the virus we're dealing with and uh, factors such as air quality lighting uh, humidity uh, temperature uh, noise um, and ergonomics in buildings have significant impact on people's health and well-being. So new strategies emerged, uh, uh, like voice-activated elevators, doors, or water fountains, uh, hands-free light switches or thermostats, or uh, surfaces with antibacterial fabrics and finishes. And, uh, and buildings are being designed and retrofitted to operate in a more adaptable way, uh, movable walls and partitions. And we're thinking about how to utilize uh, our spaces more efficiently to accommodate work from home trend that is likely to stand here, stay here, as well as to reduce the probability of infection diseases. So happiness is no pain. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have experienced increased uh, pain uh, in your muscles and joints since you started working from home. I certainly did. Um, and uh, I know others who are suffering as well. 
because increased sitting causes all kinds of issues um, and most common related injuries uh, are related to shoulder and elbow pain as well as legs and, uh, and knees and other parts of uh, your body. So this is a project and attempt to uh, and we, we developed an automated uh, ergonomic assessment algorithm to be uh, deployed in offices. And uh, posture or motion detection is uh, not new, but what is novel in this case is um, we're focusing on a person who is spending most of his or her time sitting. That is, uh, and, and in a sedentary uh, posture. So it's uh, a little bit difficult, uh, more difficult than other moisture, motion capture uh, work. And we're working with the ergonomists here, uh, our colleagues from occupational science, occupational uh, therapy to, to predict with high accuracy, the shoulder flexion, shoulder abduction, elbow flexion and providing a monitoring system that communicates with the users to promote behavior change in terms of a healthier or towards a healthier posture. So this is another example from an ongoing project as you can see a participant with a mask. Um, um, happiness is also being productive. Um, in offices, productivity is important and uh, there are many factors that affect our productivity. During this pandemic period, we have uh, administered a survey and received over a thousand responses. And one thing that jumped out, uh, stood out, was the impact of noise on productivity as well as health. So in the right now, we're, we're running experiments to understand the effect of noise in our uh, work productivity. And here you're seeing a participant taking several performance tests uh, under different noise conditions to be able to assess empirically what is the impact of noise in, uh, in productivity and work performance. However, uh, again, this cannot be a one size fits all approach. We're all different individuals and the built environments should support each one of us despite our sensory, physical and learning differences. This is another ongoing work where we're working on uh, providing the most suitable sensory environment for not only the neurotypical individuals, but also neurodiverse workers in the built environment. Another ongoing project uh, touches on stress in the workplace. As you probably guessed by now, my research in the lab uh, is driven by my personal interest and job stress uh, is an extremely important one and it arises, uh, but gets, when it's ignored, uh, it can lead to detrimental health consequences, um, uh, out, uh, outcomes. So this research aims to investigate the feasibility of automated stress detection by employing machine learning techniques. We're using physiological, facial and postural responses as well as computer interactions of a worker uh, and exposing them to office stressors. So our goal is to identify the most significant stress features so that we can establish a generalized stress detection algorithm if we can with high accuracies. Then uh, our aim is to provide stress remedies uh, through building design and operations. We aim then uh, if we, we were planning for a prolonged deployment in office spaces uh, to detect real life stress and then uh, to try to avoid it. So happiness is also being safe. Um, building design has tremendous impact on our safety behavior. Uh, and this was our hypothesis in this research where we try to understand how uh, building design affects uh, people's uh, evocation behavior during uh, emergencies. And in this simulation, you see an active shooter incident. Uh, we created two versions of the built environment, the standard version uh, for a school as well as an office and an enhanced version with security countermeasures for both the office and the uh, and, uh, and uh, school environment. Um, we looked at occupant behavior like evocation, as well as shelter behavior, as well as the interactions uh, that are observed during emergencies. Um, and uh, the, we're 
still analyzing the results, but uh, I can with confidence tell you that building design has tremendous impact on our decisions we make during these uh, kind of emergency events. Uh, one other interesting thing that we did in this research is we collected data from strictly office workers and the teachers and then there are also demographic uh, differences in terms of that comes with your uh, job uh, description. So different than the previous projects, uh, which focused uh, on building design and operation. We also, uh, I also see a need uh, in, in supporting the construction phase of our uh, buildings. As you know, there is an increasing level of automation being implemented on construction sites. And we see more and more hybrid teams where construction workers need to partner with construction robots. So one thing that I'm extremely interested in is uh, trust in automation along with mental workload and situational awareness and how these factors are impacted when a person works with uh, in a robotic uh, setting. Um, there are also other important things that we're trying to assess here, like uh, how we can reskill and upskill construction workers, preparing them for a new way of working. Um, so this is, uh, this is a clip from the project where we're training real construction workers using uh, uh, virtual reality and then assessing them to in use of uh, just downstairs the real robot and how to operate how the, the transfer from virtual environment to the real environment. Uh, but what is interesting in this research is we had statistically significant results, uh, very impressive actually that virtual reality-based training increases uh, trust in automation and does not have um, any impact or, or uh, increases spiritual awareness, but does not have much impact on uh, or statistical difference in terms of mental workload. So um, I have a few more slides. Uh, um, talking about the pursuit of happiness in the built environment. And here are some uh, questions, uh, I think more for uh, provoking a discussion. Uh, and, and these are also from different projects. So this is a collaborative project between my group uh, uh, and collaborators at USC and Arab. So, and this question that we are posing here is what if your building or your furniture or your workspace knows you? And this is a, a desk project uh, embedded with all kinds of sensors uh, between the two uh, surfaces of the desk, constantly monitoring um, the user as well as the environment and modeling their preferences uh, as well as the environment and providing, uh, going back to the first few slides, more comfortable um, environments in the, in the workspace. Uh, this is another project um, uh, that's been uh, completed and it's a collaboration between ICT's Virtual Humans Lab. And here we try to personalize the building using virtual avatars. Actually, we tested with different methods, tests, voice, and avatars, and, um, and ran several uh, experiments looking at the gender of the communicator when we're trying to personalize the building, uh, message framing, uh, delivery of communications, like I mentioned, through text, voice, and avatar. And what we, we incorporate relational features like a small talk or a smiling or nodding. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this is Ellie. Hi, how are you? I'm Ellie, representing your building. What's your name? I'm glad to see you here. If I open the blinds for you to have natural light, would you please dim or turn off the artificial lights? So, Hi, how are you? Oops, 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 okay, uh, I'll go back. Uh, so we found these intelligence agents were very effective um, uh, promote, promoting compliance with the building requests. Actually, female agents were more uh, effective than the male uh, agents. And then uh, we found significant effects of building person on the social dialogue. When building engaged through a dialogue, users complied more with the building's request. 
just uh, there, there's so many more details and I'm happy to provide uh, uh, to anybody who might be interested in the details. So here is another, and this is the last slide that I'm going to leave uh, you with. Uh, what if your building is your friend? What if like, what if your home was more than that? It was more than just an address. What if your home was like your friend? What are you thinking? You know, you and I enter our office building, your space would be personalized to you. Your space would know you in a very intimate way. Your space would know if you had a bad day or a good day, if you were tired and you needed more coffee, if you had appointments that day, your space would be like your friend. It would be an extension of you. That sounds interesting. What if it could have a personality? What if like, what if you're... Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. That is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions or be part of the discussion after Dan's presentation. I'll stop sharing. So, you Dan, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. So great. I, I'm so impressed that we that you were able to track to happiness in buildings that is that is very impressive uh i'm going to share my screen too can uh the famous word the, the, the famous phrase for yes. the year can everybody see my screen okay great <laughs> well i'll tell you it's always hard to go after someone like Burcham because we get all excited and inspired by the amazing things that um, are happening in uh, research, things that are actually gonna uh, evolve and, and change the built environment. Um, but I think that we're well, we're well paired um, because I'm, I'm not a scientist, um, though I do spend most of my time with people much uh, smarter than me like Birchin. Uh, so, you know, I spend a lot of my time really navigating the space between research and industry um, in the service of getting uh, solutions for the built environment um, implemented. Um, so I'm an architect who hasn't designed a proper building in many years. Um, uh, I spent the last six years, uh, as Matt mentioned, building out a research and development lab uh, for Google and the, the remit is really to push cutting edge uh, research into Google's development work. So this sort of situates me um, as both an advocate for research and a client. Um, and I recently left there uh, to pursue a new venture. Um, so uh, pursuing similar ends, but through different means. Um, and clearly I would share more if we weren't running in total stealth mode on that right now, but, but more to come. Um, actually looking at this image, it, maybe they don't let me design buildings because uh, I make my drawings on the sidewalk, but um, but I'm an I'm, I'm also an artist, uh, as I'm as I'm about to explain shortly. Uh, so this story will begin with a little bit of a why, um, so a story about art and humans, and then we'll move into a bit of a how, um, or the more pragmatic applications of what I do, um, and we'll start with the Utopia of Burning Man, um, which is a fascinating place to try new things. Uh, and then we'll move to future utopias. Um, so these are just places that are, well, they're like utopias in waiting. Not not yet utopias, but if we all put our minds together, we, we might be able to push them there. Um, so I, I do my art at, at Burning Man for the most part. And for those of you who aren't well acquainted with uh, that event, it's a week long art event in the Black Rock Desert. Um, but it's also a year round community of artists um, that are sort of united by um, a love for what they um, perceive the tenets of the event to be. And I say it that way because I think we all think that we know what it's about, but really we're just saying what we think it should be about. Um, and so for me, what I think Burning Man should be about is, is, is this participation in the creation of art. Uh, and then secondly, a rare opportunity to connect with experimentation. Um, it's a crucible for trying things and not getting too attached to outcomes. And um, that's really because we, we, we burn the majority of, of what we actually create there. Uh, so I built my first piece on the playa in, in 2011, uh, and then um, sort of progressively increased in scale to the Temple of Grace in 2014, and then um, to Catacomb of Veils and um, 
maybe I have a couple more in me, we'll see. Um, but I want to spend uh, the bulk of the time today talking about catacomb bales because this was the the high evolution, the third uh, in, in in the evolving concepts from the earlier pieces. And um, this was the largest project by volume ever to go to Burning Man. Um, it's also the biggest fire ever had on the playa. Um, and you can sort of see from the image, it's designed to look like a ruin in the desert in suspended decay, but left by a previous civilization potentially. Um, it was eight stories tall and half an acre in footprint and a million pounds of wood that was shipped to the desert on 20 18 wheeler flatbeds. Um, so the scale of this and the effort necessary to ensure its success is all right at the edge of possible, even under the best conditions. And this near impossibility is actually um, part of the setup for the human experience. Um, so it needed to be assembled in 10 days in the desert, um, that huge thing in 10 days. And so we invested a lot uh, in building every component digitally um, and then building out a construction sequence that made sense for us. So beginning with uh, the buttresses and buttress walls and then moving uh, plan north here into the narthex, uh, sorry, into the sanctum and then plan south here into the narthex, um, adding the exterior gangway, the exterior cladding, and then finally dropping the pyramid caps on which were um, 10 tons each. Um, so we started building Catacomb at Pier 70 in San Francisco. Uh, it was built in 12 weekends uh, be before shipping it off to the desert. Um, and as you can see, everything was uh, conceived of using a, a panelized uh, prefab logic from the main pieces of the structure all the way down to the, uh, to the platforms and to the cladding. Um, and, and because Burning Man has a long tradition within the Burning community of participation, we were able to find an all-volunteer staff uh, to gift this art piece to the larger community. So it was with about um, 200 or so volunteers, most of whom had never picked up a power tool in their lives, um, that we were able to build this. But um, because of this, the site, the build site really becomes a place of teaching and learning and a place where like, as the pressures of of our daily lives fall away, people open up, they cooperate, they share, they they just connect really deeply in an, in an authentic way. They they find out things about themselves. They they, they discover um, uh, the artist in themselves. Um, and this this human connection is really what this project is about. For me um you know it's mothers and daughters working together learning how to build it's people celebrating each other um empowering each other uh a lot of people are building for a lost loved one as a as a mechanism for processing um grief but these reasons all become opening for deeper connection and greater understanding um and so the flatbeds all get packed up and they leave uh san francisco for nevada um, sorry, actually, I, I don't mean to gloss over this. It, it's a short presentation. I would need probably a four hour presentation to really get deep on uh, on what this connection is about. But I think the larger point is that transformation is happening in a parking lot in an industrial corner of San Francisco, like nothing special and also like radically transformational at the same time. Um, so for those of us who can take the time, we head to the desert. This is uh, before the gates open, obviously. And we meet the trucks that are arriving there to um, begin our build. And as you can see, when we get there, there's literally nothing there um, except the beautiful open desert. So uh, we have to build our own shelter. We build our kitchen, our common area, common areas, our restrooms um before we even start building and then uh panel by panel working around the clock day and night we begin to assemble the structure and of course everything goes exactly as planned um it doesn't at all but um but building on the playa is a trip it's we always joke that it's like building on the moon um and this video makes it look amazing and it, it is but it's also 100 degrees 
and there are wind and dust storms daily and people haven't slept and they haven't eaten. Um, so these pressures really continue, uh, contribute to the impossibility of it um, or it being at the edge of possibility even in the best conditions. And um, these are anything but the best conditions. Um, and then we burn it. Um, and people come to watch it burn. And I think for a lot of people, this is the meditation in the work. So for those who are, uh, who are not connected with the building of it, they bring whatever they bring. They bring whatever they're holding that day. They bring uh, what they wrote on the walls uh, inside the catacomb or mementos that they left there. Um, a lot of people will build uh, memorials um, inside of it. Uh, memorials to lost loved ones and they'll um, uh, you know send their memory away uh, uh, through the burn um, but i think that for those who have participated in it um, for the crew this is a loss of a, a of a kind or or a catharsis um, or in my mind hopefully a recognition of what exists after that physical artifact is gone Um, so in my mind, the catacomb is only really ever about the humans and the humanity, uh, the humans that created it and the humanity that was created there. Um, and then maybe secondarily the vessel that contained the experience, but it only contains it for a moment. Um, so when I think of this project or this experiment, this human experiment, I see it as, as a success because of the human experience that it enabled and the community of strangers that now call each other family. I mean, these people, um, even today, five years later, identify as a uh, catacomb crew. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, which brings me to my default world work, the workplace, and this may seem like, um, it may seem abrupt, um, but I think th this, in some ways exemplifies the nature of experiments that you do with your own money and very few constraints and the ones that you do with other people's money um, with the intent of generating uh, a return on investment. So I'm not trying to draw a direct line between what is clearly a sublime experience of art forged in the crucible of common struggle um, to workplace, but I am saying that projects like the catacomb and like temple and others are part of an experiment in humanness and those experiments leverage a suitable vessel um, or a spatial experiment to make it possible. So why workplace? Um, and I, um, this is important to me because I am looking for to have the greatest impact in the world. And I think workplace is one of the most consequential industries to innovate. Um, a very particular kind of human experiment. So first, the scale is enormous. Uh, we're talking about $16 trillion and 24 billion square feet uh, in just the largest 200 markets in the US. Um, and also the refresh cycles are very short. So we're talking about three to five years, uh, every three to five years they will renovate. Um, second, because of the competition for talent, this is really a world of micro differentiation. So um, they have, a lot of motivation to innovate. Every small increase in productivity scales to huge returns. Um, third, because of the amount of time that we spend or maybe spent uh, there, um, TBD, uh, the workplaces sort of become synonymous with identity because we're there all the time. There are relationships. They provide amenities that are essential to our survival, like food and transportation. So they become part of who we are and how we operate in the world. Um, and finally, workplace has the capital, <laughs> and that is important. Uh, and the investment is quickly recognized by other people in the industry and mirrored. Um, and so it sort of has a natural scale scaling to it. Um, so if we look at the human experience in the workplace, you hear a lot about joy, connection, human potential, and agency. But often because of the ROI concern, um, this lands at a conversation about productivity and um, 
while the ambitions for the high level states are absolutely there, um, the productivity is generally a starting point. And you know, to Birchin's point, actually that does connect back to happiness. So, um, so, so, so these things are definitely uh, interconnected. And then similarly in the realm of the spatial experiment, the basis is always rooted in low cost, uh, low risk solutions, usually with sustainability tacked on. Um, and so from an implementation perspective, we're typically targeting highly flexible um, building systems. So I'm just gonna walk through a really quick example. Um, so if productivity is the goal, what do we mean by more productive? Do we mean write more lines of code? Do we mean, do we mean the code is higher quality? Do we mean more emails sent or more emails read or do we mean more patents? Um, so maybe instead we try to identify blockers to productivity. And you know, Bertrand mentioned a few of these too. People are distracted by acoustic and visual distractions. Um, they're, they're stressed, they're, they're blocked or just not feeling um, creative. And then do we mean more productive together or more productive alone? Because if we're talking about together, then maybe we're now talking about more research on social cohesion or psychological safety. Um, but let's say we want to enable focus, lower stress, enable creativity. What's the constellation of research topics that surrounds that? And what are the most impactful solutions? Um, where do we even begin to create guidance around these things? Um, which ones do we choose? Which, which two could we choose? What, how do these outcomes interact with each other? Are they antagonistic? Are they synergistic? And then what do we do when the more impactful research threads point to solutions that are not within the purview of the built environment or that are strictly the purview of leadership and management? So these are challenges that I encounter in my work um, in trying to get great research implemented into real space. Um, and even when there's a will, similar factors will stand in the way. So things like the research being nuanced, um, you know, outcomes that have significance in the lab might not convert to sort of the course request for ROI in workplace interior. Again, not a criticism of the research, um, just a potential misalignment to solve in what people want to see in order to implement or scale something. Um, second, it's rare that you'll convince a company to create single purposes or hyper specific spaces. Um, since those spaces are typically costly and less flexible. Um, and historically, making things more generic has really been the approach to, to uh, most resilience. Um, testing is still a challenge. Uh, even when you have all the right technologies, sometimes you can't get the numbers. Uh, there's IRB type uh, uh, restrictions. Um, you don't want to perform research on employees about productivity when they're just trying to be productive. Um, so the, the, the institute testing is sometimes challenging. Um, and then finally, the cost of, of being wrong is, is high, or the cost of change is high. Um, and so that's another misalignment with primary drivers. So whatever the issues are, though, the issue is clear that we don't yet have a built environment that supports this level of adaptability um, for the kind of experimentation that we need to be doing. Like, for Birchin's research, like to, to, to get this um, tested uh, in situ. So what this all really points to is a workplace um, that's comprised of the right vessels, I guess, or the right spatial experiments that enable, um, that enable us to be wrong, um, to switch pieces in and out, to get it wrong again, and then evolve with new users and, and new uses and do this all at low risk. Um, where we can treat the portfolio as a proving ground rather than a static asset. So in implementation, um, these problems of the vessel actually become primary um, because they're critical to, to exploring implementation at all. Um, and they're not easy problems to solve. Um, and the truth is that actually we invest a lot of resources in trying to solve this problem so that we can solve the other problems. Um, but there are some common drivers, things like cost. So in order to be successful, these can't be day one premiums. They have to be um, competitive with what we design and build today. 
Um, structure and acoustics really drive a lot of mass into the structure, which is incompatible with uh, being a flexible system. Um, mechanical and electrical systems are a challenge to work with because they are attached to the core in the shell. So we need to really decouple mechanical and electrical from the base building. Um, approvals like local jurisdictions, um, uh, they really need to be chassis for any experiments. So they have to really support any system that we want to test on them. Um, they, they also need to be a stealth threat, I guess, to the, to the way that things have been done instead of an overt threat. Um, lots of resistance to changing the status quo out there. Uh, and they also need to be data collection machines. So we have a version one out there in the world right now that's being piloted, version two coming soon. Um, I'll keep you posted. Uh, and uh, so I know that we're, um, I'm nearing time for me. Uh, and um, it's been a long day for everybody. And neuroscience would tell us that a working memory is probably at its limits and uh, that our cognitive capacity is waning. And so um, I think the point here is that we should be at liberty to get things wrong at low risk. Um, I mean, even with catacomb, the spatial experiment succumbed, albeit temporarily, uh, to one of those 100 mile per hour dust storms one afternoon. We were just at our most vulnerable from a structural shoring perspective and there was some damage. So, but we recovered and, and we finished and it was beautiful and it was imperfect and it was the right vessel for the experiment that we were running out there. Um, but actually it didn't really matter because we burned it. So it's gone. Um, just like those rooms that we'll experiment with in the future. Well, we probably won't burn them. Well, hopefully we won't burn them, um, <laughs> but we will demount them and remount, remount them and, and keep retesting. But I think the point is here that there's so much great research coming in. Like we just need a way to figure out ways to experiment in real space um, with the right vessels. And if we wait to do it perfectly, um, that would be very bad. The hu humans are counting on us right now to solve these problems. Okay. Thank you both. Um, I'll, I'll ask first if you have questions for each other. I have some starter question I'd like to pose, but if there's something um, between yourselves that you would like to kick off and have a discussion with, go for it. No, you can start, Matt. Okay, so I, I really like the, the contrast here and something that for myself is quite interesting. I um, I started in sculpture and I did a Bachelor of Fine Arts. So I really appreciate the art and uh, love this idea of, of uh, sculpture in this uh, large space and Burning Man. Um, and now most of my time is actually spent in, in research and this balance and difficulty in understanding uh, maybe for myself, I think for a lot of my students as well is as the ego of an architect or designer, you try to create something as an artist and you make a sculpture or a building and it means something and it has the narrative and it, and it comes loaded with this. And there's some meaning to that, especially we know the value from art and as Dan's been talking about this in, in his lecture, um, how you bring humans into it. And I, I wonder uh, maybe from Borchin uh, or Dan together in this, how do you balance between the scientific understanding of people and studying it and tracking everything? Uh, Virgin, you posed this, you know, what if the building could track everything that you do and we do this computational human simulation, uh, we have the ergonomics, we study it. And then some designer says, yeah, but let's, you know, let's make a giant wooden space that you could walk around and, and draw on the walls and do these things. And that conflicts with maybe, um, uh, clarity and not having noise around you and being able to be more productive in that happiness. So it's kind of an ambiguous question, but how do you balance between the two? Um, or do you think that it's not a problem? It's just obvious. Uh, I'll take that kind of as it, um, I don't, I, I don't really see it as a problem. I see them as like two different places to experiment. And the truth is like, 
when we talk about importing the principles of Burning Man to the workplace, we're not talking about like the morphologies or the dust or the costumes or the writing on the walls or the, the memorials. Like those are things that are just incompatible with, with workplace. I think it's really just thinking about the interior space of workplace being as experimental as the playa just within different bounds. Um, but I think you also have to acknowledge that there's a there's a human that existing that, that's existing on the playa and a human that's existing in the workplace. And those are those are not different humans. They're just those spaces are coded socially coded differently. So I so I think it's it's the the principles of experimentation, not necessarily the um, the the activities or the design solutions, I guess. I I agree with Dan. Um, <laughs> but like every other question, I think we're understanding the question even from our own perspectives. And if I can, if I interpreted your question correctly, I don't see creativity not being part of research or other solutions on the same token, I don't see solution driven or human centered um, uh, approaches being detrimental to creativity. I think these things can coexist together. And I think if they do, and if we can find that angle, uh, we will make a much bigger uh, leap. Uh, I, so that's that would be that because the way the question you asked, Matt, it sounded like they're two different things, but I don't see them as two different things. I think we have to bring those two things together as much as we can. Yeah, I think David uh, put his hand up to jump in. Um, I, I, it's it's a follow on question uh, from from Matt's in some ways to the both of you. Um, both great talks, by the way, so thank you for that. Um, on, on one hand, Dan, your talk is in some ways saying, let's not get bogged down in pure empiricism and, and, and accuracies, let's get moving with flexibility. And then on the other hand, uh, Birchin's work is always very scientific and extremely rigorous, and it's highly reliant on proving an empiricism. And so that's also where I sort of feel like Matt's question is, is relevant here. And there's sort of a, um, a nice tension between the two. And in a sense, the question might be, like, where do you guys draw the line between good is enough to make progress and move forward for, for very aligned actually objectives, I think, humans and well-beings and buildings and in, you know, in both cases, um, and where do you find the major barriers for for doing what you're doing in your own fields? Am I making sense? I think so. Maybe I can take a, a crack at answering that. I don't know if this is going to answer directly, but it, um, I think the reason that I default to like um, like let's let the research um, be rigorous in a different way than the built environment is, or, or than than workplace is different is because, you know, my experiences, and and this is like a, another really common example is like I want this space to be relaxing. What color do I paint it? And no one can answer that question. <laughs> You know, people say, well, typically red is activating unless you're, you know, a member of this particular culture that finds this very relaxing or, and, and so I think there's, there's a lot of equivocating and I feel like if you can test for the culture of like, for example, Twitter or Salesforce or Google rather than a human, um, then you in some ways liberate yourself from like having to have uh, um, like from from the scale of impact, meaning like um, painting something 
you know, red can have like this much impact rather than this much impact. Um, so I think it's just a way of, be so, so I guess that's why I kind of default to the, to the let's let research be and then make the built environment flex to accommodate it. I'll follow up to just um, clarify on, on some of these points as well. Something Dan, you were saying was, it sounded like, well, let's let Burning Man be Burning Man. That's that's different. I'm not saying you you weren't advocating that Burning Man becomes the workplace um, and, and the dust and the noise. I guess my question is more when people are designing the spaces, um, of course, you want to have some uh, narrative, some uh, artistic appreciation or understanding of that space or that environment. If they're always separate, is the proposal like we have one building is this is where you work, then you walk, uh, you know, 10 feet out the, the building and you're now in the re relaxation artistic approach. Where is the convergence uh, between those? And do you think that there's never a um, conflicting objective between relaxation and productivity um, between being able to understand or appreciate the space as a artwork? and being able to use the space as a person for very specific objectives. Is that also? Uh... Yeah. Yeah, but that's a very rigid, I think, definition of space. I, I don't think we have to assign um, objectives to each space or functions to each space. I think I think we can have multifunctional, multi-objective spaces that fulfill multiple goals. Um, I don't I don't think that was Dan's intention to separate uh, spaces distinctly. Um, but I will come back to something Dan said. Uh, <laughs> I think I can measure uh, what color of wall is uh, more relaxing. And I think in a way you're measuring as an artist as well, what is successful, what is relaxing, what is relieving, what is not. I think we can, I think you're doing this already, maybe not empirically as I show in my research, but there are measures of success in art as well. Um, and maybe an artist might not care, but I would, argue most artists do. So there, I mean, maybe I'm coming from a pure measurement perspective because in my world, and I said this to Dan in our conversation as well, if we can measure, how do we, how do we improve? So that's where I'm always coming from. Uh, but I, I think there are subjective ways of measuring things. Uh, and, and most architects and artists, I believe, are doing this, uh, even, even unintentionally. And then there are objective ways of doing this. But coming back to Matt's question, I think they coexist, those spaces and objectives. Yeah. Um, we'll see if, Dan, you have something? Yeah, I, I was just going to come back to sort of the comment about uh, s single purpose or highly specific spaces to like, uh, just to echo Burton's point, like um, in the workplace, we need spaces to work for focus and collaboration and real and restoration and, 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 and. So I think um, along with the flexibility comes a mechanism for being able to tune the space or personalize the space uh, to Burton's point, which then I think, you know, is the it's, that's the loop back to to happiness and satisfaction and less stress and um, uh, et cetera. So if, if there's a mechanism for being able to not have to approach that specificity uh, specificity out of the gate, um, then we should be pursuing those things. I think. How's the day? My question is sorry. My question is not going to be very cohesive, I had a long day, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. I was thinking about the, the, the amazing presentations that you both give, uh, both going for happiness, but so differently. And then I was thinking about um, this idea of like comfort, you know, like what is comfort? And, and in my line of work, it's much easier to actually focus on discomfort because we all agree what discomfort is, but comfort is really hard to, to pinpoint. How, what do you think about happiness? Is it would it be easier in your work to focus on the opposite of happiness, um, and and maybe then we'll have a better solution because it, it's really hard to 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 design for happiness. 
yeah uh, lack of something is always easier uh, <laughs> you know ha uh, health is measured as lack of sicknesses and that's easier to measure but i argue that that is an easier place to start but that's not where we want to go because there's so much more in happiness and comfort and health and all of those objectives that we want to go. And if we just look at it from the opposite end, I think we would bring uh, the target. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I really, I agree with that. I think um, it's okay to define fo focus as the removal of acoustic and and uh, visual distraction. But I think like when you begin to define happiness by the absence, you miss things that like magic and play. And I, like the, the, I don't know, the, like the effervescence or I, I don't know, of being I, like I'm starting to get uncomfortable because I don't have a way to describe it. Like what, you know, do, when you start to describe it, do you, st do you also start to kill it? um uh in a in a certain way thanks amber thanks matt um so i love that you guys have this interesting take on human plus um with regards to humans and the built environment but they're both approaching it sort of radically differently in particular i think it's fascinating the way that you Burton, have transformed the building into a kind of human character um, quite literally. Uh, and I am thinking about all the science fiction films in which, uh, you know, 2000 uh, Odyssey, et cetera, that like, you know, the idea of how the building becomes like aware um, has been presented. Uh, at any point did you hesitate in making the building totally anthropomorphic? Um, versus making it into something like the Microsoft Office Clippy, like the little paper clip that helps you. <laughs> um, because I do think of that, like the transformation of the building into a human condition, as opposed to something in between is, is pretty radical and weird, um, especially when you give it a body. No, I understand that very well. <laughs> <laughs> but Microsoft Clippy has been in my presentations to show exactly what it shouldn't be, because if I'm sure you remember, it didn't really understand a damn thing. <laughs> it was just so annoying. Uh, but I understand your point. I think it could be symbolized in different ways. Uh, it could be a pet. It could be something else that you, you like. There, the interesting question for me was if people would be open to uh, seeing buildings as living things or living beings. And, uh, and we actually that that research has multiple, multiple phases and we looked, we, we personalized we, those messages came from a building or those messages came from building manager. <laughs> through the same virtual agent that you've seen. And, uh, and we looked at the differences. Only when social talk started, like buildings started to talk like a human, I know you're not asking this, that people started agreeing more that this could be a building versus a facility manager talking to you. It's so interesting that that sliding scale uh, uh, was, was interesting to see. Um, I think, yeah, a building could be personalized in different ways and, and it could be different things. Uh, there it was the contrast that I was really interested in because we approach as a text message and we approach with voice as well, uh, like without anybody. And then we approach to the occupants with this virtual agents. In all cases, the female virtual agent was the most liked one and, uh, and obeyed one. And our psychologist friends explained to us that it's always the women voice. And then I was like really curious about like, why, why women voice? And then you, you see this in your navigation and, and other places, usually it's the women voice. And then they explained that in our, our mother's wound, we're really hearing the, the female voice. So we're already conditioned before birth to listen to a woman. That was their explanation. I don't know if I buy it, but uh, it it was over two hundred people. It was like dominantly this way. 
Sorry, I didn't answer your question directly. No, you but totally you did. I, just, I think it's interesting to think that it brings in all of these other bias that you know, we hear in like Apple just now saying that they won't default to a woman's voice anymore, that we bring bias to buildings you know, stylistically as well. Um, and so now to extend that into you know, the bias that we might have against the building's anthropomorphic characterization, um, I think it's like it puts a lot of like more stress on the designer to think about how your building becomes a, a, a person. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's so much research to do there. I mean, that's just scratching the surface. I find it fascinating. And I don't want you to do Clippy, by the way. I'm just thinking. <laughs> that was one of my questions on specifics was going to be if you try to get like Hall, you know, the same thing as, as Amber. As long as you, so that why, why have a person or, you know, could you just have a, a glowing orb that was kind of uh, pulsating, but still saying those same things? It's really interesting. David? Cool. Oh, um, one one uh, comment question from me to the two of them, but there's also some uh, that we can't forget in the Q and A. Um, you you you're both in different parts of your portfolio of work focused on the work environments. Uh, Dan, I suspect you're very focused on the work environments to to be determined. And Bertrand, you've obviously been working on commercial and work environments. Um, and what I thought was really interesting uh, from Dan's talk was how prefab modularity, as well as I'm sure work that you've been involved in over the last six years in terms of the other stuff, has led to this, this thinking of, of breaking it down so that there's the implicit flexibility through this modular approach. Um, and then I, if I try to conjoin what I know about Bertrand's work, like, there's also these opportunities for learning in these uh, more flexible, modular, uh, compact uh, real life experiments in a sense. And I guess it's a, a way for me to ask, I, I, are you both thinking about the integrations of uh, the kinds of systems that let's say Birchin develops and the kinds of systems you've implemented in the, the other big buildings and shoreline, et cetera, um, to the point where you'll be able to learn from these data streams as part of whether it's a business or a research lab. So David, is, it, is, is the distinction between workplace and other typologies or, uh, or is it the learning aspect? It's the learning. I mean, you're both working on workplaces in, in some respects. And how much are you thinking about incorporating uh, what you can learn from the human subject, from our occupants, as part of uh, playing out that flexibility. Yeah. So one thing is, one thing that I think, although I think Bertrand might have just given us a solution for it, is that the is data collection is actually really hard, um, and you know, in part because you have to figure out what data it is, then you have to have the right tools to be able to collect it. But then even if you've got those things, you have to convince people that their privacy isn't being violated and, and that this isn't like part of some insidious, uh, you know, data collection effort that compromises their privacy, et cetera. But I think, um, so yeah, I mean, we're all interested in the data. It's hard to get sometimes. Although I do think that if built, I mean, building is human, especially as uh, the, the Ellie character that you presented, is very disarming. And um, so I think, you know, there, th there may be something there. And I, it also, it facilitates a different interaction with, with the building, like a partnership, um, instead of a, you know, a, you know, unilateral big brother standing over your shoulder, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, and I agree with Dan said 100% being the researcher out there trying to collect data. This, I mean, every slide was a project or multiple projects and each one of them takes about six months to nine months to get approvals. Uh, forget about like starting the project that Dan mentioned the IRB process, how difficult it is. Um, I would love to collect more data uh, outside the lab and some of those projects are outside, but not all of them and collect more ubiquitously. 
And, um, and I, I am not married to any type of building. Yes, workplace is uh, a building or offices are of interest because of my personal interest. Um, but also they're in a way easier to collect data from, uh, right, uh, admittedly. But uh, I, I don't see, and, and if I understand your question, I think that learning could be carried forward, right? I mean, if, if, if I can track a person in, its, in his or her built environments, in, in a classroom, in, in, a, in, a, in a grocery store, in, in his home, in his office, I'm envisioning these profiles to be carried in their pocket. So I, I don't think that this it's attached to more of, to a person and the building adapts to a person than there are profiles or, or things that we learn in a building space. Uh, the objectives change and that makes it complicated, uh, but it's, it's definitely possible, I think, with the technology uh, we have. It requires a lot of collaboration. I think there are many architects here, uh, but collaboration with engineers, computer scientists, and social scientists to be able to understand the impact of environments uh, on humans and, and what you design and implement on uh, your occupants. So, so Bershin, are you advocating then for tracking, does learning then become a packet of information that actually tracks the user around? Like it, it's like you have your, it's in your iPhone uh, or whatever, you give the room access to your calendar. It knows that you like dim light when you're trying to be creative and that you like bright light when you're trying to be focused and that you like cool light or you, you like view. I mean, is that is that kind of what, what you would advocate for? Or? I, I think I'm, I'm advocating for a flexible system, not a system that is attached to a location, uh, but it is attached to a person. So that person can carry that profile from one place to another uh, because we don't, and we are not going to be working in the fixed spaces that we used to anymore anyway, right? I mean, I don't know how much I'm going to be using my office. I will actually start having two offices plus my home office. So I cannot really think about this around just one specific space in, in, in my view. I have to think about this around a person. And this is going to affect how the buildings are, I think, going to be uh, designed as well. I think we're going to see these mixed typologies or multi-purpose spaces that are more flexible. I think this is where I mean, it's pandem before pandemic, I think we were going there, but the pandemic really accelerated this thinking. So we have we have a question from uh, some participants for Birchin. Uh, where were the robots applied out of the labs? The, uh, I think they were talking the, about the, the VR uh, teleoperated uh, robotic onsite construction. Those were demolition robots. So in demolition tasks that we have uh, used them, but we, I mean, the, the, there could be different robots that are being used. Uh, we also wanted to experiment with the masonry, uh, semi-autonomous masonry robot, uh, but we did uh, implement it on a demolition robot because of the tax complexity and the danger around uh, demolition tasks. Were, were these, uh as a lab study that it was a demolition robot outside or you actually put it on a real demolition site? We, it is a, it's a mixed uh, method. So it was in a lab, but also it was in the, in the real world as well. Thank you. Because I was interested in the carryover effect from the VR environment to the real environment. Uh, I hope Toro that answered the question for you. Um, I guess I would also like to ask, do you have a favorite building that encompasses all the things that you have researched and studied and what you're interested in? Is there something that you'd say, oh, you really got to visit this building because they did it the best so far? Uh <laughs> <laughs> Dan, do you want to take that? I'm sure you thought about that more than I did. Um, I think, you know, what I'll say is, and I, you know, I'm, I made it clear, I, um, 
you know, a lot of the work that I did, a lot of the attitudes that I've developed around this work I formed uh, while I was at Google, an amazing uh, experience. I think that they are doing great work. And I think that when the new campus buildings open up, I think those will be great examples of what you're talking about. I don't have a particular building in mind. Uh, I think quite opposite, uh, like as I was framing it, my research started from the absence of things. I was always called I was always uncomfortable, <laughs> unsatisfied, and these horrible engineering buildings that I'm like, I need to do something about this <laughs> in my own way. Uh, yeah, the more flexible a building is, the better it is for me. But I think we all judge buildings in different ways. Uh, so I haven't seen a, yet a smart building that would satisfy me uh, to the degree that I would like. Uh, so why, why is that? Because I think at some point, Virgin, you did mention we have the technology, like we do have the ability to do some of these things or, or a lot of them. Is it still a lack of knowledge or confidence in us making the building saying we really do know the best way to make it or, or a better way than what others have done? Or this question to both of you, what, what's stopping us from making it? It has two, two reasons. And, and I, I don't know if Dan would agree with me. Uh, one is financial. Okay, uh, I don't think we have enough return on investment studies to show that investing in buildings in this way is going to return some kind of a benefit or whatever that is, right? Again, you have to quantify these things. But the second thing, in my opinion, is we do not demand this from our buildings. We are very used to seeing our buildings dumb and like, that's it. I mean, there's, there needs to be a mind shift. I think there needs to be an expectation. And I think it's going to happen because if you can't log into a website more than three seconds, you get frustrated now. So I think this, this effect must uh, carry over to our built environments. I think it's just brick and mortar and with no brain. And I, I personally don't understand why people don't demand more from their built environments. Yeah, I would, I, I would really agree. I think it's, I mean, I think it's very simply a, a, an issue of cost. But I also think like Birchin and I have our work cut out for us because, you know, I, I think, it, you know, partnerships like, uh, you know, um, are going to be the way that we actually get these things um, introduced. Like, uh, I do think this is another place where workplace is a really great uh, starting point for this work because as people are acculturated to buildings that respond, they begin to demand it in other aspects, you know, in other, in other buildings that they inhabit, like then they want it in their house, you know? And if you look at the, you know, how um, awareness about uh, healthy materials percolated into homes, it really came from the workplace, from, you know, from people making decisions in the workplace and then people carrying that outside of the workplace. So I think um, the workplace will be key. And I think that um, partnerships between um, researchers and, uh, and industry will also be key. Just and getting, uh, get, the cost way down. Just getting back to the happiness thing, I'll say Getty Museum. I, I really loved going to the Getty Museum in LA. And it was just a great experience. Um, it was not a smart building, probably still isn't, but uh, uh, that embodied a lot of things that I think bring happiness for me anyway. Yeah, I don't think happiness needs to be technology driven. I agree with you. Actually, when Matt asked that question, I was hardly thinking, what is the building, what is the building? And what I remember is like, uh, <clears throat> south of france or somewhere in france and a building that was built 100 years ago <laughs> that, that has the qualities of the getty museum i i can connect those two now it's very low tech but it's also flexible and it has natural ventilation lots of views uh, and uh, a comfortable place so could that be the workplace of the future well, first we need to start with operatable windows. <laughs> Until I achieve this in this country, I'm not going to be. <laughs> I'm not going to be happy. No offense, but good luck with that. 
<laughs> the other thing I, I I'll just add if um, if there's time, uh, I was just trying to put this together a bit with the earlier keynote uh, from Upali about um, her objection to the idea of post occupancy study, and so um, I'm thinking that. Uh, the thing that could tie together some of these these ideas is a is a pre occupancy study. Uh, we did an office project here in Toronto a few years ago, and and we were, we were fortunate enough to know who was going into the new office, and so we could ask them all these questions about what makes them comfortable. Do they like a dark work style or a light work style? Do they like uh, being close to these different amenities and things like that? So that was a really um, maybe rare thing, but. Uh, if we can um, uh, think about something like that becoming a, 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 a part of our process, maybe that'll be something that can be effective. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I kind of think of Birchin's work as like the pre-occupancy study in some ways. You know, it's um, research that can be scaled to something, you know, uh, potentially much larger through partnership. Um. Um, I, I, um, Birch and I, I want to actually add something else to, to Azam's question, which I was thinking about the same exact thing uh, with Upali's uh, presentation, but I was thinking also about the post-occupancy part and the fact that that is actually something we also need a lot more of because I think I had this conversation with Dan uh, about um, Ernest Codman, where like 100 years ago, he was a physician and he said, every time we do a surgery, we have to go back to our patient to make sure that the procedure that we've done, um, if it worked or not, and if it didn't, and why not, right? And I think that why not part is, is something that is missing in, in architecture because a lot of time our work stops at when, you know, when the building is built and then we're done. So we have no idea what worked, you know? Um, so I think also taking it over and figuring out, did it work? And if not, why not? That's also something that I think is missing right now. Absolutely. I wasn't in the previous keynote, unfortunately, but uh, I, 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 yes, post occupancy studies and the feedback back to the architects and engineers definitely is needed. One of the problems with post occupancy studies is not only they're rare, they're done only once and on a short term basis. To, to be feeling comfortable and satisfied and healthy and this and that uh, in your space, you really need longer term long studies, right? It's not a one time thing. Uh, and coming back to Azam's uh, pre-occupancy, 100% Azam, 100% we should do those pre-occupancy studies and bring it back to the architects and designers. But I will ask you a question in that building in Toronto, how many of the users stayed in that building and how many have left? Uh, good question. I mean, everybody's, it's empty now, of course, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, the one anecdote I have is that because, um, because it was a generative design process, uh, it was a unique thing again that the design actually took everybody's input from the survey into account. And so when I was walking around one time, uh, there was a lady sitting, um, uh, most of the office was empty, but there was a lady sitting there who I know. And I asked her, you know, how do you, how do you like the new office? It's been a few months. And she said, oh, I wish I was you know, closer to the windows, to the light here, this kind of dark side of the thing. And I said, I know, I'm, I'm sorry, but your, your whole team voted for dark work style. Um, and she said, yeah, I know those, those bastards. <laughs> so, uh, she understood that, you know, it was, it was, it was not us imposing some, some design arbitrary thing on, on them. They, you know, that she was part of a team that selected that. So it's interesting to have the other, um, in terms of embodying the building, to have you know uh, uh, an understanding from the occupants that they were part of the conversation and ideally it would be ongoing. Will, will buildings aim to be more like cars at some point uh, where in a car we've had a long history in, in human simulation, ergonomics and the fine control adaptability in, in car design, industrial design, we talk about being able to separate temperature 
with chairs literally next to each other. And architecture, we're trying to figure out how to separate temperature from, from rooms next to each other. Um, do, you, do you see this as a way to make it a generalized environment? Is that um, something we can, we can learn from or is it, uh, do, does architecture need a different approach than what design or industrial design, product design has, has gone with? I think from human perspective, yes, I hope, but from other perspectives, God, no. I mean, <laughs> there's, look at the designs of the cars. I mean, they all look the same to me. Uh, and there's very little creativity in, in car design, in my opinion. It's optimized for safety and cost. I wouldn't want to live in buildings like uh, the cars we're driving, but I think from incorporation of human needs perspective, if that could be married with the creativity that we're looking for, that would be the best uh, kind of marriage. Yeah, I might say on that point, I think what's interesting about a car to me is that like, you know, uh, like BMW has, you know, one or two or three chassis that actually support every one of their cars. Um, so there's, there's an efficiency there um, that can be leveraged in the creation of things that are different from each. I mean, granted, like to Burton's point, they like the X3 from the three series from the what, like whatever those things are like they they're they're not all that different when you think of them in the world of morphologies, but they do enable uh, variation within a range. So I think there's I think there's something there's something there. I mean, if you think of um, a wall is rather the same all the time. And so uh, can that become, you know, a chassis in the way that a car chassis is. I think the other, the other thing that's interesting about cars is um, that, and this is like a little bit in the weeds, it's just, it's been on my mind lately, but the, all of the parts are designed to fit in very small places. <laughs> so I just think of like the scale of uh, of building materials and how like that scale and heft and mass actually lends a lot to how it's inflexible. So I think that there are things that we should be learning from the uh, automotive industry in terms of scaling things down, distributing things in, in smart ways. I think, um, I think the next session is coming up soon. Maybe we have time for another uh, question or two. I'll defer to David Amber. What's our timing like? Um, we're supposed to give people a break. Uh, we have four minutes, I guess. <laughs> uh, bef bef before any last question, though, I, I want to thank both of you and Matt as well uh, and Azadeh for um, putting together this set of speakers. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think I have one last question, which goes back to an earlier question, really, about this notion of learning loops in your respective fields or, or projects um, and how the modularity in particular with Dan's uh, projects, I think enables a new kind of learning loop, right? You embed some amount of sensing and data, but as you start to change and you iterate on whatever this workplace product may be, um, you'll be able to learn faster than others, is my suspicion. You'll get differences in the data sets and you'll have challenges for how you do comparisons if you're working with data scientists, but you'll be able to iterate quickly by making changes to modular design, but also by incorporating or taking that data as uh, drivers of the design. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, friction is our enemy. So, um, yeah, so every, so every speed advantage is uh, taken. It's going to be soft. <laughs> um, again, thanks to the both of you. Really, really appreciate your contributions today. Uh, we're all thankful. It's fantastic. And um, we're coming to Burning Man, just so you know, heads up. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thank, thank you, you, Dan. Thank you, Bertrand. Great presentations. Fabulous way to have a Friday end of day.
uh, keynote. Really appreciated the dialogue. Thank you. Very fun. So I think that we'll do is we'll have a quick pause. I will share screen and put up the um, session six um, setting and we'll do our transition into the last paper session of the day. Thank you again. So just a reminder, if you are a presenter in this session, if you would raise your hands, we will promote you to panelists and that will allow you to speak and share your screen. Um, so just give us a second to do that and then we'll be able to begin. Hi, Kintia. Good to see you. Hello. Good to see you too. <laughs> As a day, I think I got demoted. I'm not a co-host anymore, so I'm counting on you to be doing the shifting. Oh, what happened? What did you get demoted? Uh, I think I had to break out of the Zoom and come back. Okay. I, I, sh I moved everybody anyways, so we're good. <laughs> um, great. You do this right. manually every time. Well, otherwise we would have, like this way we could have the same Zoom throughout. That's very clever, yeah. <laughs> um, Azadeh, uh, I think Karen Kinsick is presenting if you wanna um, translate her into a panelist. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't see the, the hand raise. Sorry, Karen. And is anybody else? If like if you're the chat. Yeah, if you're presenting, please raise your hand. Uh, I don't have the list in front of me. I'm actually not presenting. I'm just double checking that both of my former students are here. That ZU is here and Janet is here. They are both supposed to be doing their own presentations. I'm just here to make sure they're here. Could you please repeat the name of the first one? Um, ZU. I don't think they are here. At uh, least as a um, as a panelist, not yet, but maybe. Okay, because if he does not come, I do have a copy of his presentation. And if I only have four minutes, I can talk about anybody's presentation in four minutes. <laughs> that's that's the spirit. I've been pleasantly surprised at like how much information people are getting into four minutes. It's been great, actually. Is that uh, the person with ZJX? Is that your student, Karen? Um, I don't different? know what they're coming in as. Um, I have two of them. One is Z-H-I-H-E, Z -H -I -H -E, also called the Janet. Um, and then the other one is Z. -U -Z you Lou, and he said he was going to be here, but he's on China time right now, so it's like the middle of the night. Right. And yeah. So JX is somebody else. That's Jiang. That's not one of mine. Yes. <laughs> but if he doesn't and show up, I'll do it anyway. I'll just do it for him. And then you had a quick presentation that you wanted to do to sort of like bring us into this last page for a session. So why yeah. don't you go ahead and start that and we will on the back end try to make sure that this um, is smoothed out. And, and Karen, if you'll be ready to go in case um, ZU doesn't show up. I'll do that. Thanks. Perfect. And thanks, Amber. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AR and VR session of CMOD. So my name is Kintia Hamlafori. I will be chairing this session. We have six presentations, all presenting new and exciting applications regarding augmented and virtual reality. Also, uh, something that uh, not many might know, which is DR, uh, so for removing uh, objects in order to, uh, for a machine, in order to use it then in AR and VR. And we also have presentations on modeling complex relationships at the urban scale. So if um, 
uh, Karen is ready, then um, maybe before that, uh, overall, uh, as you've seen also in the previous uh, sessions, presentations take either four or eight minutes. We have a strict schedule, so please be mindful of the time um, of your presentation. I will let you know if you're over your allotted time. There will be a dedicated Q&A session after the presentations. Feel free to write in the chat if you have any comments. And Karen, uh, if you're ready, we'll start then with a paper, Visualizing and Editing Mechanical Systems with a Mobile Augmented Reality Application, presented by Karen Kensek. Okay, let me <laughs> share the screen. Yes, perfect. Okay, do you see the using building information modeling with augmented reality? Yes, um, ZU is my former student. He is the one who is supposed to be presenting it, but I guess he overslept in China this morning. But I can present his work. This work was done as part of his Master of Building Science thesis at USC. Um, he worked with me. He also worked with Margaret Moser, who's in the School of Cinema at USC. And the idea of what he was working with, and why isn't this advancing? I'll just click. Would you like maybe to put it in full screen so that we see? No, it it's having oh. problems with my keyboard. Okay. okay. So no I'm going problem. to have Sorry. to do this. <laughs> I, I, in case you had the more. Yeah. So if you want to learn more about his thing, you can read his thesis. But essentially, there were the five main parts here there's the background of why he did it, the problem what he ended up doing, a case study of what he did, and then some conclusions. Now, the thing that he thought was there's facilities management and they're getting a lot of new tools, especially now with these digital twins and things like that. And building information modeling is pretty common in architecture firms, construction firms, and things like that. And there are different ways that you can connect up building information modeling to use facilities management. And he has some examples of the Echo Domus um, project that's listed there. The problem is, is when you actually try to do something in the real world, you can't have your facilities manager or custodian or, or mechanical engineer sitting at the computer, then running over to the building and pulling up a tablet, and maybe looking at there. So he was thinking of how augmented reality could be used in this respect. And this is really nothing new. The idea of using augmented reality, the overlay things, on a real world, both virtual reality and augmented reality, or claiming no newness in his project at all in what he did with that part of his project. And But you can see that there's a problem here that in most VR programs and AR programs, it's a one-way direction. You make the thing, you look at it, then you run over to your BIM station and you change it on the BIM station. So what he wanted to do was try to think of a way to have a bi-directional exchange of data between the BIM data and the, well, the BIM data in the BIM and the BIM data in the augmented reality. So he wrote a little app for his iPad um, that would allow him to take things from Revit through Unity through a mobile augmented reality device and then be able to do it backwards again. So it's a very simple prototype, but allows him to change the, a piece of mechanical equipment in augmented reality, change it there and have it send the data back into Revit. And so he has the building information model. He has to do both the geometry transfer and the metadata transfer, that being the more important part in the case of his thesis do a whole bunch of things in AR to make it work, and then be able to send access, he did it through Dropbox, the information back again through Dynamo to update in Revit. And you can sort of see what it looks like here. Um, it looks better on his screen, but there's a welcome page. You can scan the image, load the model, get it lined up. You can select objects, change their colors, hide, unhide them, change their parameters, change the objects parameters, all in the AR app, and that information will get sent back. And this is sort of what it looks like visually. So the biggest problems he was having was trying to get his model lined up. There's a whole section in his thesis about how to get the virtual model lined up with real life. 
but he managed to do that at the one-to-one -one scale and then look at it and you can pop things up and change the things that I had mentioned. And then it ends up back for Dynamo and then Dynamo loads it back and does it into Revit. And so he did a simple example where he showed an old model going into VR, changing the location of the piping and the updated model was shown in there as well. So in conclusion, it showed what is unusual but will become much more common is a bi-directionality between BIM and augmented reality. And I hope I'm under four minutes. <laughs> Uh, almost perfect. Thank you very much, Karen. So now a uh, presentation by another one of your students. Uh, so Jiho Wang and the paper Augmented Reality in Room Acoustics, a simulation tool for mobile devices with auditory feedback. And I've heard you're also called Janet. So please uh, feel free to share your screen. Janet, thank you very much. Can you see it right now? Yes, all perfect. Okay, great. Let me... Okay, great. Hello, everyone. This is Zhuhe Wang from University of Southern California. This topic, Augmented Reality in Room Acoustics, was my thesis project of master degree. And I'm very more than happy to share the achievements so far. We are now very familiar with AR technology. It has been used in many ways in our daily life. However, all these usages are for visual sense, but the visual sense is only a part of the reality. So what about other senses? For example, the auditory sense. On the other hand, most of the current simulation tools for room acoustics are model-based. There has to be a step for modeling the room, even for the room that already existed. And most of these tools are aimed at acoustic experts, which can be too hard for ordinary people to use. Therefore, I developed this easy-use room acoustic simulation tool, which named as Sounder. It's a tool on mobile platforms using AR technique to simulate some simple acoustic performances based on existing room and virtual sound sources, and then provide auditory results, which means the users can actually hear it. The current Sounder 1.0 is aimed at small, enclosed, and simple rooms. Sounder is designed for non-experts, and it can be used in many daily occasions. Sounder is designed for both iOS and Android systems and used Unity as a development platform. AR Foundation was the SDK used in Unity to create AR environment. Steam Audio was used as the audio renderer. The structure of Sounder is theme-based. It also used a modular design method. Each module focused on one simple function. So now let's meet the prototype of Sounder and see what it can do. Uh, when we start Sounder, it firstly shows the logo and the reminder to make sure the users are wearing their earphones. Then it guides the users to calibrate the volume settings of their devices. The calibration plays a constant sound. It guides the user to, uh, to turn up or turn down their devices to make sure the simulation will later will play in a proper and more realistic volume. Then we start to set up the room. The room is built up by floor vertices and the ceiling height. Default materials are assigned to each surfaces. To change the material, we can go to the edit mode and change it by touching the surface. This prototype has only limited material options of each type of surface. More options will be added in future versions. After the room is set up, it goes to the sound source setup. By touching the screen, a new sound source is generated at the position of the phone camera. Then point the check mark we can hear the result of the simulation and will show the decibels of the sound source. If we don't like the current sound pressure level, we can go to the edit mode to change it to another value. It has different options for the sound file, including impulse, constant sound of 500 hertz, music, and the voice of, the, of both male and female. Madam, this is the best. By pointing the plus button on the up corner, it can add multiple sound sources. Each sound source can play with individual sound pressure level and sound file. Madam, this is the best. The sound sources can be temporarily muted. Madam, this is the best. Or completely deleted. The location of the sound source is also adjustable. 
so we can move it around to any position. Here comes the most exciting part, the simulation. Sounder firstly records the background noise for three seconds and plays it with the simulation result. This provides a more accurate sound pressure level calculation and more realistic sound feedback. The scale of the corner shows the reverberation time of the room and the real-time sound pressure level of what the user heard. When we go closer, it turns louder. And when we go further, it sounds quieter. The auditory feedback is also binaural, which means we can tell relatively position of the sound source based on what we hear. But unfortunately, we can't hear the binaural feedback in this video since my phone could only record screen in single soundtrack at that time. Yeah, I'm sorry. Based on the current framework, more functions can be added to the app, which can provide more options and more flexibilities. And beyond this, there are more possibilities. Finally, I would like to thank my committee members for their help during my research, and thank you all for your time and attention. Please feel free to contact me if you're interested or if there's any questions. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. So the next presentation is by Jiaxing Zhang, and it's named Image-Based Cityscape Visualization with Automatic Object Removal and Facade in Painting Using Semantic Segmentation and Generative Adversarial Networks. I'm keeping my questions to all of you for later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can, can you get my voice? Yes, all good. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to discuss with you and share my work. Uh, I'm Jackson Zhang, and I come from Osaka University. And my paper's title uh, is Image-Based Cityscape Visualization with Automatic Object Removal and for some Handy Using Semantic Segmentation and Generative Adversary Networks. And now I'm going to introduce my work. And I, I, want, I would like to present my research in four parts. And uh, perceiving good environments is important for enhance our life quality. Assessing the impact of, of the removing specific objects on their surroundings played an important role in the development. And there were many facades obscured by landscape objects. And uh, sometimes we need to visually remove them to get complete information. An example is figure one shoes. And previous object removal in architecture and urban design typically require requiring a user to create a mask around the unwanted objects manually and obtain background information in advance, which would be able inten intensive when implementing multitasking projects. And uh, in addition, you can see the video, suppose AI is simulated while there are still old structures or people appearing here. And in that case, the 3D objects will be intermingled with the existing objects. So the miniature reality technology can be used in conjunction with AR to solve this problem. And uh, so this study would like to pre present uh, image-based cityscape visualization as a to uh, automatically delete the unwanted objects over the street level sense while removing them by impending the blank without getting back background information in advance. And so you can see my uh, overall workflow of this study. And uh, the first, we need to collect the facade pictures as chain data. And those pictures can be obtained from the street view services and be cleaned by a classifier. And using the classifier to divide them into building facade, facade with unwanted objects and no facade. And then the unwanted objects uh, can be detected by a semantic segmentation algorithm based on the uh, cityscape's data set. And finally, we introduce a free form image impending to a called deep theory to, to fill the detected blank with contextual attention. And the figure three shows the labels that can be detected and removed in this study, including pedestrian, a rider, coronary, and cars. To achieve such impending, we used 8,000 uncrudited 
facade images to chain the uh, game-based image independent model. And the figure four shows the loss of generator and discriminator of model. As the generator and discriminator reach balance, and the overall performance of the work steadily improves. And uh, after chain the game model with street view images, we used the model to conduct the removal test on the pedestrian rider, granary, and the cars in, in the street level sense. And the figure five shows the object removal results, comparing our method with the ground shoes images. In figure five A and D, people and uh, car removal, uh, they, they all synthesize realistic images with seamless boundary transitions. And in Figure five C and the proposed model can uh, correctly identify the skyline from the input pictures into the real station. And the color of the facade materials is also close to the ground shoes. And uh, this is a demo for uh, vegetation and digital removal with pre processing. And in the write-up in the semantic uh, semantic video, and in the write-up in the ground shows video, and in the left one in the synthesized video, and this method uh, do not need to get the background information in advance. And this is the vegetation remover demo, and you can see. The synthesized video can correctly identify the skyline from the input into the real station. But uh, there are some limitations of the, this method. For example, this method cannot automatically detect the shadows and remove them. Because our detect, object detection training set without detecting the object shadows, an example is show in the in this video and the uh, pedestrian shadow is not removed from the frame this shortcoming can be solved by tagging the ob object shadows in the chain set of the object detection and in conclusion the visualization technology offers a communication channel for experts and non-experts helping create consensus on future urban environment design our method can evaluate the impact of environmental changes on visual perception, improve information degradation as stakeholders exchange opinions, and have public engagement in the discussion of redevelopment projects. And the validation results prove that our system is workable and cost efficient. And in the future work, the method will be applied to data augmentation by Filling the missing information for SIG analysis. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Jushin. And uh, thank you also, all of you, for being perfectly on time. And uh, it's very interesting also how all these three first presentations fit together with uh, AR, in, uh, with visual and uh, audio and also removing obstacles to, to make this even better. So the next presentation is from Shreelita Gopalakrishnan, and I see you there. And it's called <laughs> Mapping Emergent Patterns of Movement and Space Use in Vertically Integrated Urban Developments. So please go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Katya. Um, yeah, interestingly, I think I will be deviating from um, part of what they've been sharing. It's a little different uh, yes. where we are coming from. Um, so can you all see my screen? Yes, all perfect. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to share our ongoing research on mapping emergent patterns of movement and space use in vertically integrated urban developments. So this paper actually presents um, our ongoing, and I mean in progress research project at SUTD that uses a complexity science based uh, approach to quantitatively analyze the network effects of vertically integrated mixed use urban developments on human movement and space use. We actually use uh, Kampong Admiralty, a first of its kind development in Singapore that integrates housing for the elderly with a wide range of social, healthcare, communal, commercial, and retail facilities as a case study. 
So urban complexity normally um, investigates three fundamental dimensions uh, to understand the interactions between space users and the built environment. So it's spatial configuration, the human mobility, and the co-presence, the aggregation. So we also base our study on these three uh, stages. The first stage is to do the spatial network framework, the, followed by human mobility mapping, and then going on to create the aggregated network. Now, our ongoing study, we have completed stage one, and stage two and three are in progress. Um, and once we compare, uh, once we get the stage two and three completed, we can compare the real world data with the spatial networks which we have established in stage one. So the analysis actually for the spatial network allows us to quantify the specific network measures. Uh, they are understood as the effectiveness of the various functions of the node or the cluster of the network structure. So in this case, our uh, nodes are considering two attributes, which is space types and the level where it's located. Um, and the edges are basically the shortest routing distance to the edges of spaces. Um, so based on the above classification, we can identify about 124 nodes, which are connected with 389 edges. And we study these measures for centrality and structure. Centrality, of course, gives us the significance of the nodes and the connectivity strength. And the structure tells us how the system would behave uh, as a system in itself. So uh, an example is really like when we overlay these measures into a spatially embedded physical uh, space. So we see that certain measures help us to understand like which is the very center of the network from where every space can be reached within a 50 meter shortest distance or uh, whether a space which is very connected, is it placed really centrally in a building or is it really acentric? You know? So it kind of helps us to understand the effectiveness of it. But apart from studying the nodes, we also need to understand how the links work, right? Like how do, how do these places work in terms of the route? So a 3D network link model is generated to analyze the root strength and the linking of the nodes within the development. This we use uh, to correlate uh, the different strengths and also relate them to the movement and the behaviors of the spaces. So we use a toolkit developed by Cardiff, the SDNA, to do the 3D spatial network analysis for this. The stage two of, uh, I mean, the stage two of it is, of course, the human mobility mapping for which we are uh, in, the pro in the process of actually collecting data. So there are two, process, two uh, approaches. So we collect uh, the inflow and outflow volumes of different times of the day using infrared sensors, people counters. And then we also use low energy Bluetooth uh, beacons to map the way people move in the space. So that uh, uses uh, this uh, peer to environment sensing. So there is a sensor which is connected to a smartphone app, which is then installed in the participant sample. And then we are able to collect the data which can then be used to localize. Uh, once that's done, we will be aggregating the network into the social spatial uh, analysis. So thus, exploring the urban social spatial networks as complex networks facilitates a better understanding of how individual components of the, uh, of the network perform within a larger system and their potential to influence and adapt the future changes in the built environment. Um, the overlay, of course, helps us to also get further insights into the relationship between the spatial measures and the actual space use patterns. And analyzing these correlations provides further insights in the spatial factors that influence the user space interactions. Yeah, and uh, I look forward to sharing more information on this once we complete the case study. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. And the next presentation is by Sabrina Lavmoski and it's titled A Holistic VR Application for Feedback Collection During Collaborative Sessions with Stakeholders. Sabrina, Hi, uh, I see you there, so. Yes. <laughs> I don't see yourself, but I see your background. You don't see me? No. <laughs> hmm. Oh, I have a pen. <laughs> ah, uh -huh. Wow, magic. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. And I see your screen. Perfect. Perfect. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, all good. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Sabrina Namowski. I'm a, de a design researcher with Kieran Timberlake, and I'll be uh, presenting our short paper, a holistic VR application for feedback collection during collaborative sessions with stakeholders. Working with VR during the architectural design process led us to the conclusion 
Um, architectural VR walkthrough sessions are disordered and collecting meaningful data from these sessions is difficult. In this image, we have a collaborative stakeholder session in VR with two VR users, one VR leader and a room of spectators watching on a projector. With a meeting like this, it's impossible not to miss some feedback with hand note taking. So we searched for VR tracking software, but came up short. Because data from existing VR tracking applications is not collected with architectural design in mind. Um, many applications focus on marketing or increasing in-app advertisement, visibility, um, things that are not related to architecture. So when we organize data through the lens of architectural practice, data from VR sessions, we can create actionable insights that foster user-centered designs. We wanted answers to questions like, were users comfortable in VR? Did users effectively tour the model? Which room generated the most interest? Is the approach to wayfinding legible? Does the layout support desired interactions between people, et cetera? With this in mind, we designed a proof of concept application for collecting, organizing, and structuring quantitative data collected during an architectural VR session using Unity and the Oculus Quest. We identified a range of collectible in-app user data that might have some value to project teams who are evaluating design options, including the states of the buttons and current room location. By structuring this data around user and time, we can make zoomed out comparisons between users and sessions and come to novel insights about how users perceive our designs. The application structure is as follows. Once you open the application, you'll be shown the splash screen, which will allow you to select either a walkthrough or a replay. When choosing the walkthrough, the session is recorded and written to a JSON. After exiting the walkthrough, you can select replay and watch uh, previous walkthroughs. Replays can be viewed in both first and third person, with third person uh, containing more data overlays. Here's a quick demo of the replay aspect of the application. So we start out, uh, we go into third person. You can see the users on the bottom right with their gaze lines, that's where they're looking. The bottom, you can see the uh, timeline that's uh, scrollable. Uh, you can also change visibility of trail lines and gaze lines in the upper left hand. And uh, here we can see we turned off the trail lines. Uh, we can also turn it off different sessions or different users and watch um, them just go one at a time. Uh, we can also view a uh, previous session in first person and get a full recreation of what uh, a user experienced in the VR model and, and fully understand it that way. If you want more information on our methods, data structure, and plans for future uses, please read our short paper. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Sabrina. And now our last presentation for the session. Um, I think this will be done by uh, Afshan Rehman, and the title is Assessing Perceptual and Qualitative Performance of Daily Spaces Remotely Through Web-Based Parametric Immersive Evaluation. So please go ahead and share your screen. Okay. I do share your screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, and I can hear you. All perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so hello, everybody. My name is uh, Afshan Rahman. I'm a second year Master of Sustainable Design student from Carnegie Mellon University. I'm the co-author of this paper, and I'll be uh, presenting on behalf of uh, the first author, Vishal Vedinathan. Um, the value of uh, daylight influence in various aspects of architectural design and spatial cognition have been studied, studied and analyzed. It has been established that daylight drives a powerful combination of qualitative and quantitative effects on a space and that studies of daylight performance of the space are necessary to inculcate both the quantitative and qualitative aspects. There, have been, uh, there has been a substantial amount of research uh, in analyzing and evaluating spatial daylight performance on different quantitative measures and looking at daylight performance from a perceptual focus, both theoretically and analytically. However, for thorough survey-based perceptual, perceptual evaluations of daylight spaces, especially VR-based immersive surveys, 
access to physical survey subjects is required, unlike regular web-based surveys that can be mass communicated. As a result, these surveys cannot be done simultaneously and remotely. There are many potential drawbacks of not having remote surveys possible, like the inability to conduct such studies during the pandemic. This study proposes a simple yet efficient methodology for conducting such studies remotely and on a mass communication level using web-based virtual reality technology. The study analyzes daylight quality of a space on two metrics, light quality and spatial cognition through an immersive web-based parametric survey. For the qualitative evaluation of the space, different trigger variables were chosen from previous studies, each with several parameters that affect the subjective impression of the space, which include window size, facade patterns, glazing color, and furniture layout. For the purpose of this study, a dorm room in Pittsburgh was chosen. A quantitative evaluation was done to ascertain that the SDA AAC and average lux is above the required standards of ASHRAE 90.1 and IECC 2015. The room was then modeled on a 3DS Max. A parallel plot was generated with all trigger variables with 54 permutations uh, and combinations, and 54 360 high dynamic range renders were exported from 3DS Max. To allow the user to have an interactive immersive experience of choosing a variable of their choice, a HDR image of each combination was generated. Some of the combination corresponding to certain variables uh, can be seen here, like uh, the color of glazing is changing, the furniture layout is changing, the facade pattern and the window sizes are changing. A complete interactive virtual environment of the spatial context was developed with real-time variable control and parametric freedom of choice. The virtually constructed daylit space was programmed to emulate real-life sunlight with respect to time. While all the elements that are composed within the virtual immersive space were static, the trigger variables and the expanded iterations that were identified in the pilot study were made parametric, hence offering a freedom of choice and control to the survey subjects. An interactive user interface was designed to allow subjects to identify trigger variables while exploring the virtual space. A slider was provided to those trigger variables for the subjects to change until the space attains perceptual comfort. Daylight creates direct impacts on spatial perception and cognition, hence, hence simultaneous consideration of quantitative performance in tandem with psychological effect it has on the user is essential. With the rise in need of perceptual daylight research, it was essential to think of ways perceptual evaluation could be done more innovatively while social distancing. And our hypothesis was that a web-based VR survey could be a great surrogate. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you. So we can now continue with the Q&A. So I would like to invite all of you in the audience and also the uh, uh, presenters themselves, if you'd like to write questions in the uh, Q&A panel and also in the chat. And I see Matt raising his hand. Hey, right, thank you. Uh, I have a question <laughs> uh, for, where did it go? Maybe he's not here. Uh, maybe maybe Jean, uh, for the, the machine learning um, GAN network for removing uh, for, uh, for, for removing is it trees and things like this. Yeah. Uh, so some of the like, uh, maybe subjective results was that it gets quite blurry in the location that you're trying to remove something. And I wonder what the... Um, how would you compare the, the goal or the point of doing it this way as opposed to high fidelity renderings? So I see like it, it's quite difficult maybe to um, create an entire environment where you have different trees and things like this um, being visible uh, or not visible. So this is an image-based approach to let you come up with lots of different environments. But we also have rendering techniques that are becoming photorealistic. Um, so do you see a cross between when photorealism and rendering and the speed at which we can generate a city like a city engine uh, can just generate the city and we can render it photorealistic? Maybe that takes us three, four, five more years um, until it's super real time. And then how long would it take for us to do it with this image-based approach? 
uh, does it also take five years? And what would be the advantage of this over that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, yes, and also it's a tough question. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in, in this stage of, of, of my uh, research, my, my goal is to uh, remove the general objects like the uh, peoples, peoples who, who are walking, walking on the roads and uh, vegetation which obscured uh, uh, by, uh, to, to, the, to the buildings. So, uh, but uh, I think with the advances in the machine learning and uh, uh, urban environment data, so uh, I think uh, maybe in in the five years or in in the not 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 a long uh, long times, and we we can achieve uh, just like you 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 said, and the uh, like the. Uh, the all things can dynamically be moved in the urban environment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe I can start with a question to uh, Karen, if you'd like. Um, I was wondering, uh, so you mentioned this was a, a, a thesis, right? Do you have plans to, to extend this or to test this with uh, people? Yeah, I would love to do it. I, I've been talking a lot with our first year master building science. They do their thesis the second year. The problem mm -hmm. is they have a lot of freedom of choice. And uh -huh. although I keep wanting them to do more in the <laughs> AR arena, they, they are nicely picking things in other good arenas like sustainable Sleeping, design. No well, <laughs> the, but although the thing is I did find an MR student. So this is of much importance also in the architecture realm. But I found it incredibly frustrating when I tried to do the things I asked my student to do. For example, I would tell ZU, ZU, come back next week and have this done. And he would complain a lot and come back blurry-eyed with the thing done. And then over the summer, last summer, I tried to do the stuff myself. And I was like, how on earth did I ask my students to do these things? <laughs> All of you people who are potential uh, students, go and make your advisors try the things. And it was like, I would get all the way done making my thing. And then my phone is not capable. I had a, a flip phone and I couldn't do it. Then something else happened. <laughs> um, and so, yes, I'm really hoping to continue. Um, but I think I'm becoming slightly more realistic now when I'm demanding my students to do things because it's a lot harder than I thought it was. That's why it's, who was it? Um, Zhi Zheng, a Zhang. Um, yeah. I think you're in the wrong field. Um, you got to change to cinema. There's a whole lot more money for taking out cars and trees and people in film footage than there is in architecture. Um, there, and, so I, I'm seeing some of these talks and they're, they're just really wonderful. And I really appreciate the amount of work that the people have put into these projects. Maybe one a question for both uh, you and, uh, and uh, Juhu. Um, I'm thinking uh, uh, something I've been trying lately with, with my own students because I'm facing very similar problems. <laughs> is having them uh, each work on a, a different uh, complementary uh, task. And I'm thinking both of these uh, works are very, uh, very similar. Even if one focuses on sound, the other focuses yeah. on, on, on visual elements. Have you tried also bringing these together? Yeah, um, I'll answer then she can. Um, part of it is the problem they need individual thesis topics, but yes. we would like to find some way they could do joint things. But I thought that they were part of my last year's group. And I thought they worked better because there were four of them who were doing programming things in C-sharp. They had to teach themselves C-sharp first and teach all the software to themselves first. But because four of the group had similar overlapping things, even though they didn't overlap a lot, they could help each other a yes. lot more than I could help them. Whereas this year, I only had like, one or two students doing the things. And it was a lot harder, even with COVID and all this other stuff going on. But it really helps to have the peer support network. 
At least that's what I noticed when they when Janet's group was working. What do you think, Janet? Yeah, like Karen said, uh, when uh, when we were doing the CDs and we have like multiple people, we we have discussion on how C sharp work uh, and uh, discussions on how Unity work. How to like one of us bring a problem that I can't script this. Yes. piece of no and we just come up ideas and like uh get solutions to each other or it's it's not like we are doing like combining our thesis together but like we are helping each other to like kind of like uh like brainstorm the solutions yeah absolutely and i see now in, in all of your uh, presentations and, and I see this more and more in, in architectural education and, and related fields that we're adding more and more tools that are exciting and uh, from programming to, to neuroscience and then uh, this becomes uh, it's absolutely wonderful but also it's a lot of uh, extra extra brain <laughs> brain work involved uh, so one of my question maybe to um, all of you would be, if you want to, to comment on this, on how, how you imagine yourselves in, in, in the future. So, so continuing in this kind of, of, of path of you know, being interdisciplinary, taking, um, using technologies and, and knowledge from other fields, how do you see yourselves? And I know this is bizarre, so uh, <laughs> uh, let's start with the order of, of presentation. Uh, maybe uh, also, Karen, if, you, if you'd like to answer. You can skip me. Z, you would have had it. Can I add something to the question? Of course. Um, so part of like the, we're seeing these presentations and they exist in this VR, AR space. And yet like, I know because anybody who's doing this work right now, it's probably not put a VR headset on a, like another person in a little while. So a lot of this is translating into like, how do we move VR into the, this semi VR space that's kind of VR friendly if you have the right equipment. Um, so particularly with the last example where it was web-based, um, how did the implementation of pandemic-friendly technologies for the web um, influence what you're doing? But that could apply to everyone as well. Like, you know, do you see the work that you're doing um, radically or being radically different if it had been in a different year? It's not related to a paper, so after, after the author's reply. Uh, hi, I think I'm uh, Kentia and Amber. I think while the others are deliberating on whether to answer or not, maybe I'll just kick start it. Uh, Thank you. My, uh, my, my presentation did not really uh, specifically have an AR, VR component, um, but in terms of looking at where um, I think my research is headed or where I see myself um, being involved is really, um, like I come from practice. I've kind of practiced and designed uh, buildings over the last 15 years. And then I realized that there needs to be a little bit more of evidence overlaid onto what we design. Um, and I come from Singapore where everything is really vertical, like we don't have space. Uh, we need to kind of live with high density and we need to make sure that uh, those environments are still livable and you know sustainable and it's something which we all want to go back to. So uh, for me, it was really about layering what we do with a bit more of reality and being able to uh, dynamically change things, you know, because uh, it's not possible to build one and break the building and redo it, you know, that's just not sustainable. So is there a way to design in such a way that we have the flexibility to understand how spaces get used? How can we keep changing them while they are being used? Uh, can we kind of know that information in real time? You know, so that's, that's where we came up with. And unfortunately, there are multiple studies done on lateral networks, uh, 
uh, and how people use the open spaces and common spaces naturally, but very limited information was available when it comes to vertical mobility, you know, how these kind of buildings work, uh, and especially how do they sit within uh, an established urban fabric, you know. So that's where the whole study came up. And I've personally designed some of these buildings here. So for me, it is really about uh, layering it with uh, a bit more of reality and making sure that I'm able to understand the buildings before they get built, even after they get built, can I kind of do interventions which are meaningful you know, without having to break the building or do much of drastic changes. So that's where I see my research headed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll answer for Afshan just because I, I thought what was really interested. We had to like get rid of the assignments that used headsets, and then we just couldn't do the assignments for for a year now. Um, but what I thought was really interesting about what you showed was you essentially used a really old code, older than you, much older than you, coding technique of pre-calculating everything, but then putting it in such a nice environment that it seemed live and that people actually had choices. And I really liked that about your presentation was that it, it was, it's an old sneaky way of doing things, but it didn't rely upon the computers being fast enough, didn't rely upon the VR headsets. It was a pretty low tech thing for a high tech thing you were talking about. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Uh, a little backstory, actually this research was a part of Dr. A professor as day Sawyer's class shaping daylight at CMU and the initial plan was to have a VR based survey with all the students in the School of Architecture and then I think one month after we started uh, the pandemic hit and we uh, changed our plans but uh, I think it's not just for uh, social distancing and for the pandemic we also realized that like web based immersive survey can be used for people who are like in different continents and we can get a much larger data set. Yeah, this is uh, absolutely clever. <laughs> We've also had to had to use this uh, for the same reason, pandemic everywhere. Uh, and uh, I was wondering if you had some uh, uh, tips on, on how to make sure that participants actually do this, that they are following the, their path. What, what, they, what they're expected to do. So what we try to do, for example, is hide the code at the end. So then they had to, to show that they arrived at this moment in, in the experiment. Did you have any, any ideas about that? Uh, not yet, like we have, like we, uh, the survey is online on Michelle's website, but we haven't looked at the data yet. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah but it's, yeah, it's a research in progress, probably another paper on the data. That we I'm looking forward to, to the next step. Oh, yeah. uh, Matt, I, I see you're raising your hand. I think it's been a while. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Are we still going over like, what are you going to do with your life? I thought that's the question we were, we were still on. Well, we are going back and forth. Depends on the, on the flow. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> please go, go ahead. So if, if we can skip that one. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask uh, Afshan as well. It was, it was an interesting like, kind of a combination of um, characteristics to then say, which space do you like in, in a sense? Like that, that's in a cursory level, that's kind of what I got out of it. It was like, you can, you can change, maybe add plants or change the lighting, there's blue lighting or something like that. Um, how do you see this um, as a like super large scale? For example, uh, Wayfair, you know, the online uh, shopping, they have a 3D environment, just like what you showed, but there's is actually 3D and you can move it like furniture around. You can do all these things. Um, and they have a catalog of tens of thousands of different furniture items. You can change the lighting. You can make, you know, all this. It seems like uh, your study on steroids with millions and millions of customers. Um, so what could happen here? Like if you were given access to that space, you know, tool. You say, hey, we just want to like get the data. We want to plug in and say, um, ask millions and millions of people, any possible combination, what would be the ultimate thing that you would want to tell people about it? You know, that if you could do it, you would say to Wayfair, give me this access and I'll tell you this about designing interior space. Um, I think we, uh, we would like try to understand how people think 
uh, it talks a lot about like uh, like we as an arch- we as architects might think differently but like probably somebody f- like my mom would have a different uh, perception of how a space should look like so i think like in fact i used to work for um, a 3d uh, rendering company and uh, one of our clients was uh, based out of india and they were very similar to wingfeather they were like a furniture company in india so we did a lot of 360 renders for uh, them and uh, i get what you're talking about and i think the potential is huge and i i i don't see where this is going i think the potential is huge and like it can lead to many things but 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 the assignment started with daylight this was a project yeah. about daylight so wayfair um they analyze what people shop and what colors they like and and they promote that like they promote the style of furniture that had the most sale or they promote the color that had the most sale right so for vishal and for afshan it was about daylight and it was about the effect of facade on daylight and and they're basically recording every change so anyone that goes on there and changes things and then they get to a point of this is where i'm satisfied they're recording everything and then they're recording the the final and they're trying to understand can i take that data and and try to make some assumptions about um where they want the shadow patterns to be or what um facade complexity is appealing to people or what level of complexity is appealing to to people right i think that i think that the end result is different than what wayfair is trying to do i guess i would say if if you look at some of the color parts right like how does lighting the daylight whether it's a orange light or, or blue light you know what's happening on the facade that's reflecting back into the space this impacts i would imagine also your color choices right cuz if you change the color temperature of the space you're going to change your perception of a red couch right if you have a red light in your room the red couch is going to look different than having the blue couch right so so it could be that if you um are saying the wayfair hey we have a, a lighting simulation that the the facade or the light that comes into the room changes then the ambient color of the room changes then the the color of the furniture that you would pick might be changing and so it's not m- maybe wayfair just saying we want to sell the 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 highest selling couch but it, like we want to sell the couch that works best for your space and maybe your space changes based off of that facade and based on off the way that that the shadow patterns are come in you know if you get i don't know my office it's a little bit better now in the morning like my shades are horrible and i get these like stripes of white light coming across my my eyes um and you know maybe that that is enough pattern for me and <laughs> i don't want like other patterns in my in my office and i'll go with more modern design to counteract that Um, so I guess that's that's more of what, what I was I was uh trying to prod you for is like I think there's a lot of opportunity for building out that type of thing and then being able to then um talk to people who have a similar platform but at a huge scale I think give a lot of opportunity to say what what else could we do there. In, but, but when when you were mentioning the blinds they could also be a study of the glare in the room as well. So the good thing about the changing of the blinds is not only can you you can see how the daylight's coming about also how you want to block the daylight and what type of blinds you might want to buy for your window versus if you're on the north side of your house versus if you have an east facing living room or something like that i mean my sister was i was buying blinds actually a couple weeks ago and i told her well which way does your house face and it was like well i don't know and it's like I, you know it's going to make a difference <laughs> and that maybe you should be thinking about it but if she had an app that could help her visualize it yeah i think it would really help in designing more comfortable spaces can you i have a quick question for sabrina um regarding the gaze and following through the the path um sabrina were you your group able to make connections between where their gaze was and how fast they moved through the space because it seems like one of the unique opportunities with um applying VR AR as a tool is that we really are able to think about things spatially and make connections between where people are and looking and like how they move um and the, your presentation focusing on the plan um i just wondered if there was causal relationships that you were able to draw so we didn't actually use um the application on any human subjects all of the people that was just me 
<laughs> so there's no result. The people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's no result like that uh, from the study, unfortunately. Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to that... expose you there. <laughs> <laughs> Almost there. You have two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was also wondering: uh, Are you also planning to to do this with multiple people and, and aggregate their their data then? Yeah, that would be that would be the hope to to be able to actually use it um, in the office. Yeah, and, and I, I just say I'm clearly very interested. Would you be <laughs> willing to to share this, or uh, are you, do you have plans to to somehow make this public or sell it or uh, do something so that others can use it? Uh, not yet. I think that there's a lot more work to be done on it still. Um, there's like no graphics that were even made for it. Like everything's just default. So there's a lot of work to be done with it. Maybe, yeah, eventually one day, maybe. Yeah, it would be very interesting. Absolutely. Oh, we're uh, one minute uh, to go. So is there maybe a really, really short question to finish? <laughs> I have some questions, but I don't know how short it'll be. Uh, for uh, Sri Latya, in, in Singapore, there's a lot of this that you talked about the vertical integration. I, I stayed two years ago at Teng Tuk Sing Hospital. Um, and so it was really hard to wayfind and navigate. Do you know of any space syntax validated studies that show the integration of 2D space has been validated equally to the idea of, of 3D uh, spatial integration? Because at least like for me, that's a nightmare. Navigating is so complicated, right? No, I think the, the, the reason why uh, we were even looking at an alternate way of understanding networks and movement was because I couldn't find something which was able to give me what I wanted, you know. But of course, Space Syntax has a lot of studies being done for complex vertical buildings, and um, most of them are modeled, um, but doesn't really take in a lot of real data, you know. For me, what was key was like, how people really use those spaces because uh, we can model a lot of things, but we do not have the real use data to show how people move in the lateral and vertical dimension. You know, so um, so our first step in this whole process was really to find a way to collect the data and see whether we can even track it, and then see whether we can predict how people may move in these spaces. You know, and how people might be using some of these spaces. So it's really more from uh, like, you know, as an architect, we design these spaces and especially uh, what I see is when we are designing these three dimensional uh, public spaces, we tend to design them like we design a two dimension. You know, we don't really understand that the way people use this is different from the way it's designed on a ground plane. So for the first point is really to understand how they move and what are the patterns which happen? You know, what's the choices you make? So uh, of course, this one is purely based on tracking people. It doesn't have much of cogn cognition study yet integrated to it, but we are hoping to add on a layer of observation and you know also track how people make those choices. Uh, but the first step is really to get the base data of how people really go through these spaces. You know? So there are studies, but I don't know whether there is anything which is uh, which I, I can highlight to you and say, okay, this is a good one to really look at. So um, there might be bits and pieces in many studies. You know, frankly. So it's tough to say there's one example. Thank you very much. Uh, my gut feeling is that there is still some uh, you know, discussions to, to be had and maybe it's time to move to, to the official meeting, meeting space. <laughs> Is this the, the idea? I see Amber nodding. So there is a link, if you see in the chat, for Mojo's bar. And the idea there is to continue the chat. So if you'd like, um, I think it's a different Zoom, right? So this means we, I, thank you. <laughs> we no, will leave that perfect. one. Thank you, Kent. Yeah, <laughs> thank it's you. Like, Just to make sure. <laughs> and David, thank you. you so much for wonderful presentations and really, really nice uh, uh, content. Thank you. Thank you, Kintia, <laughs> for, for moderating fantastically. My yeah. pleasure. And for moderating at like 1 a.m. or maybe 2 a.m. now for her. <laughs> so thank now you. Too. I'm not, I haven't turned into a pumpkin, so all good. <laughs> <laughs>
have fun, everyone. I might join for a bit. Uh, maybe we'll see. <laughs> so you can join from the link in the chat, or um, if you lose that, it's also in the program. It's the last event of the day at Mojo's Bar. You can also go through the virtual venue and click on the link that's in front of the bar. So um, many ways to get there. We'll see you all there, hopefully. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow. We're starting bright and early at 8 a.m. on Eastern um, Eastern time. So um, it's, it's much later for you, Kinthia. It'll be easy for you to show up at 8 a.m. <laughs> yes, for <laughs> once in my life. <laughs> and there's a lot, of great, a lot of great research also being presented tomorrow all day long and, uh, and a culminating uh, keynote. And of course, our closing ceremonies and awards. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, we'll see you tomorrow or Thank in a few you. minutes. Bye. Hi, Janet. Ah, you left. <laughs>